doing? All right, so welcome to day two. I hope you're having a great time here. So my name's Wayne Fikarski, and today I'm going to be talking about how to build production devices for Android Things. And so Android Things is, you know, it's designed for making IoT devices. We've got a big sandbox area over in the room that you can go and check out our demo, so definitely come and see us later on. And, you know, we're here because we want to both educate you about what we're doing, but also we want to find out more about what kinds of cool projects you want to build. We want to be able to answer your questions and so forth. So definitely come by and see us, check out the demos, talk to us, and, you know, that's what we're here for. So if you see me walking around at lunch, definitely come and say hi. So if you've ever dreamed of making your own IoT devices, then Android Things is for you. And today I'm going to teach you how to go about doing that so you can make your own exciting ideas. So what is Android Things? So Android Things is an extension of the Android platform that allows you to build IoT devices. So many of you are familiar with Android on phones, Android on tablets, we have Android Wear devices, we have Android in cars, and now we have Android for building IoT devices. And so it's nice because you've already got your existing developer experience. You know, many of you in the room here are already Android developers, and so you can take advantage of your existing software stack to support your development. Also, security is really hard, and a lot of IoT device makers aren't doing security properly. And so it's really hard to get it right from, from the beginning and do it perfectly, so Android Things is there to support that to help you build really secure IoT applications. And finally, taking an IoT device and scaling it to large production runs is also very challenging as well. And so while it's possible to make easy prototypes, Android Things helps you to get that product all the way to market, and we're going to go through the steps as to how that's done. So with Android Things, you get best-in-class multimedia, connectivity, Wi-Fi, um, you know, rich user interfaces, and it helps you to accelerate the development of IoT applications. So if you want to build anything like this, there's definitely something you should be checking out. So what can you use Android Things for? So there's many things you can use it for, but really, it's ideal for powerful and intelligent devices. So it's not just about little things that support switches and lights and whatever, but it's about really complex applications. So things like audio processing, video processing, um, doing on-device machine learning. These are the kinds of cool things that you can build with Android Things. And there's many different use cases. You've got enterprise, like big companies. You've got businesses. And then you've got con consumer devices that people are going to use at home. IoT is going to be a big thing, and if you saw my talk yesterday, I talked about how you know, we had desktops and then laptops and then phones. IoT is going to be bigger than even those, so it's definitely something that you want to be a part of. And so Android Things is really good at applications that need high, like large amounts of computation. An Android Things device is basically a phone without a screen. So this is not a tiny microcontroller. It's very powerful, and you can communicate with the cloud. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do with it. So let's get started. So making hardware, so IoT devices involve some kind of equipment that you're going to have to give to a customer of some kind. So it's really hard to make good electronics. And so the reason is that um, when you're making a board like this, so this is a little screenshot of a Raspberry Pi here, the circuit board of it. If you look at the actual board itself where that red arrow is, you'll see there are these little squiggly tracks there. And it turns out that when you're designing high-speed electronics, you have to do a really good job about making sure that all the electrons travel at the speed of light correctly and that they all arrive at the same time. And so doing this is really tricky. It requires very highly skilled engineers who know how to design electronics. And you know, I'm a software person. I don't make hardware. So I have no idea how this stuff is done. And so you know, we want to try to make that easy. So it requires very skilled designers to make really nice electronics. But we're going to show you how we help you to do that. Also, when you're making electronics, it requires you to buy large quantities to be able to get good prices. If you go to an electronics company and say, I want to make 10 of these devices, they'll charge you like 1000 bucks each. But if you want to buy a million, then you can get the price down to a couple dollars. And so that's one of the other catches. It's not like software that you can make one or a million copies for free. Hardware, it costs money to make them, and sometimes there are fixed costs. And then finally, you've got a lot of lead time. When you make electronics, you have to place the order for the parts, wait for them to arrive, you have to make things, assemble it. It takes a long period of time to get this right. And if you make a mistake, you can't just ship an update out like you do for software. So hardware is quite tricky to do, but we've got some solutions to making that easier. And finally, software 
which we thought was a solved problem. It turns out that's tricky too. So everyone's building these custom IoT devices with their own handmade Linux distributions, but they don't really have a strategy for security. They don't have a strategy for sending updates out to people. And this is becoming really critical for IoT devices because now there are these vulnerable, insecure devices that are out there in the wild that hackers are breaking into. And it's becoming a problem for companies who make these devices because, well, your device was used by someone to break into something. So, you know, you're potentially on, on the hook for that. So as a device maker now, there's more and more incentives for you to do this right. And so Android Things is going to help you to do security and updates and all those things properly so that you can make devices that your consumers can feel confident with knowing that's made as best as can be done right now. And finally, you don't really want to have to hire a huge number of engineers on your team whose job is to maintain Linux kernels and security updates and keep up to date with the latest patches for OpenSSL or something like that. We take care of all that for you, and that's a really big thing here. So we support the ability to make easy prototypes, but we also support the ability to then take that same design and take it all the way to the production. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So firstly, the design of Android things, it's not just based on a, like a single board computer. It's based on this concept called a SOM. And if you look at the bottom on, that slide, on the slide there, you can see there's a small little board. It's about two centimeters by two centimeters. It's very tiny. But it contains the core computing pieces that are needed, so the CPU, the memory, the Wi-Fi chip, and so forth. And you attach this board to a larger breakout device during development, so the top one there, and that has all the breakout connectors that you use to attach things to. And that's for testing. And so when you're ready to move into production, you take the developer board away, and you make your own custom board that has just the components that you need. And this is nice because the custom board that you make only has the pieces you want, you only pay for the parts you need, and you don't need to pay for this huge development board that you're not using any of the parts for it. And the nice part is that the SOMs, the, the small computing modules, they're made by someone else. They're made in large quantities, so you can buy them at good prices. And then the boards that you need for yourself, you can do a run. And because they use low-speed electronics, that's not as hard as the design I showed previously. Low-speed electronics are a lot cheaper to make, and it's a lot easier for a lot of electronics designers to build for you. So you can focus on that part, and it makes it easy for you. And then finally, we have what's called a BSP, or a board support package. And so the board support package is software from Google that makes that SOM and that board of yours work by running Android things on it. And so we provide the kernel, the libraries, necessary drivers, and everything to make it work. And as long as you stick to the design of the SOM, then everything will work for you. And so it really sort of helps you to focus on you make your board, and then we take care of everything else for you. The other thing that's nice about SOMs is that you don't need to worry so much about product certification and testing. So traditionally, when you design a board, you have to get the entire board certified and tested. There are regulatory agencies, like in the US, it's called uh, Underwriters Laboratory. They do testing or FCC certification. And doing all that certification is very expensive, and it's very time consuming. However, if your design is based around the SOM, the SOM has already been certified, and so it makes the certification process for the rest of your hardware a lot cheaper, quicker, and easier. So it makes things easier for you, and you can get your product to market quicker. So with the way we've designed Android things, it's a little different than the way people have traditionally like, used AOSP to build their own custom Android devices. What we do is we've broken Android things down into two parts. There's the part that's managed by Google. So we compile that, we build it. So it's things like the Android framework, the hardware libraries, the Linux kernel. We build that as, and we, um, we give you binaries for that. And they're distributed as part of the board support package. And then the second part is managed by you as a developer. And so you build APKs, like you would build an Android Studio, and you write what are called apps, and you write user drivers, and you put them onto the device, and that's the part that you control. And we've separated them so that the part that's managed by Google has all the right permissions to do everything, but your part that you run as a developer, that's actually run with restricted permissions. You have to use the Android APIs to communicate with everything, which helps to isolate your code off from the rest of the system so that if there are any security problems, it tends to keep them compartmentalized so the whole system won't get um, attacked if your app has a problem. And so that's one of the nice things about this separation is we handle certain parts, you handle certain parts, and you can focus on the parts that are important to you. So what happens is that when you upload an APK that you've built, 
you, um, it, you upload it to our developer console, and it's combined with the firmware image from Google, and we build a single signed firmware image. And this signed firmware image is then distributed to the devices that are your products. And so we sign and verify the images. So we sign them on the server, and then we verify them when the images arrive on the device. And we do this to make sure that the images haven't been tampered with during transmission to the user, because we don't want a rogue third party changing the firmware on the way to the device. They're also protected from corruption, so that if the images are corrupted during transit, then, of course, they'll be verified that way. But also, when the device boots, we check to make sure it hasn't been tampered with or damaged on the device as well, because you don't want to boot an image that's been corrupted or tampered in some way. The next thing is we provide AB update rollback protection. So when a new update arrives on the device, we don't just clobber over the firmware image, we actually stage it as a second image, we put everything in place, then we reboot the device and switch over to the other image. Now, if for any reason, when we boot this new image, if it fails, the system will then detect that and it'll then roll back to the previous version and that way, if a corrupt build is pushed or if, if you make a bug or something that causes the device not to boot, it'll roll back so that the device will still be able to get future updates and so you won't brick the device if somehow you make a mistake with your updates. This is a really nice feature because it's something that's really hard to build yourself, we provide all that for you. And then finally, we provide automatic security updates. So Android has a huge team of security engineers whose job is to look for vulnerabilities in Linux kernel and the SSL libraries and all the other different pieces that make up the Android framework. And you get the benefits of having all of those engineers working for you. So we make the updates, we then push them out to your devices, and so that you don't have to worry about keeping track of all these little things. In the past, if you were doing builds from AOSP, you would have to merge the patches in yourself and then build your own images and then push them out. This is very time consuming, hard to do, and so we're really trying to make that frictionless and easy for you, and we take care of it all. And then finally, we provide the OTA mechanism to get the software updates out to your devices. So the images are signed, built on our server, we then push them out, and it uses a system that we've built for ourselves, and it works very well, it's very reliable, and very easy to use. So you don't have to worry about it, you can focus on building your applications. So let's look at some of the more technical things about how to build for Android things. So the first part is that, if, this is like a diagram here that shows the traditional Android framework model. And so there's all the different parts that form the system. We've kept most of them as part of Android things. But what we did was, is we removed some of the core pieces that aren't needed. So for example, an Android Things device, it's not a phone and it can't send text messages, so we've removed all of those different pieces, like wallpapers and notifications. You don't need any of that stuff on an IoT device. So we've taken all that away because we want to save space, make the system boot quickly, but we've provided all of the rest of the Android framework and bits and pieces that you're used to dealing with, that's all available for you to use when you're building your IoT devices. And also, you know, the UI libraries that you're familiar with in Android Studio for like laying out nice UIs, that's all available too. So Android Things supports UI, but displays are actually optional now. So I always think about Android Things as like a phone but without the screen on it. But you can have a screen if you want one. So different IoT devices, some of them are embedded into different things or some of them have displays. You can choose what you want. So you don't have to have a screen, but you don't um, not have to have one either. You have the same user interface libraries that you used to with Android, and so it's based on activities and services, just like you're familiar with for writing Android apps right now. So all of the same things that you understand, the same concepts are there for you as well. Um, one little thing to be aware of is that you still need to have a main activity, because the main activity is responsible for handling keyboard and mouse events and so forth, so you still need something to be handling that. Because screens are optional, there are times when, like, if you need to request permission, for example, we don't pop up a permission dialog box on the screen, because it might not be possible for the user to hit OK on it. So Android Things automatically grants permissions to different things, so if you've got code that you've ported over from an Android phone, it still works, and the permissions are automatically granted, so you don't have to hit the OK button on it. And then finally, when you're building an Android Things IoT app, you're not necessarily going to be using a touchscreen anymore, but you need to think about what kinds of alternative input device modalities do you want to use. So now you have the ability to build wearable devices, you could have a microphone, you could have a camera, you could have a GPS sensor or a compass, 
Um, there's all kinds of different input modalities that you could consider as part of building your device. So don't just lock yourself into using a touch screen. You could use any kind of input device. And so there's pretty much all the options that you could think of are available. And the Android SDK through the framework, so things like sensors and so forth, are read in exactly the same way as you do on a phone. And then also, you get to develop with the power of Android. So you're using the same Android SDK that everyone uses for phone development. You're using Android Studio, and you get to use any language supported by Android Studio. So you can use Kotlin for programming. So if you're, new to, if you're excited about Kotlin, you can use it on Android things as well. You have Google Play services with all the parts that it provides, Firebase and TensorFlow and Google Cloud IoT, and you can embed the Google Assistant into your device. So all of these things that Google provides for phones are now available for you on IoT devices as well. So I've had a lot of IoT developers come up to me and say they're really excited about being able to put TensorFlow into devices like this. This is something that I haven't been able to do before. So one of the really cool things about Android Things is that you can now do machine learning on device. You don't need the cloud, you don't need Wi-Fi, and you can do it on the device. And that's something a very low-end microcontroller can't do. So it's definitely a big win for Android things. And as I said, it really helps you to all of these tools and libraries that you're familiar with, it's all available to you. So the most important part of Android things is adding hardware to it. And so let's go through some examples of the APIs that are available for you to go about doing this. And so when you look at the developer board, um, this is a Raspberry Pi here, we actually support uh, NXP devices, which some of you have received a kit that you can play with at home. Um, so we support NXP devices. We also support Raspberry Pis right now. And so this board here shows you some of the different connections that are available. So we support connecting things via USB, so you can plug mice, keyboards, uh, things like that in. We support speakers, microphones going in via either the audio jack or the USB port. There's an Ethernet connector. There's Wi-Fi. There's um, different HDMI outputs and connectors for cameras. We support all of these things on the module. So whatever you want to use to connect stuff up, you can use that for whatever your application is. And every developer kit also has a breakout header pin. So this is the connector pin diagram for the Raspberry Pi. So you can see that there's all kinds of connectors, which we'll talk about in a minute. But every single pin that's available on there, we have APIs that allow you to talk to that. And so you can add additional devices to these lines here. And then you can integrate them in whatever way you want. So there's a whole bunch of different um, interfacing protocols exposed by that connector there. So we support general purpose I.O., we support pulse width modulation, we support I2C buses, I2S, SPI, and UARDs. So these are all different connection technologies that hardware designers use to interface to different devices. So if you've done hardware design before, you'll have seen these. But these are important because they're very cheap and high-speed ways of getting things connected to your devices that's easy to interact with directly. And we're going to go through some more examples of these later. And then also, we have support for what are called user drivers, where we can add to the Android framework, and we can take sensor data, we can take input devices, and we can actually inject those events into the Android framework so that they can be read and used by applications using the same sensor framework. So if you've got a sensor that connects via I2S, we can inject it into the sensor framework so that the code that uses it just sees a regular Android sensor just like they would any other sensor that would be connected on a phone. So here are some examples that show how different kinds of things would be connected. So if we had a motor that was connected up via PWM, that is something that would talk directly to your app. If you had a sensor, you can see that the example I talked about before, it connects via I2C, it then has a user sensor driver, it then puts it through the sensor manager into the framework. And then if you had a GPS device, you would connect it via a serial port or a UART, you would then write a GPS driver around it that generates framework events, and then it goes through Location Manager into the app. And actually, an interesting thing is that Google Play Services has something called Fuse Location Provider that a lot of people like to use because it improves the quality of their GPS data. Because these events are being injected directly into the framework, it means that Google Play Services can use the Fuse Location Provider to help enhance those as well. So that's one of the really cool spin-offs of the um, user, user driver framework. So what kind of hardware can you interface with? We talked about some concepts like GPIO and so forth. I'm just going to show you some quick examples. So GPIO is basically binary 1 and 0 signals. And they tend to be like 0 to 5 volts or 0 to 3.3 .3 volts. And they have low and high values. And they're, done, they're used by things like buttons when they're inputting into your device. But you can also drive LEDs, so make lights turn on and off. 
rotary switches, uh, little sensor devices, they all use just simple signals coming in, and Android things can read those for you. We support what's called PWM. The nice thing about pulse width modulation is you use, varying, you use um, signals with varying modulation widths, and you can use it to control the intensity of an LED, or you can use it to move a servo motor around. We have native support for PWM, and the boards have actual PWM hardware on board that can generate these signals very reliably. So they're useful for motor controlling and things where accuracy is very important. We have UART support, which are also called serial ports, or RS-232. So you can connect them up, and a lot of devices like GPS units and so forth, they use um, UART style inputs. So all the Android Things devices all have at least one serial port connector on it, and you can connect more via USB. We also have SPI and I2C. There are companies that make dedicated little boards with sensors on them and so forth that talk via these high-speed serial buses. So these are useful for times when RS-232 isn't fast enough. And so you can connect all kinds of sensors directly into Android Things, and we handle those directly. So that's sensors. Now, how do we go about building activities within Android Studio that run on an Android Things device? So everything in Android, in Android Things is based around an APK, just like you would build for an Android phone. So traditionally, you would plug your phone into your laptop, you would hit the run icon in Android Studio, and it puts the APK on your device. You unplug it, you plug in your Android Things device, and it works in exactly the same way. So you get to use exactly the same Android Studio tools, and you just plug it in, it works over ADB, and it pretty much just works. There's a few little differences you need to be aware of, though. So the first thing you do is in your build.gradle, you need to include our Android Things support library. It has a few extra things that are not part of the standard Android framework, such as the peripheral I.O. API, and it brings those dependencies in so that you can use them in your code. The next thing you need to do is on the bottom there, you can see we've got some Android manifest XML entries. You need to add an IoT launcher intent flag and an intent filter. And we do that to tell Android Things that that activity that's tagged with an IoT launcher is the one that we want to start up at boot. So the device boots up, it finds the first IoT launcher, it starts it up, and then that runs on the device from that point on. And you should only have one activity on the device with an IoT launcher. If you have two, then only one of them will start up. But it's the way of you flagging which activity you want to run on startup, and that's going to be the one that sets up all your devices and gets things going. But at the end of the day, it's a regular Android APK. And in many cases, I've taken small toy examples of mine, and I've run them on an Android Things kit. It just works. So a lot of things you're used to for my Android, you can just easily do without changing anything. So if we want to add peripheral I.O., so we talked about GPIO. So let's say we want to handle button presses from a switch that's connected to the device. So we wire the switch up to the, pin on, uh, the GPIO pin on the device. And this is the code that we then use to do it. So it's very similar to handling a button in an Android UI, except now we're handling real physical buttons. So we use what's called the peripheral manager service. We create one of those. We then call OpenGPIO with the name of the pin. We then call some methods that set the directions. We want to do input. It's very important you specify the correct direction, because you can't read on an output pin and vice versa. Um, we then also specify edge falling. The purpose of edge falling is to say, I want this code to trigger whenever the signal drops from high to low, but not from low to high. So it only goes on the falling edge. You can specify rising and also both, depending on what your application is. Then you register a callback, and you can see we have an on-GPIO edge, on edge method, and that method will be called whenever the signal drops. And so that's it. I mean, you've got a couple lines of code here. Most of it's kind of boilerplate that just Print something out when a button is pressed. And then you can do whatever you want once you've received that um, notification. And then you can do different things in your code, depending on what you want to do. And all of the peripheral I.O. devices, like SPI, I2C, all that, they're all implemented with a very simple, similar API as well. So it's very easy to use. If any of you have done embedded Linux before, you have to go through the proc and sysfs file systems looking for different files to twiddle. This is a lot easier. And it's handled by a dedicated service that's isolated from your process so that it helps for security as well. So we talked about drivers in user drivers. We also have a peripheral driver library that we've written. So um, some of the engineers on my team, as well as op um, people out in public, have been writing drivers for different devices that plug into Android things. So on GitHub, we publish all of these drivers so they're available for you. So many common uh, sensors and 
devices and so forth, the drivers are already available, so you don't even need to write them yourself. So we've handled a lot of these things, reading the data sheets, implementing the code for it, so you don't have to worry about it. So definitely check out that driver library if you want to find the examples of code that makes it easy for you so you don't have to worry about reading these data sheets. So in summary, Android Things really helps to provide the power of Android to help you make your applications you know, help you make them easier and faster than you could have done before. You don't have to learn a new tool chain. You can use all your existing experience. And it really is something that you can get started quickly. So if you're an Android developer, you can take one of our kits, you can go home, and you can have something working in a couple hours. And you can really get started quickly. So it's definitely something I encourage you to check out. The hardware and software is managed by Google. So these SOMs are, we work closely with the semiconductor partners to make the SOMs. We help specify what the specifications will be, and then we support them with kernels, drivers, libraries, all bundled up into a binary that we then combine with your APK to ship to devices. And because we handle all that, you don't need to worry about handling all these kernel changes and patches and so forth. We take care of all that for you. And then finally, with the help of our developer console, where you upload your APKs to and push them to the devices, we handle all of the updates and all of the security and everything for you so that you can focus on building your application. There's a lot of complex things involved with you know, updating devices and making everything work. We have some of the most amazing engineers I've ever worked with that talk to me about security, about Android things, and it's just amazing the level of detail and care they've put into the design of the system. So um, it's very nice. So as a developer, you don't need to worry about these things. You can focus on making your app and what makes your product great. So what's next? So as I mentioned before, we have a sandbox area outside where, uh, over across the street there where you can check out our demos and come chat to us and definitely take advantage of that while we're here. And then also, later on you're going to have questions. We have some communities online where you can go to ask questions. So on G+, we have an IoT developers community. We also have Hackster.io, which is a place where you can post your projects that you've worked on. And that's a great place to sort of find other ideas of what people have been working on. And you, know, you can look at their code and read their documentation. So it's a great place to sort of see fully built little ideas that you can study. And then also we have the Android Things documentation itself on developerandroid.com slash things. And then we have a whole bunch of samples on GitHub that you can look at that are sort of show best practices in how to do different things involved with the Android Things kits. And so also, I do a lot of posting on Twitter and Google+, so definitely follow me on social media. So I'm a developer advocate at Google where I talk about IoT, the Google Assistant, and also the Assistant SDK. And so definitely follow me there if you want to keep up to date with all the new things that are happening. Uh, we're always doing new things. Like, for example, yesterday we actually launched Android Things Developer Preview 6. So the latest developer preview has a whole bunch of fixes for previous issues, but it also um, it added a lot of things for, like, making fast UIs possible, and um, it supports cameras, and you can run a lot of the Android samples, so Google Maps now works on it. It has the latest version of Google Play services. So definitely check out Developer Preview 6, which just launched yesterday, and that has a lot in there that you should try out. So that's it for today, so thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in the sandbox. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. So my name is Jenny Gove, and I'm really honored to be here today to talk with you about mobile design. So I'm going to start with telling a story about our two mobile platforms, the mobile web and native apps, setting what you're seeing here at the conference in context. And then in looking at design patterns and principles, we're going to talk about flow and navigation. We'll be looking at system patterns and material design. And then we'll look at some of the mobile principles that we have that are based on user data. And we'll end with some pointers for user testing. So the focus of this conference is on the latest and greatest technologies that you can learn about and apply to your work, as it should be. There have been many topics, such as those that you see here in the word cloud, that in some cases you've gone into real depth on. That's included tools for increasing performance, exploring IoT and Android things, the Google Assistant, conversational apps, details of progressive web apps, and more. You've covered many technical issues so far and tools and features that you as developers need to be aware of. I'm going to be taking a different approach for the first part of this user experience talk. We're going to take a look at a short history, just for fun, of how the tech media has characterized the mobile web and apps. So this is just going to be a bit different. You can come on me with, this, with me on this journey. Um, and we're going to see how they've engaged with this over the years, taking us to the point where we are now, that native apps and the mobile web both matter very much, and that there are use cases for each, and that both are developing in really interesting and important ways. So let me start by asking you a question. When was it that the web was first declared to be dead? Have a think about it. Any ideas? You could do a search for it, which ironically, you'd probably use the web. But <laughs> OK, so I'll put you out of your misery. It was in 1997 by Wired magazine. And they had an article which they titled, Push, Kiss Your Browser Goodbye, The Radical Future of Media Beyond the Browser. So that was back in 1997 that they were declaring the web to be dead. And then in 2010, Steve Jobs made this statement, that people aren't searching on their mobile devices as they do on desktop. What's happening is that they're spending all their time in apps. That same year, Wired published a piece with, with a now much rift on title. The web is dead. Long live the internet. And then just a few short years later, there were headlines like this, that mobile app usage increases in 2014 as mobile web surfing declines. In fact, there were a succession of such quotes and headlines. So the web is dying and apps are killing it, the decline of the mobile web and things like that. So why were there headlines like this? What was fueling it? Well, it was because of a study that was published by a company called Flurry. And they found that on mobile devices, only 14% of the time is spent on the mobile web, while 86% of it is spent in apps. And studies by Comscore and Nielsen found similar. So let's take a look at where the stats on this lie today. It's pretty similar. Today, we know that on mobile devices, only 12% of the time is spent on the mobile web, while 88% of it is spent in apps. This is a study by Comscore, and other research companies have found similar. But how exactly are people spending their time with apps? So the answer is that they're spending their time in primarily in social networking, in music, games, multimedia apps, and more. Two-thirds of the time are spent using apps with regards to entertainment or communication. So while it is indeed a great deal of time that people spend using apps, it's not evenly distributed across verticals. So they found stats like this back in 2014, too. But when people started looking at this more closely, there were some telltale signs that the mobile web had some great things going for it, too. So when they started to research more, started looking at the data, they found that the mobile web accounted for more traffic for many verticals than mobile apps. For example, this chart, this was from a year later in 2015. It shows that retail and finance and travel um, typically see 50% or higher proportion of their visits from the mobile web. So data like this led people to question some of those sort of more simplistic stats that were put out that seemed to imply that native apps were becoming the only important platform on mobile. 
So this kind of data provided further details, and that led to the headline, the web is dying. Wait, how are you reading this? I love that one. And so then there were lots of U-turns. Let's have a look. Not so fast on the death of the mobile web. But is the web dying? No. Mobile web might not be dead after all. Long live the mobile web. And Wired, in contradiction to their famous article of 2010, in 2014 claimed that the web is not dead. And then two years later, the web is not dead after all. Google made sure of that. And that reported about the advancement of activities that can be done in a browser and the early successes of progressive web apps. The article ended by saying, the truth is that app universe and the web are not mutually exclusive. We use both. Just maybe the web is more alive than ever. Now, more recently, the headlines have shifted to focus on apps. But they're kind of more tempered now, or positioned to be taken a little bit more tongue-in-cheek, learning lessons from the rounds of headlines that came before that was focused so assuredly on the death of the web. Authors and editors now know that the analysis is more complex and that there are multiple changes happening, changes in the web and the app ecosystem, and opportunities with burgeoning technologies like AR and, and VR, virtual reality, augmented reality. Apps themselves are also evolving, incorporating more activities and more services in some cases, increasing the time that's spent within them. So now we get headlines like this. Very alarmist, right? <laughs> the app is dead, long live the app. Apps are dead, it's all about channels in 2017. This one I think is the most important. You know, mobile apps aren't dead, they're evolving. All these things are evolving. and We're at a very interesting juncture. And we know that there are some native apps that are doing very, very well that broke into the market very recently, ride sharing apps and food ordering apps and more. There exist huge businesses such as Mintra, and Make My Trip, and Voot, that have built their businesses primarily on apps. And we all know of some business that are app only and have been very successful. Indeed, our company, Google, have released a number of app only products ourselves. So we have our Trips app for planning and booking travel. We have Ario, our food ordering and home services app for our India market. And we have Taze, our Indian-based payment app. There are other businesses that recognize themselves as being mobile web focused or are turning to the web now. Flipkart, the large Indian online retail store. And interestingly, Geo Cinema um, here in India, they recently have gone to the web for the first time with a progressive web app. And then I want to highlight West Elm. They're a furniture store in the US, and they've never developed a mobile app, a, mobile, a native mobile app, that is. Their VP of innovation, Luke Chatelain, explained this clearly at a retail conference earlier this year when he said that, well, people just don't buy a couch on their phone every day. And another way of saying this is, you know, make sure you understand your user behavior and do what's right for your users, for your business, in a way that really meets those users' needs. Indeed, his insight is very spot on. In a study I conducted earlier this year, participants often explained that they tend not to download apps unless they decide they could really use them a lot. So it's all about frequency often, because of the download process and so forth. It you know, adds something else to their phone, so some of them say it adds clutter to their phone, and of course, apps take up storage on the phone. In our studies, we found that this was a burden for some of our participants in the US, and other studies have found that in India, 33% of users run out of storage every day. So we know from user research that users like the convenience of launching apps from the home screen if it's something that they will turn to regularly. If you've been following the PWA developments, launching from the home screen is no longer the domain of native apps only, but also can be available for web apps, as he's seen here with this example of the Trivago app, which is a hotel booking app. In all, what's happening is that we're making the user experience across both platforms web and app, both, we're making them both better and kind of making up for the deficiencies that each have. 
And as part of doing this, we've created more tools for developers that can help with user experiences, like polymer elements for the web and material design for both web and app. And there's the ready availability of tools to help with speed and performance on the web, which is so critical for user experience. And for native apps, there's Android Studio with all the tools built into that. And Firebase is a suite of tools to aid app developers, as can be seen here. So here we have things like Test Lab and Analytics and Firestore, which there's been a talk about here at this conference, and A-B testing and many more tools. So the two platforms, mobile web and app, are now addressing the user experiences that they have been deficient in. We're helping users discover and experience native apps more readily through encouraging developers to create instant apps. And you can see an example here from jet.com. And we're helping developers create apps with speedier downloads that take up less storage on the device. And on the web, we're encouraging developers to create offline experiences so that experiences on the web stay engaging. And the progressive web app technologies that enable this, this service worker and the cache API, not only handle offline, but also provide resilience to network problems. And we're encouraging developers to re-engage users through notifications as well, as you can see here in this example flight app. So these capabilities uh, for engagement and re-engagement on the mobile web, they didn't exist before, so we're really trying hard to think about this. So the changes to both of these platforms are really fantastic. As I said, it's evolving. As you've already heard at this conference, many sites are pushing these modern features of the web, from AMP to Service Worker to Add to Home Screen to Push Notifications to Sign In to Better Payment Systems. These companies want to deliver better mobile website experiences. And this is just a map of some of the samples of brands that are raising the bar globally. And India has been especially rapid in adopting this technology. It's leading the world in many, in many cases in terms of its progressive web app development. But in addition to some of these cutting edge technologies, at the fundamental level, we have to provide really great mobile experiences, great design. We do this through the provision of creating great design. And for this talk, I've chosen to review some elements of mobile navigation, because that's common no matter what vertical you're working within. So this should be applicable to many of you. Let's talk first about Android system patterns. So these patterns can be used consistently for creating strong navigation and flow. So we'll start with the up button shown here. It takes the user upward in that app's hierarchy until they get to the home screen, taking users through all the previous screens they viewed. The back button, that works differently to the up button, because whereas the up button has users remaining in your app, the back button navigates in reverse chronological order through all the history of the recently viewed screens, whether or not that's in the same app. The back button does other things as well. It dismisses floating windows such as dialogues or pop-ups. It dismisses contextual action bars and removes the highlight from selected items and hides the on-screen keyboard, so you don't have to navigate back through those things. So those are some of the main kind of like system patterns for Android. So let's now look at some material design things that can happen that help with navigation. So there are many different elements that can help with navigation and flow in material design, both for the web and for apps. Starting with top tabs, this is likely to be quite familiar to you. It's a very useful navigation element, and users can switch between different categories of content easily with top tabs. So it's good when you have not that many categories of content, few top-level views. It provides a very good mechanism for promoting awareness as well as the alternative views within your app. So this illustration shows some of the different types of top tabs. And we find that using a label and an icon works best We'll talk more about that in a little while. It's also possible, of course, to provide a bottom navigation bar. And as with top tabs, it enables frequent switching between views and promotes awareness of alternate views. On mobile devices, the bottom navigation is located in a very ergonomic position. And we see that um, young people are more used to holding their mobile devices on one hand and therefore getting to these um, bottom navigation bars very easily. 
But what if your app has a lot of categories of content? In other words, ideally, you'd have lots of these uh, you know, different tabs, but it's not really functional. Well, so then we can use the navigation drawer. It enables quick navigation between views that perhaps are unrelated in this case. And it also allows for a deep navigational structure. And it can reduce the visibility of infrequently visited destinations, which is helpful in some cases. This is nested navigation when we have a hierarchy in the content we wish to display. It's a deep navigational structure with many different views. And this also enables very quick navigation between unrelated views. So it's an advantage when you have these unrelated views. And what do you do if you have this deep navigational hierarchy? Well, the navigation drawer also enables you to expand that hierarchy. The drop-downs open up the hierarchy. Some apps start off with that navigation expanded on the first view of mobile so people can see what's there. Now, this is embedded navigation. And when we talk about this, we're talking about a directly expandable surface. So this calculator, in this example, it uses an accessible panel to be a navigation aid to a supplemental view. So this image has the navigation panel expanded, the function panel, and it overlays a standard keyboard. In the collapse state, what you would see is kind of a peak of that so that the user knows that they can expand it. That's kind of the embedded portion. So it's not formally using tabs or bottom navigation, for example, um, to label that content. It's just directly expandable in the surface. That's another element of material design. Floating action buttons. These allows users to, to action the most common or primary action on the screen for that screen in the application. And the icon may be animated. Uh, the floating action button, it animates onto the screen as an expanded piece of material by default. So here we see the floating action button used for sharing and used to add something here to use to add a note. And perhaps for play or pause in this application here. And lastly of these, Gesture navigation. It enables users to navigate between content using different gestures. Users can swipe to navigate between sibling or peer views. The gestures include touching and dragging the screen horizontally, left and right, or vertically, up and down, and zooming out. So when do you use this? Well, this is recommended when you do have related content, right? It's for sort of naturally ordered relationships, such as pages representing consecutive calendar days, or views with very few siblings. Uh, or views of similar content types. So that's gestural navigation. So let's recap. These are the material design navigation elements we've reviewed. We looked at top tabs, bottom navigation bar, navigation drawer, the nested navigation, the expanded navigation drawer, and we looked at embedded navigation. We also looked at the floating action button and expanded navigation. So you can find out more about these within the material design guidelines online. Now, over the last few years, we've completed many user research studies to develop, to develop three sets of mobile design principles. That's 75 design principles in all that we've created. And we did many user tests for this, and we wanted to do user testing at this scale as Google because we knew we'd be releasing these principles to developers and designers around the world. And we wanted to be really sure that these principles released would be robust and, and based on this kind of user knowledge that we'd done through these testing procedures. So our user studies took place in our usability labs. Um, participants were pr prompted to visit and perform a key conversion task for six different apps or sites during their session. Each session that we brought users in for lasted an hour to an hour and a half per person. And we had participants bring in their own smartphones to conduct the task so that the phone that they had was not unfamiliar to them. And both iOS and Android were used in the studies in equal proportion. So they worked through tasks on the site or the app. And the method we used was traditional usability testing with Think Aloud protocol. So that's when the facilitator asks a question. So in the case you see here, the facilitator is asking for them to order dinner for tonight. 
and the participant speaks out loud as they're doing the tasks. And what this does, it provides us with insight into their understanding and provides us with details about when they get stuck or lost. We can very much see what's happening. And this is what makes it different than collecting your logs data or, or survey work that's you know, about attitudes um, and, and not really about observing behavior. So for all for the three studies, we conducted around 250 usability sessions. And we did this in collaboration with a third-party company called Answer Lab. They're a usability company. We tested 100 mobile sites. For the app study, we tested 100 apps. And for a study specifically focused on retail, we tested apps and sites, and we tested 50 of each. And the participants had longer sessions for the latter. We really wanted to get in depth. We had an hour and a half with each participant. So the sites or apps tested ranged from large retailers through information providers and service providers. And we looked at many different types of services like travel and e-commerce. We looked at groceries and, and purchasing groceries. We looked at news sites. We looked at food ordering. We looked at the category of home and garden, transportation, lead gen services such as insurance, and more. So those are just some examples of what we looked at. We wanted to keep it very broad. So you can get to all of the principles that we resulted from these studies. So if you want to be able to get to them, I suggest you take out your phones and take a picture of the links. Um, and so this was for the principles of mobile web design, the principles of mobile app design, and the principles for retail, which were based on studies, as I mentioned, for both mobile web and app. And the reason we've got two links for each of the, the first two was because we produced a second set. They're, they're the same principles, but the second link for each of the first two has um, developer resources embedded in there, so links to APIs and code snippets and so forth. Um, so the first ones you can pass on to your non-coding colleagues. Uh, they're nicely and cleanly presented, and then the second ones have got these links in for developers. So let's pull from a few of these principles in order to understand a bit more about navigation. So let's start with talking about those user experiences that can really stop users in their tracks. They're really fundamental. And so when implemented incorrectly, they stop that navigation and flow and often lead to users abandoning the experience. So this is when you see drop off. The first one is allowing users to browse your content before asking them for personal information. So before you ask them to sign up or register or collect other kinds of personal information from them, it's important to provide them with an excellent experience so they can become um, a real enthusiast about your product. And users abandon sites, we find, or our apps when the, the product asks them to provide this personal information up front, unless, and we've kind of seen this in recent years, there's some sort of immediate payoff that users are really um, clear about. So things like the car service or food delivery information, most users understand now that if I'm going to ask for that and want that, then obviously they're going to need some personal information from me. Um, in particular, apps, though, with a low brand recognition and those where the value proposition is unclear or those where that personal information really isn't needed, um, you know, they need to clear, clear a higher hurdle when they ask for people to register. So only ask users to register if it's essential. So we can see here that um, the user's being asked to uh, register straight off. That doesn't go down well. Um, but here they can get into the experience. Um, oh, sorry, let's go back one. They can get into experience and they can register later on, um, much later in the flow. So this one is similar. Um, it's all about putting a barrier in, in between people's experience. And the guidance here is like, don't let promotions steal the show. It's often us that are more interested in making that promotion to users and not the users themselves. So specifically here, we're showcasing promotional institutions, I can't say that word, institutions for apps um, uh, on your mobile website, right? Recommending the customer download your app. Um, so instead of something that you see like this on the left-hand side, a better option is to go with a small banner um, that doesn't interrupt the user experience that your user is having on your site. However, your best bet, rather than even this, is to make a fantastic mobile web experience, particularly with progressive web apps, capabilities where users can add to home screen, work offline, and more. 
So just adding some data to this example, I can give you some data from Google+. Plus. A couple of years ago, our Google Plus team showed that including such an experience with this kind of friction led to 69% of users simply abandoning the whole experience with Google Plus at that point. That's a huge drop off, right? So they knew about this principle, but they kind of didn't believe it and they wanted to look at the, the data. So that's what they found. And here it was, this is what it looked like. And the team changed to a much smaller, less intrusive app banner at the time that looked like this. And that resulted in a direct um, increase of one day active users by 17%. So that was pretty significant. And now they don't have a banner at all on their site. They went with the idea of simply providing a great experience on each platform, no matter what the user wanted to use. That's what the users come for. So now they have a great mobile web experience and a great app experience. And then the third of these that provide these barriers to people is about permissions. And I think you've probably talked a little bit about this at this conference already. Um, uh, it's really important to get this right. Users can get stuck in a task when they deny permissions that are integral to the proper functioning of the app. And they often do this when permissions are asked out of context. Um, so often we ask permissions at the beginning of the experience in the app and, and users don't know what they're asking for and they often deny them. Um, so to mitigate this, apps should ask for permissions in context and also communicate the value the access will provide to the user so the user understands it. And this is possible in both iOS and Android. And for Android, it was enabled back when Android M was made available two years ago. So make that permission request directly relevant to the task and the user will be more likely to grant it. So let's have a look. On the left, you see that the user is asked right up front when they open this app, this, this uh, e-commerce app. They want to use a location. It's a poor experience. Often people will say no because they don't have the context for it. In this one, they are in the app, they're using it, and at this point, they want to search for a store, so they click this button. And it's a much more obvious to the user why they're being asked for this permission at this time. So that's the last of those you know, experiences that really stop users in their tracks. Now, note that you might only get one chance when you ask for permissions, so it's important to surface them when there's the best possibility of them being accepted, as very few users will work out how to change their settings once they've blocked a permission. If we look at Chrome data, some analysis there has shown that users ignore or temporarily dismiss permission prompts more than 90% of the time. So in Chrome 63, permissions are going to become modal. This makes users five times more likely to accept or deny requests rather than temporarily dismissing or repeatedly ignoring them. So that's a change that's going to be happening. So you've heard much at this, at this conference about the importance of loading the home page and others' pages fast. We've talked a lot about speed. Well, once that page is loaded, they better have really key calls to action. Of course, this is important for mobile web and app. It's about figuring out the primary purpose of your site or your app for your users. And in our studies, we tested some sites that we came across that had similar calls to action like this, try it now or learn more. And I've still seen these kind of things more recently, um, but it's just not clear enough. It's just too vague for the user, and the user can't be convinced of what they came for. So the design on the right here is a lot more clear to the user if you're going to a real estate site, then you're likely to be there for renting or buying or selling. So figure out those key, t key uh, calls to action for your product and feature them really prominently. And this is something you can find out through user testing too. Sometimes we're so embedded in our products, we can't recognize it ourselves. So secondary content and calls of action can be addressed either further down the screen or behind menu icons. And we've talked about the use of a navigation drawer and other ways to, sur to surface those navigational elements. Now, when we think of menus, a lot of thought has to be put into organizing and labeling menu categories to be user-friendly. So first of all, menus should be short. No user is going to want to really scroll through long menus on mobile, right? But in addition, our studies have shown that if we don't think really carefully about those menu categories, um, then we don't reflect users' men mental model of those categories for your topic area. 
So this is where the user research activity of doing a card sort can come in, so that we can get into the minds of users and have them sort the topics in the category and across a number of users see how those fall out. And it might be quite differently than the way that we would organize it. It helps reveal the best structure for the organization of our content. So I give the example here. We saw things like this in our studies, where here the menu categories have kind of muddled both the product and the activities. And so this creates a conflict in users' minds. So if they're looking for like men's hiking boots, is that in men's footwear or is it in hiking? Okay, so think about your categories like this. On the right-hand side, we see that you know, they've just focused on the activities, so much cleaner, and it doesn't give users this kind of conflict in their minds. Now, providing text labels and visual keys to clarify visual information is really important. So let's take a look at this. We have some icons here, and they're unlabeled. So just in your head, think about what you think they, they might be for when you're booking a flight. Just take a little moment. What would that plane be for, and the check mark, and the star, and the person? Have you labeled them all? OK. All right, so let's take a look. Ta think to yourself whether this is what you thought. So the first one we've got is trips. The second one is book. The third one is club, like the, you know, the, the airline club. And the, th and the fourth one is account. Some of you, you probably got that one correct. That's a bit more standard. Um, but we really found, despite you know, thinking that some of these icons are super, super common, that generally when we're testing them without labels, it isn't the case. And so it's surprising. Things that you think would be common, like icons for menu, or cart, or account, or even store locator, were quite often muddled by participants. And also labels for, um, it's important to label actions as well, like filtering and sorting. And these weren't universal. You might think they are, but they're not necessarily well understood across apps. So icons that are labeled are much more likely to be used appropriately, and this can help in navigation. And then being responsive with Visual feedback is important so that users know the results of their action. So when users add an item to the cart or submit an order, the lack of feedback can cause them to question whether their action has been processed or not. Apps that provide a visual animation or another type of visual eliminate the guesswork for the user. And you can see this here in the positive example. This is a negative example here. Nothing happens, basically. But we have a toast um, or a uh, a snap bar element popping up to give the user this information that an item's been added. And then lastly, we're going to look at transitioning between apps and the mobile web and where that's important, and you have to do it, making it frictionless. So here we see users checking in for a flight. In this app, they're moving them to the mobile web, but the experience really disjointed and has a very different look and feel. In the good example, the designer has really thought about this. The teams have worked together. Often, it's different development teams. And the experience is much cleaner. Again, this is a navigational thing. It's best to try not to move people from one platform for another. But when you really need to do it, make sure that it's speedy. And the benefit, in contrast to any remaining friction, is worthwhile. So just to recap again, remove the barriers, registration, promos, permissions, those are the things that can stop users in their tracks. Create great key calls to action. Organize and label your menu categories. Provide labels to clarify visual information. Be responsive with your visual feedback. And make app to web transitions frictionless. All right. So here again, if you didn't take a picture of it last time, are those mobile web principles. And remember, the second of each of these links have additional resources added for you. So that brings me to the end of the principles we're going to talk through. Let's talk about the benefits of user research. So your apps and your sites need user testing. Your product isn't an exception. So if you haven't done it so far, I'm telling you you need to do that because we always learn something. You can start small, though. Start by understanding the user journey. This is really important. This, this one is for the process of buying uh, coffee. We're looking at new customers and existing customers. And it's important to understand that current process so you can get into their mental model and understand that and see how those experiences might map or not map to your experience and what they're going to get muddled with. 
So iterate on de the designs, the content, the navigation, the flow, and the usability. I want to give you an example. I have a user researcher on my team at Google who worked on this product, Ario. It's the food and home service ordering app that's launched here in India, and it's quite active here in, in Bangalore. She did many studies of food and home service ordering in India as the team iterated on their early concepts to get the app right. The research that she conducted helped the team understand the experience they needed to build to fit in with users' lives. Specifically, we tested the one on the left. This was not our release product. It exposed all the services that Ario offered. She conducted usability studies and found that people just could not get a quick overview in their heads of everything that was offered. We felt that they could. Like, design-wise, it feels like that, right? But when we actually user-tested it, we couldn't do that. Users couldn't do that. So she also did a card sort that helped with grouping. It helped with renaming some of the categories. And it helped with localizing the category content and the service provided. And all that design work resulted in the design you see today. Because for testing, that was found to work well for users. And in addition, the research helped to identify where the imagery needed to be localized. Things like there were, within these drawn diagrams here, there was the inclusion of meat and alcohol. And, and we decided to exclude those in the end. And we also decided to make the color palette more vibrant. So if your app or site already exists, it's still important and helpful to understand user journeys, both with and without your technology. This really helped for our ARIO product as well. And you also need to test your app and site. And while, yes, there's all sorts of biases for testing with family and friends, it really is like a suitable place to start if you've never got started before. And it can lead you to that aha moment. So say in your data you're seeing a drop off this can often be the aha moment. You realize why you know, they don't understand the label that's on the button, or you have some other insight. And as your testing gets more mature, you can iron out some of those biases in your testing if you're testing with family and friends and start to do this more formally and with proper screening procedures to get the right participants in. And to help you get started in user testing, we've got some great resources. Again, you might want to take a photo of this link. Um, Google Ventures, the venture capital arm of Google, um, has done a lot of supporting startups through doing user research. And they have a lot of great resources at this link. So I want to sum up this talk. The story of mobile web and app is still evolving. I think it's really, really exciting. We're looking to see where it's going to go next, and we're working to like, make sure that the experience on both platforms is really as best as we can make it, and making up for those deficiencies that the platforms have. So they're getting to be much more comparable. comparable. For example, both platforms can deliver a speedy user experience. For the web, surface workers, and, um, and the cache API, and, and, and other, other technologies can provide a really reliable experience, whether that's on stable 4G or, or poor sort of 3G networks. Both platforms can support the functionality to take photos, for instance, and the use of location services and more for both platforms. They're available on the mobile web as well as apps. For native apps, there are many ways in which these are becoming more discoverable, because that's been the big issue for apps, right? From being surfaced on Google Search, and in our ad formats on Search Now as well, so both in organic and, and in ads, as well as obviously being in display ads, and through to the affordances and the capabilities that we're having with instant apps to have that instant experience with, without needing to download. So the most important thing for development teams to focus on, though, is to create experiences that are best for users, whether that's web or native app design. And in this talk, we've reviewed some of the best practices for mobile design and provided links to more so that you can follow these best practices for your design and development work. And remember to conduct your user research to improve the mobile experience you're building. Start with understanding that user journey and design with that in mind, and then iteratively use a test to provide you and your team with the best opportunity to create a really fantastic, the best experience in your vertical for your users. So that ends our look at user experience design and navigation patterns for today. If you want to get in touch, I'm going to be around afterwards in the mobile and web design area. And we're going to be offering one-on-one -on -one feedback on your native app or your mobile web app. So you can come along to that area, and we can, and we can chat. And you can contact me at any time on Twitter at JennyLG. 
And I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I'm Yasmin Evian, and I'm a design advocate at Google. And I'm here in India to meet with Ola Cabs to talk about the unique challenges they face. So tell me, what is Ola? Like, what does Ola do? So Ola is India's largest ride-sharing uh, company. And I always say that Ola's product is not our apps. Our product is cab ride. For many people, we are their only, you know, transportation option to get to their workplace, and that's my product. With smartphone penetration outpacing traditional desktop devices, India has quickly become a mobile first nation. We need to ask ourselves, how might we design for the next billing users while being mindful for the unique challenges mobile first nations face? We have a responsibility to create things that are focused on the human experience, things that are centered.
Hi. How are you? Are you having fun? Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. It's a very exciting event. Uh, you all have a lot of energy, uh, and it's really great to be here. Um, my name is Silvano. Uh, I'm a developer programs engineer on the Actions on Google and Google Assistant Developer Relations team. Uh, and what we are going to see uh, in the next 20 minutes or so uh, are some of the fa my favorite features, like things that we added to Actions on Google uh, since we announced it uh, almost a year ago. Uh, if you missed the overview of the Actions on Google platform, uh, yesterday, uh, my colleague Daniel Imri Sutuyanake uh, gave the developing conversational apps for the Google Assistant using Actions on Google Talk. It's on YouTube. Uh, I strongly recommend you to watch it uh, if you want to see a more organic description of the platform. So let's start with a little bit of history uh, of the platform. Uh, it's almost one year old. Uh, we announced it uh, on uh, December 8, um, 2016. Uh, which means that next year, uh, next week, uh, will, uh, it will be our first birthday. Uh, and what we told you was that you could start extending the Google Assistant uh, by writing up using actions on Google. Uh, initially, uh, they would work only on the Google Home speakers. Uh, at I.O. in May uh, is when we did the second batch of announcements uh, where we added things like uh, support on phones using the Assistant app, uh, and the transactions and payments preview. And then if you see, like, in this second half of our first year of life, uh, the platform is starting to get momentum, uh, there's more announcement, uh, and the scope of the announcement is getting larger and larger. Uh, and we added more locales, uh, so uh, I think now we support 16 locales. Uh, we added uh, the speaker to phone transfer. Uh, we added easier app personalization, uh, SSML, uh, and uh, we will see in some more detail uh, like a lot of these features. So let's start by looking uh, at this highlight reel of my personal favorites. Uh, I divided them into two groups. Uh, the first group uh, is three things uh, that we did to make your life easier, uh, to make uh, the life of anyone that's trying to develop an app for, on Actions on Google easier. Uh, starting with actually making it extremely easy for you to create certain type of apps. Uh, for apps, there are uh, trivia games uh, where you ask questions to user and you score them based on the number of correct answers that they get. Apps, there are personality quizzes uh, where you ask them questions that get a score against trait of their personality so that at the end you can tell them, oh, you are very brave and also you are uh, 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 very cute, or stuff like that. Uh, and flashcards, which are apps where basically you can ask yourself a series of questions uh, to reinforce the learning of a certain topic that uh, you are studying. You don't have to write a single line of code. You don't have to design a single turn of a conversation of a voice user interface. We have implemented all of that for you, and the only thing that you need to do is provide content in a Google spreadsheet. Uh, from, uh, by copying a template uh, that we will provide to you. Uh, but let me show it to you. Let's see how I can create a trivia quiz here on Sage in uh, two, three minutes, I'd say. So this is the Actions on Google Console. Uh, it's where you start uh, when you want to create uh, an app on Actions on Google. Uh, if you are already familiar with it, uh, you can recognize the first three options are the standard options, uh, Dialogflow or Converse.ai if you want to delegate uh, the natural language pr to processing to one of these two services, or uh, Action SDK if you want to take uh, care of the NLP on your own. The second row is the templates. Uh, and let's try with the trivia, as I said. So uh, let's uh, start building one trivia app. Uh, the first thing that we did for you uh, is we built different personas, so different ways that uh, your agent can present itself to the user. Uh, and you can get a preview of how these are different in the way uh, they have background music and in the way they talk to the user. So, for example, let's try the Regal Queen. Uh, do I have audio? Informed me that this game has come to an end. 
My advisor will now calculate your results. So this is how the Regal Queen sound, and if you want to try the robot... I call that a right answer. I guess that's the end. Now let's see how well you did. And so on. And basically you can see like how your app will sound like to the user. Uh, let's, uh, for our app, choose the Regal Queen, go to the next tape. Uh, this is where we are asked to uh, upload our content uh, using one of the sheets. And so if we just press, uh, we get the link uh, to the template that we have. All we need to do is make a copy of this template um, and wait for Google Docs to load. Uh, and this is basically how creating a quick uh, look. You just have a series of questions, a series of correct answer and incorrect answer where uh, with suggestion chips we will uh, propose all of the three to the user. Uh, and then on some question you can even have a follow-up uh, to get them more hints on what could be the correct answer. Uh, if I wanted to add one here, let's say uh, it could be a true or false, Silvano has a long beard. And the correct answer, I guess, is true. And the incorrect answer is false. So once you change the content, uh, the only other thing that you need to change is the name, uh, the title of your app in the configuration, uh, because, of course, uh, we cannot have duplicates. And especially, you cannot use the same title uh, that the template itself has. And so we could call this uh, GDD India Trivia Game. Uh, and now I'm done. Uh, all I need to do is copy the URL of this sheet, go back, uh, hit Next, uh, paste it, and upload it. Now the template is validating the content. Our content was uploaded successfully. We can go on and create the app. And once the app is created, we will be able to test it. They're almost there. There we are. So now I can click test up. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't know if you've already seen it, uh, or if you know it, this is our uh, simulator that we have in the Actions on Google Console that allows you to test your app, uh, all your apps. At this point, if you have the Assistant app on your phone, uh, or if you have a speaker, and you're logged in with the same user that you use to create the project, you could also test this app on the phone or on the speaker. The standard invocation for an app under test is talk to my test app, and let's see what happens. Sure, let's get the test version of my test app. It is my honor to introduce you to GDD India Trivia Game. It is time to run the gauntlet. Let's begin. Your first question is here. The TV show American Idol aired for how many seasons? Anyone wants to try? 15? Let's see. Wow. Stupendous. Question number two is coming right. up. Uh, what are the official languages of Canada? OK, I guess we can stop here. But the game is there, and it's working. Uh, and the other thing that is interesting at this point is if you wanted to proceed and publish this app, uh, all you need to do is go back to the overview. Uh, you need to add some information for the app. This is things like what is the name of your app, uh, what are some of the branding information, like the logo, uh, if you have uh, a website where you want to link the user for, uh, to, uh, a privacy policy if you need one, uh, but for the templates we have a standard one that you can just reuse, uh, and then uh, you will be done. Uh, what would happen if you actually proceeded is uh, your app will be reviewed, in a faster queue, uh, and then it will be published and available to everyone. And so these were templates. Did I say three minutes? Was it three minutes? Was it like more five, maybe? But pretty fast, right? Um, so going back to the presentation, 
Uh, the next thing that I want to talk to you about that we make easier is personalizing your app. Uh, and this is very important, uh, because when, you are, uh, when a user is having a conversation, uh, they want it to be personal. And more important, because it's an assistant, they want to feel like that the, the app knows what their preferences are. Uh, and we observed developers, uh, and there were most of them storing uh, the information that they needed in external database. Uh, one very good candidate was Firebase, which is still like a, a great solution to do this. Uh, but we really wanted to make their life much easier uh, when it came to storing the user preferences. And so we added an API to do that. Uh, an example use case is imagine your app is uh, providing weather report to the user. One of the first things that you will ask probably is where they live, like either by getting a zip code, uh, which Wikipedia tells me is a postal index number here. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and that's, for example, something that you don't really want to keep asking your user all the time. You want to ask it the first time they start the app, and then you want to remember it forever, giving them a chance of changing it if, for any reason, they move to another country or simply another house. And so the way you would do this now with this new app that we've added, uh, the first time that you actually get uh, the zip code, uh, you will ask permission to the user can I remember this information that you've just given me uh, for the next time? And then if they confirm, if they reply yes, uh, you can save it into a JSON object uh, that can have like uh, all the structure that you can give to a JSON object. So uh, you can add arrays, you can add other nested objects to all the uh, depth uh, that you want, and then just save it. And we would just be sending it back to you all the time, so that all the time you can access uh, that information. Uh, and so, for example, like in the next time that the user is uh, uh, using your app, you can also check if you already have that information and skip uh, all the, uh, the code that is asking them, can I get that information? Another thing that we added is an SSML simulator. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with SSML. Uh, SSML stands for Speech Synthesis Markup Language. Uh, it's an XML-based uh, language that basically allows you to give us some text, and then our agent will read it uh, to the user. Uh, but what you can do with SSML is not just control the text, what you want us to say to the user, but also how you want us to say it to the user. Uh, you can add uh, music, you can add sounds, uh, and there's many more uh, cool things that you can do uh, to give your app a much better and more engaging uh, experience. It was hard to test it, because we didn't really give you an easy way. Like, you had to write some of the XML that you wanted to try, then put it in your app, run your app, and listen to it. And what we did is we added an audio tab in the simulator, and what we did is we added an audio tab in the simulator uh, where you can just put the, um, uh, the XML that you have and test it and see how the agent would be reading it. Uh, so, for example, if we look at this first example, uh, we have uh, some speak, uh, we have a sound at the beginning, it's a sort of a cartoon sound, uh, and then we are looking at changing the rate of the speech, we are looking at changing the pitch of the speak, and we are looking at changing the volume, uh, and then there's other cool things that we can do, like we can read the number as an ordinal, so instead of saying one, it will say first, uh, and then we can spell a word. Uh, and this is another thing that I just show you. Uh, let's hear it. So this is the simulator that I was talking about. Uh, it's in the uh, Actions on Google Console simulator. You have this additional audio tab, and now all you need to do is copy and paste your XML in here, uh, and then you will see how the agent would render it. So let's listen to this one. Hi. Or you can make it low. You can make it loud. Or you can make it quiet. Or all three things at once. But first, you can make me spell colors like blue, B-L-U-E. Edit this to try yourself. So we missed a little bit at the beginning, uh, but you get the gist. Uh, do you want me to replay it to get it better? Yeah? Hello. 
With SSML, you can make speech fast. Or make it slow. You can make it high. Or you can make it low. You can make it loud. Or you can make it quiet. Or all three things at once. But first, you can make me spell colors like blue. B-L-U-E. Edit this to try yourself. And basically now you're free to experiment with all the things that you want to do. And then when you're happy with the XML that you have, uh, you can actually incorporate it into your app. Uh, so let's moving back to the presentation, we now move to the second group of things, uh, which is uh, things that we added, like new functionalities uh, that improve the quality of the app that you can write, allowing you to do very cool stuff. Uh, and the first one is still SSML, uh, and we added some elements that will allow you to do sound layering. So basically, uh, you can have different tracks that you can mix at the same time, so that, for example, you can add a background music uh, that goes in a loop while you are telling users uh, what to do or while you are asking them some questions. And the other cool, uh, very cool thing about this element is you can define relations between the different elements so that, for example, you can say, I want this block to start two seconds after this other block, or I want this loop uh, to be played until the end of the speech. Uh, and the next example that we have is, imagine like you have a quiz game uh, where you want to give like some background music while you're asking some questions uh, to your user. Uh, and what this example is doing is exactly that. We have a loop that is playing. Uh, the loop is playing until the end of the speech. Uh, and then we have a question uh, that is asked. Some ins that are given to the user with some breaks to pause waiting for an answer. Uh, and then finally, we we'll give the answer with, a, with an additional emphasis. And this is another one uh, that it's better enjoyed if we actually listen to it. When was Wikipedia launched? Was it 2000? Or 2001? Or 2002? What is your answer? It was 2001. Wikipedia was launched on the 15th of January 2001, two days after the domain was registered by Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger. And so, if you see, like, you can give a pretty good atmosphere to your app uh, by using, like, uh, changing the inflection of the voice, uh, having more control on how your agent presents itself to the user, uh, but also adding background music that make the experience and the atmosphere uh, much better. Uh, can we go? Yeah, thank you. The next thing I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, is a feature that I like a lot. Uh, and it's a feature that allows you to uh, transfer a conversation that started on a speaker to a phone. And you might want to do this for two different reasons. One is, in some cases, maybe you start on the speaker, but then you want to show an image to the user, and now you can do it by saying, hey, can I use your phone to show an image that will better convey my message? Uh, or in some cases, is to give them like, a better user experience. Uh, so for example, like when you want to complete uh, a transaction or a payment. And it works a little bit like this uh, in practice. Uh, one of, this is actually showing one of my favorite use cases where you're ordering food. Like imagine you are in your living room, you're watching your favorite TV show, uh, or you're watching some sports. Uh, you want to eat, you don't really want to cook, uh, you want to get some food delivered. You can start asking what you want to get uh, on the speaker. You can complete your order on the speaker. And then when the moment to pay comes, uh, the app can just transfer uh, the whole conversation to your phone, and you can finalize the transactions on your phone. Uh, and the code is quite easy. Like, uh, there's two parts to it. The first part is requesting the surface transfer to the user. Uh, the way it works is we have an API uh, that allows you to check whether the user has a device uh, with the capability that you are requesting. So in this example, you want someone that has a screen output. Uh, if they have it, you can ask the user, hey, can I transfer to the phone, giving a reason. Uh, I want to do it in this case, for example, because I want to show you some 
uh, sample images. And then in the next step, all you have to do is handle the user response. And so if they've given consent to you to transfer to the new surface, uh, just show the image. Uh, and if they didn't explain them, I'm sorry, but I cannot proceed if you don't allow me uh, to do this. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is a very recent addition. Uh, this was announced in uh, November uh, 15, uh, and it's uh, updates and push notifications. So a feature that allows you to re-engage with your user. Uh, it's in a developer preview right now, which means you can test it, you can use it in your test app, uh, you cannot yet uh, use it in your production app. Uh, we have two models of uh, uh, re-engagement. One is uh, daily updates. So you can ask your user if they want to subscribe to receive daily updates uh, from your app. So for example, let's say uh, you have an app that is telling jokes, and uh, you want them uh, to receive a joke, new joke every day. Uh, you can use this feature, and the assistant will automatically pull an update from your app every day. The way it works is you need to configure on the accents on Google an intent uh, that you want to be called when they receive the notification. Uh, and then there's a utility function, uh, ask to register daily update for that specific intent. Uh, and if the user consent, uh, you basically are ready. At some point, you will start receiving every day uh, a request from Google. One thing that is important here is there is no guarantee that even if you ask the user to register, they will see uh, this request. Uh, Google will decide when to show it to the user. And basically, uh, we want to make sure that a user is engaged with your app before we present your request, because also this means that for you, there's a much higher chance of them actually wanting to subscribe to receive the updates. Uh, the other model is a more standard push notification model uh, that allows you to send asynchronously uh, updates uh, to the user uh, whenever you have content that you want to push. Uh, and so, for example, imagine you have uh, an app that is tracking tasks that the user might have to do. Uh, one of these tasks could be they have to pay a fine because they parked in the wrong spot. Uh, it's one, in one week, the fine will expire. They haven't paid it yet. Uh, you want to let them know that, hey, you have one week to pay this thing. Um, and it works pretty much in the same way. Like, this is more or less exactly the same code that you've seen. Uh, there's two main differences. Uh, the way you ask for, uh, for the permission is a different function. In this case, is ask for update permission. You still need to specify an intent that you want to use for this. Uh, and then, once you get the consent, uh, you need to save the ID of the user in a, a database like Firebase or whatever it is that you are using to store data for your app, uh, because that user ID is how you will be able to target the user uh, to receive the notification. When it comes to sending the notification, it's an HTTP API. Uh, this is an example of how you would send a notification uh, using uh, some JavaScript code, uh, but basically you just need uh, an access token uh, that you generate from a service account. Uh, you just need to structure uh, the JSON payload of the notification, uh, which is quite simple. You just need a title and then the user ID of the user that you want to target uh, and the intent uh, that you've enabled uh, for push notification. Uh, and then it's just an HTTP request. When they receive the notification, uh, the notification appears as a system tray notification on the Android app. Uh, and when the user clicks it on it, it deep links into the conversation using the intent that you specified uh, for the notification. So that was it. Uh, those were like my six highlights from the things that we've added. Uh, if you are interested, uh, these are some resources that you can use to keep an eye on uh, what's happening uh, on Actions on Google. Uh, our developer community, uh, our uh, developer, uh, dev uh, developers documentation, and the Twitter account. Uh, thank you for being here with me and uh, not going to lunch, I guess. Uh, and the last thing is, if you have any questions on this or more, uh, we will be at the sandbox, the assistant sandbox, all the afternoon. So just come uh, and ask us questions. Thanks. Bye.
Uh, it's been great meeting everybody here, and it's a rare privilege for me to get to come and speak to you all. Uh, this talk is about the fundamentals of Google Cloud IoT Core, and how I'm going to talk about, I'll introduce a concept of Cloud IoT, I'll tell you how our product works, and then we'll go over the basic building blocks of the platform. Uh, my name is Gus Klass. I'm a developer programs engineer on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, earlier this year, I was spending my 20% time on Cloud IoT, and recently I've started de dedicating all of my attention to it. Uh, in the past, I contributed to Android Things, Cloud Machine Learning APIs, and Google Sign-In. I also do arts and crafts with electronics and circuits. Um, hit me up on Twitter or find me in office hours after the talk if you have any questions or just want to chat. So things are increasingly becoming connected to the internet. Uh, in fact, it's becoming implicit that devices with any kind of computing capabilities are pretty much internet connected. This means different things to, diff to the developers who are working with these devices. In the industrial and commercial domain, uh, developers are now using newfound internet superpowers to do things like measure and control factories or run car and bike share uh, businesses. And homebrew and enthusiasts developers are internet connecting their projects for quantitative self, remote control, and home automation. Consumer products are frequently monikered smart and they can be controlled via the internet and are connected to other devices in the home so that they can interoperate with each other. But I think that there is more than just the internet connectivity that is relevant to this trend. So here you can see my robot friend, Mr. Scruffles. Uh, there are sensors on the front of the little fella, and his legs are connected to motors. Um, at some point, Mr. Scruffles was connected to the internet for remote control. But to the homebrew and enthusiast, Taking a robot like Mr. Scruffles and dedicating control to a giant cloud computer to make him smarter is what cloud IoT means. So look at that. Here's my hero, the Android Things Weather Station. I like the weather station because it straddles all the domains that I'm talking about today. All the way from homebrew to consumer devices and also in the commercial space. For the consumer devices developer, Android Things Weather Station can have its software updated through the internet should you want to make changes after you ship your device. If you're a developer in the consumer and devices domain, uh, you probably want to address capabilities to your devices by, by providing software updates after you've shipped that device. You're probably also thinking about adding predictive capabilities to your devices and enabling choreography across devices where you control one device or many devices in, synchronized, in a synchronized fashion. So you want to control which devices get which changes, and be able to roll back should, you not, not, uh, should there be issues with a change that you ship. So this is Cloud IoT for consumer devices. So here's a picture that I took of Gasworks Park. Uh, this is a decommissioned factory that in its heyday had meters and valves connected to tanks and boilers. I imagine that at some point, a mechanic would need to manually twist a valve to adapt to the conditions that she read from a meter connected to a tank. In a modern factory, such mechanisms are controlled with sensors and actuators. But in cloud-connected smart factories, the cloud controls the valves. And it does, this, it does this control based on predictions that are made from sensors that are, it, that are uh, distributed throughout the, throughout the factory. So you warehouse that sensor data, and you analyze it to make predictions. And then these predictions enable you to better control and proactively maintain your factory, making your factory safer, and more efficient. This is cloud IoT for commercial solutions. So Google infrastructure naturally lends itself to a number of the problems that you encounter in IoT. This lets you move from just a few devices when you're getting started to thousands or millions of devices. So the first domain that, that, Google, that Google Cloud really addresses the needs of IoT is automatic scaling. So increasing capacity is as easy as turning a dial or checking a box. Uh, we are also a leader in analytics and data warehousing. This goes hand in hand with Google Scale. So being able to process a large ingress of data from lots of devices or being able to transmit data to control a large, large number of devices is Google's bread and butter. So Google's also a, uh, an industry leader in machine learning and artificial intelligence. For example, our inception model is the baseline for feature detection in images, which is why I chose this photograph image. And finally, security. If you're not careful with IoT, your Internet of Things could quickly turn into 
a botnet of things. Google understands security and designs systems so that they can't be abused. This is why you would choose Google when building your IoT solutions that may be in deployment years and years from now into the future. So let's go over the platform. Cloud IoT Core connects your devices to Google Cloud to allow you to get all the features on Google Cloud down on your devices. This is exciting because you don't need to worry about scaling, and if your demands change over time, you'll have access to all those capabilities as we add them to Google Cloud. You don't need to build out devices with excessive power or computation requirements because Google Cloud operates as the brains backing your devices. So here you can see the products within Google Cloud that are relevant for IoT. So Google Cloud IoT Core, on the left of this diagram, connects, it operates as the identity provider and the communications bridge to your devices. So PubSub is connected one-to-one -one with Google Cloud IoT Core and is the critical entry point into the rest of our cloud. So PubSub is globally distributed and high throughput, which makes it a natural fit for IoT. With Dataflow, our ETL solution, you can migrate your data to warehouses such as BigQuery, Bigtable, or Spanner if those meet, if it's in, to meet your data warehousing needs. Uh, you can also drill down into your data using Data Lab or uh, Data Studio. And finally, you can use cloud machine learning and machine learning APIs to make predictions given your device data or to classify unstructured data. This is how we deliver on the promise of Cloud IoT. So now that I've hyped what cloud, what cloud means for IoT, you're probably wondering how it works in practice. So it's helpful before describing what we're, what, it's helpful before describing what we're providing to clarify what we're not. So you can see this picture here. Cloud IoT Core is not candy bananas. It's also not a device. We rely on hardware partners to offer, to offer these devices built with our solutions. And it's not an operating system. However, we work very nicely with a lot of existing operating system solutions for devices. It's also not a new protocol. Um, it could be bridged to new protocols, but it's not protocol specific. It's also new, not a new radio. So this is, not, like, this is not tied to a specific hardware radio, like some sort of LoRa-based solution, but we, w we potentially can work with LoRa and other radios. So here's how it works. On the Google Cloud side, you have device provisioning, which is controlling which devices have access to your cloud resources. And you also have choreography. And choreography, I like to think of as controlling individual devices or multiple devices in concert. And to facilitate this on the device side, we've taken a standards-based approach, which is kind of the Google way to do things, right? And so we support HTTP as one of our bridged protocols. And we chose this because it's supported on many devices. And developers are really familiar with this. For example, like, if you've got some sort of software solution, uh, we provide the curl library. The like, curl libraries are pretty predominant and available so that you can do HTTP really easily. And next is message queue telemetry transport, or MQTT. Now, this is an industry standard that is very efficient on over-the-wire communication. It's got a small memory footprint, and it's a ratified IoT standard. So if you've got a device that you're working with already, there's a very good chance that you've got an MQTT library for it. So using these standards-based protocols, you can now connect your devices to our cloud. And so let's see which services are in Google, uh, are in Google Cloud IoT Core to provide this functionality. The first is the device manager. So the device manager lives on the cloud side and controls which devices have access to cloud resources, and it's the choreographer for communication and synchronization across those devices. And then on the device side, we have the protocol bridge. We call it the protocol bridge because it's not an actual server, but it's a server-like it's like a server-like service that allows you to communicate using these available protocols with our cloud platform. All right, now that you've seen the product from a high-level perspective, let's drill down and look at the pieces in practice, starting with the device manager. So the device manager organizes devices using a hierarchical resource model. Uh, projects contain registries that in turn have devices, and then these devices have associated with them a credential and configuration. Multiple credentials can be associated with each device so that certificates can be rotated or revoked without transmitting credentials to devices and still maintaining that connectivity. So again, registries encapsulate devices and map devices from the protocol bridge to Google Cloud Platform. Um, these are always mapped one-to-one -one with a PubSub topic. 
So basically, you write to this, you write to this topic in, uh, the, in Google Cloud <laughs> IoT, and then those messages will appear in a PubSub queue. So gen um, registries are regional, as indicated by their path. You can see that I've highlighted the Asia East 1 um, region that is used inside of this address for that specific device. And generally, you want to aggregate all your data from a single, like, from a single given project to a single pub subtopic. So we don't anticipate many scenarios where you should be creating multiple registries within the same project. I know what you're thinking now. Create lots of registries. I know that my demo project does this. But you really are going to probably want to have your data in one place. So map your registries one to one with your projects. And the device manager is the first, next thing I'm going to talk about. This lets you programmatically manage your devices. As you probably expect, there is a CRUD model for devices letting you create, delete, list, describe, or update them. And there's also an IAM permissions model that allows you to delegate the control of these devices to other people. In this way, you could have a manufacturer who's registering your devices so that when the, when the device comes from that manufacturer to you, it just, it, you just turn it on the internet, and then it's able to connect to Google Cloud. So with each device, you have this metadata associated with it. I have the JSON representation up here on the right. And you can tell things like the last time that a device connected, um, you can tell whether, whether or not it was able to send messages to Google Cloud and so forth. This is really useful when you're debugging, but it also allows you to know like, what your fleet of devices is doing. And it allows you to get all sorts of analytics that you, would not, um, that you may not be able to get on other platforms. So we authenticate devices using a JSON web token or JOT, which is an encrypted payload that is verified server-side. So basically, the client needs its private key in order to produce an authorization credential that is verified on the server using the public key that you register with the server. So multiple credentials can be associated with a device so that you can revoke certificates or expire them without losing device connectivity. So we currently do not provide a mechanism for distributing new credentials to devices in the wild because if a device is fully compromised, the best way to recover the device is through a, me a mechanism such as um, a secure radio or an over-the-air update using the operating system that you have installed on your device. And this is just going to be implementation specific for now. OK, so device configuration. A device configuration is the means of communicating changes to a device from the cloud. Configuration, configuration change messages can vary from simply modifying a device parameter, such as like fan speed, uh, to, re to reconfiguring a device's context with a new one, such as uploading a new TensorFlow model. Configuration changes may, are, are acknowledged by the devices when they come down. And as soon as, like, as soon as the device actually connects and reads the, the configuration change, we consider it acknowledged. So in HTTP, you get these configuration changes by making a GET request to, an, uh, to a URI. And then in MQTT, you subscribe to an MQTT topic. And then you'll receive those configuration changes as they come. And in this way, I think that MQTT has a slight advantage over HTTP in that you don't have to kind of pull to get those configuration changes. All right, enough slides. Let's see what it's like to provision a device. And Sorry, my computer locked. This will just take one second. All right. So let's switch over to the, yeah, here we go. OK, so here you can see the Google Cloud Platform Console. You're probably familiar with this. And this is the new IoT core section. And if you navigate in the left menu here, you can just find it there. And so this is what, this is what IoT core looks like when you load it. And we're going to create a new device registry. And so when you create these, remembering back to what I was describing in those slides, you have to get the, the device registry an ID. And I'll call my device registry hello GDD India. And then you have, and again, registries are regional. So I'm going to set the region to the region that's closest to where we are, Asia East 1. And then again, associated with each registry is going to be a pub subtopic. So I'll choose one that I've already created, but you can now create these topics on the fly from the console here. And so then I create the registry. Whew, it's hot up here. All right, so now that I've created the registry, I'm going to add a device. And so before you can add a device, you need to create those asymmetric public-private key pair. And so I'm just using the sample code. This is, um, if you look at the actual script itself, it's just OpenSSL. 
And so I'm also creating a pkcs8 key, uh, which is used with Java. And so then I get the public key. And I, you can also do this programmatically using the API or using the console with gcloud. But for today, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to do this using. Um, oops. I'm going to show you how to do this using the console, which is relatively new. All right, and I'm going to call my device GDD India, and that should be the key. And if I did everything right, now the device has been added. Okay. So let's return to the slides. So now that we've added a device, um, it's time to start thinking about. Uh, connecting to that, connecting that device, and then communicating from it. So I'm going to go over the next part, which is the device protocol bridge, and this allows you to send device telemetry state and configuration updates. So there are three classes of messages that are sent over Google Cloud IoT Core. I have a heartbeat to represent the telemetry message. These are frequent updates from your device that are sent to be stored in the pub subtopic associated with your registry. The configuration messages, the next one are updates that are sent down to devices. So if you want to do cloud to device communication, this is done using configuration messages. And then the state messages, the third type, are persistent and are shared between the device manager and the device. So these are used for things like confirming and acknowledging configuration changes. Uh, that's why I chose this cute little receipt here. OK, so let's start with publishing messages using the HTTP bridge. Authentication is performed, using an, uh, is performed on the HTTP bridge using a bearer token. So you just pass inside of a header, an authorization, and then this contains things, or this contains the JOT, which we talked about earlier, which is the, which is the authorization credential. And so the token has, to, has an expiration of an hour, and, the, the, and that expiration needs to be in sync with Google's time servers. So specific to HTTP, you should be using lowercase headers and, ca and set cache control to no cache so that you don't miss any changes when pulling down configurations. And to send, uh, to send messages to cloud, you're going to post to a global endpoint passing in the identifier for your specific device. So uh, for requesting configuration from the cloud in HTTP, uh, you're going to have to auth authorize again using a JOT token. And you receive the configuration by making a get to the URL that I'm going to show on the screen or that I'm sorry, that I'm showing here on the screen. And um, this, this URL is going to correspond to an individual device. And in this way, you can send a specific configuration down to an exact device. And so when you send the configuration, you also request a specific version. As I said before, uh, Google, Google Cloud stores multiple versions of configuration for your device so that you can roll back. And you can request that specific version, or you can, requ or you can send zero to request the, la the latest configuration that was set on your device. All right, so one more demo. Uh, let's connect the device, send some messages, and see how that looks in the console. So remember, I created this, I created this private key and the public key. Um, from, the, from, an, from the Python sample, I'm going to use that private key to create an authorization credential, and then connect to Cloud IoT Core, and then, um, and then I'm going to send some, tra I'm going to transmit some messages that, that will appear in the console. And so if you look here, like I'm just calling this, this, um, this is the same sample code that we shipped that's available in the documentation. And um, you'll see that I have the registry ID, which we created earlier, the device ID, and the region, and then um, the, the project ID, which is used in the path of each individual device. So, when I, so what's happening is, so you, here you can see that I encoded the JOT, and then I'm using it to connect, and then I'm publishing these messages, and I'm getting a 200 success back meaning that it's working. And so now if we return to the console here, we can also we can refresh this, we can refresh the device and then see those changes live inside of the console. This is really useful for debugging. And so here you can see the payload that I'm calculating and transmitting to Google Cloud IoT Core. All right, well, I, that's, that's it for this demo. Can we switch back to slides? OK, great. All right, well, I would be remiss also not to cover MQTT. As a reminder, MQTT is a published subscribe standard that scales down nicely to IoT class devices. So when you connect to MQTT, the username is ignored. Um, as with HTTP, we're using a JOT as the password, and this has an expiration of an hour. And we also pass in the MQTT ID. In the, sorry, in the MQTT ID, we actually pass in the, the device identifier, so this is just a path to your device. 
And then um, after you connect, you can publish telemetry data using the device's device ID events topic. And you can publish state data using the device's device ID state topic. So you want to use the telemetry, you want to use the telemetry topic, which is events, in order to publish frequent data. And you want to use the state topic to publish data that is shared between devices and the device manager. And so again, if you have something that you're publishing frequently, like, your, like a heartbeat data, like, or sensor data that you're reading from, say a, like, say, a temperature thing very frequently, you're going to want to use events and send those state messages less frequently. So next thing we're going to talk about is the MQTT bridge for subscribing to topics. This is how you get configuration changes down to your devices. So a device can only subscribe to the MQTT topic devices slash device ID slash config. Um, when you connect the first time using MQTT, you'll receive the latest configuration. You can also request a specific configuration um, if, you, if, you, if you request it using the, um, by passing a, sub, a subtopic to the configuration. So configuration is acknowledged when the MQTT message is confir confirmed on the device. And this is QoS 1, which is at least once delivery. So you can anticipate that sometimes um, the, the configuration may come down to your device more than once. All right, so one more demo. And this one, I've got some hardware. And um, if we can dim the lights a little bit so you can see this better. So here is my little device. It's got a donut on top of it. And I've got an antenna loosely connected to it, so hopefully this works. I was feeling really brave, so I made this demo on the plane. And so here's, this is just an Android Things project. And I have, um, inside of the Android Things, I'm using string resources to configure the, the topic and the device ID. And then I'm going to have to configure it with the, with the credential that we just created. And so I just, so this again, I just copied the private key into a resources, into a raw resource on, um, on the Android app. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the Android app. And this will, this will hopefully connect successfully. I'm carefully reading the little ADB logcat here. That looks good so far. And so now I'm going to use the developer console to send a configuration down to the device. And so the configuration message here, um, if we can switch over to my laptop screen for just one second. So I, this is just an RGB value that is colon delimited. So this should set this, so when I click uh, send to device, this should transmit that message down, and then the device will subscribe, that's subscribing to that MQTT topic, will read that off, parse it, and then set the LEDs on here to red um, if it's working correctly. All right, can everyone see it? We, can you do the lights up here again? I'll try this. And there we go. So we see, <laughs> woo, yes, it's okay, you can clap. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's just send, let's update it a couple more times. Um, I'll turn it back off. Oh, there it goes again. And then one more. Um, so you can see just how fast this is happening. Um, considering this is conference Wi-Fi and like this is, you know, this is a demo that I just threw together in a few minutes. Like this is actually really performant. And here's another demo. And so you can see here's like a nice little animation with some LEDs. All right, and that's it for my demos. Thank you. Then now I gotta find my clicker. All right, great. All right, well now that I've shown you the basic building blocks, that, that's it, that's all the rest of the platform. Um, it's kind of, it, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of boring what you really want it to be. Because um, the, the, really, the most useful things are really simple. But now that I've shown you the basic building blocks of the Cloud IoT Core platform, uh, let's revisit how Google Cloud offerings come together to light up developer scenarios. So this I call an introduction to IoT patterns. So in this basic example, uh, devices connect to, a Cloud IoT, to Google Cloud IoT Core, and um, then, they, they, then all of those messages that come in go uh, into that pub subtopic, which is connected one-to-one -to, -one to Google Cloud IoT Core. And then we're using data flow to then migrate that data to BigQuery and Bigtable. So from there, you can, do to, you can do analytics on that data, and you can do those analytics in our powerful data, in our powerful data analytics tools, uh, Data Lab and Data Studio. So let's look at the next, let's look at this next example. So here we have device-to-device -device communication. And I imagine this is like things like you've got a doorbell on your front door, and then inside of your house, you've got a chime that gets actuated when you press that doorbell. 
So a device sends a telemetry message to Google Cloud IoT Core, which is connected one-to-one -one with PubSub. And then you, anything, anytime that a message comes into that PubSub queue, we have a cloud function that executes on the data that comes in. And then when that cloud function executes, what it actually does is it makes a configuration change using the Google Cloud IoT Core product back into another device, which would then ring the doorbell. And so the next one that I want to talk about, let's talk about some machine learning scenarios here. So imagine that you have a device with a camera. And it's connected to Google Cloud IoT Core so that whenever that, a picture is taken, um, a telemetry message is then sent over MQTT. Uh, and then that telemetry message would then appear inside of Google Cloud PubSub, which is connected one-to-one -one with Google Cloud IoT Core. And then whenever those messages come in, um, there, a cloud function is called. And then this cloud function makes a call to the, the Google Cloud Vision API, which then classifies that data and then sends you back labels about that particular data. And then that label comes back, so that structured data or a control message is sent back to a device. So as an example, imagine that you've got a door to your garage, and you've got a cat. And raccoons keep coming through that garage door, or the little kitty door, and they're breaking in and eating all your cat food. So you could filter out the raccoons by taking a picture before unlocking the door, and then uh, detecting cats. So you would see, like, you'd, you'd, run, you'd run through, and then when the cloud function returns, the Vision API would be populated with labels such as cats or raccoon. And only when there's the cat tag uh, present and the, uh, the, raccoon, the raccoon tag is absent would you unlock the door and allow the cat in. And so we have one more example with, uh, with machine learning. And so you have a device, imagine like you have all of these industrial, this industrial equipment that's out, in the, that's out distributed across you know, your country. And uh, a device sends this telemetry, uh, this telemetry message up to Google Cloud IoT Core. This could have things like the oil viscosity in an oil station or the temperature. And then all that data goes into Google Cloud IoT Core, which then triggers a cloud function that takes that data. That's, so this is like the, the sensor data over time. And then um, that's passed into a cloud machine learning engine model that then makes a prediction. And so then from that prediction, we then, send, we then control those devices again, either from Cloud IoT Core, or we, uh, or, we use, uh, or we actually use another notification system to send messages down to the users as relevant. So as an example, imagine that you've got a carbon monoxide detector in a factory. Uh, rather than going off when the levels just reach some dangerous threshold, uh, you could warn people when the levels are rising. And so these are the kind of things that you can do with Cloud IoT Core. Um, without, having to, without having to worry about having that functionality down on your device. And so one more, one more example, because I want to talk about Android Things and Firebase. Um, you have a device powered by Android Things that is listening for changes to a real-time database. Um, it's connected to a light and potentially other smart consumer products. And you want to do things like, like a window shades in a sound system so that when you, when, you set a, when you press a button in your house, you want, for, uh, you want for it to be ready to play, uh, to play your movie. So it dims the lights, and it sets your surround sound up correctly. So device one transmits its telemetry message to Google Cloud IoT Core. And so you press a button, or you turn on your Blu-ray player. And then um, that message comes into Google Cloud IoT Core, which is connected one-to-one -one with PubSub. And then, we use, and then we use Dataflow to deduplicate and to, order the, and to uh, make sure that the messages are coming in order. And then um, that, that will then pump a state into a Firebase real-time database that's, list, that's being listened to by Android Things. And then that Android Things device can respond to those messages and then can set all of those, all of those widgets inside of your house up to the modes that you've configured for it. And so we're using Firebase here because we want to share that state across all those devices so that, um, so that um, all, of those, all of those changes can happen at once. So our beta has been public for around a month. Um, it's a great time to take a look at our platform. Um, all the documentation is available here. And I recommend you start from the docs and try out the sample apps. Um, that's all I have for now. Feel free to ask me questions on Twitter. I've left my uh, little Twitter up here. It's at G-G-U-U-S-S. Or post questions to Stack Overflow using the Google-Cloud-IoT tag. Um, I'll also be in office hours after the talk in Conference Hall 3. And uh, that's it. Thank you all for listening.
parents didn't graduate high school. When I sat in front of the computer, I felt like I had superpowers, but people told me I was just wasting my time. When I turned seven, I got asked to build a computer with my dad. It was mind-blowing for me. Then, you know, something that I built came to life. When I graduated high school, my parents just told me that I need to do something that can lend me a job. I didn't really know where to go, and I gave up on my dreams of pursuing computer science, and eventually I got into business school. I felt like I was out of place. I felt like it wasn't a good fit, and I knew it wasn't a good fit. Dropping out felt really risky because I was afraid that I'm going to make the same mistake again. Since my parents didn't graduate high school, they didn't know what was right for me. I found Udacity. It was a good way to learn about different areas of computer science before I start my studies again. Online learning is really good at reflecting the market's needs. And you can start with something like web development and work yourself up to self-driving cars. It's all in the realm of possibilities and, and you don't need a degree and you can do it from anywhere in the world. With Udacity and Google, you build projects which are interesting for potential employers. When I had my job interview, they looked at the app I built and they saw what I could do for them. Once I got my certification from Google, it took three months to go from knowing some programming to landing a job. Which is really a fast track program to becoming an Android developer. My work really reflects how I approach things, and seeing people enjoy that gives me the feeling of being on the right track.
everybody, welcome. I'm Paul Saxman, and I lead the uh, Android Devices and Media Developer Relations team. Uh, D Dan Gelpin's going to be joining us for the uh, later half of the talk, uh, the, the third part of the talk. Um, Dan really doesn't need any uh, introduction besides just who he is to a room of Android developers. Uh, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, building rich media experiences with Android. Uh, so what are these rich media experiences that I'm talking about? Uh, media, being audio, video, uh, playback, and recording, is used in almost all types of apps in Android, with only a few exceptions. Uh, this means that the Android media APIs are some of the most widely used uh, by developers and users outside of the core framework. So it's important to pay close attention to the media experience while building apps, because an inconsistent media experience can draw negative attention to your app. So we're going to talk, uh, break this talk into three parts. Uh, the first part is about media app fundamentals. I'm going to talk about four very important media APIs that you need to know about. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of important media APIs, but I'm just going to focus on, focus on four of the most important. Uh, then I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, bringing apps to the TV, uh, because we have some updates since Google I.O. that I want to talk about with uh, and Android TV. And the last part, which Dan will present on, is uh, tapping into Pro Audio in, on Android. So there's a new API uh, called Obo that we released not too long ago in developer preview. Uh, that we'd like the developers to kind of try out and get, our, get feedback on. So four very important media APIs. Um, those four important media APIs are Media Session, uh, Audio Focus, Picture in Picture, and Wide Aspect Ratio Screens. The last one, not exactly an API, uh, but it's something that is very important for media apps to keep in mind. Again, these are only for the most important APIs. So obviously, you know, media player, whether it be the media player or exo player, also very important. Um, but these, these four are very fundamental to building a really uh, core experience on Android. So the very first one, media session, allows media controls external to your app. A uh, media session uh, is very important to Android devices, such as TV and Wear. Uh, as it allows media playback on the phone to be controlled by these devices. Uh, so if, you, if the user starts media playback on their phone, they plug it into an Android Auto-capable uh, head unit. Uh, those media controls that they get on the head unit will control the media session on the phone. Uh, the same is true with Android Wear. Um, if you have an active media session on your phone, um, you can actually control that uh, media session using uh, your watch. On Android TV, uh, Android TV can actually provide controls for media being played in the background if you're playing music. Um, it's also the media session is fundamental to the uh, Google Assistant on Android TV. Uh, so, so if the user wants to speak, uh, play, or basically transport controls uh, into the remote using the Assistant, uh, those transport controls are passed to the app uh, using the media session. Uh, media session is also used across the Android system to provide users with the ability to control playback uh, while an app isn't necessarily in the foreground. Uh, for example, it's used by the lock screen interface. Uh, so if there's an active media session, uh, the lock screen interface will show media controls to allow the, the user to control that. Um, it's also used by media style notifications. Uh, these are the notifications that, that allow control for media playback while it's in the background. Uh, media button input. And so media buttons are buttons that you typically see on Bluetooth headsets. Uh, play, pause, forward, and backwards. Uh, those media button inputs are, are passed to your application via the Media Session API. And also, Picture in Picture uses the Media Session. Uh, so if you're, you're, your application is uh, shrunk down to a small window size in Picture in Picture mode, if you have a Media Session, uh, the user can actually get uh, playback controls uh, uh, directly on the uh, Picture in Picture window. Uh, so the design for apps playing media in the foreground is pretty simple. Uh, fundamentally, they have an activity and some player. Uh, to add media session support, you first need to add a media session. Uh, you instantiate the media session. Uh, this tells the Android system that your app is, is or will be playing media. Uh, you can then add media session callbacks, which allow you to bind transport controls, play, pause, seek, and forward, uh, sent to the media session to your player. And finally, uh, you need to add a media controller, uh, which is how you bind media controls in your app uh, so if you have a media button in your application, uh, you bind that to the media session. So if, if the user presses, presses uh, pause in your application, uh, you use the media controller to send that to the session. Uh, that session will update the media session callback, so you can actually uh, adjust the, the playback there. Um, but then all these other external uh, interfaces that are using the media session will all be updated uh, at the same time, since you use the media controller. Uh, so apps that allow... Uh, audio playback in the background are quite similar in their use of media session. However, they have a service um, 
a service for background music playback. Uh, you therefore, you move the media controller to your activity. So you only really need the media controller uh, when you actually have an active interface. Otherwise, those interfaces, like the, uh, the media notifications, the lock screen, notif the lock screen controls, um, are all done automatically using the, uh, the media session API. Uh, so setting up a media session uh, is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, you have to instantiate a media session. Uh, here I'm using Media Session Compat, uh, which is part of the V4 Media, media Compat library. So basically, it's supported across most Android devices. Uh, then you set flags about what, your, what you want your media session to handle. Um, here, I'm sh the three options are transport controls. Again, that's play, pause, um, play, pause, stop, uh, seek as well. Uh, the media buttons, so these media buttons from Bluetooth headsets. And also Q commands. Q commands are for um, adding things to like a playlist, or removing things from a playlist, or moving between items in, in a playlist. Uh, and then you actually have to active or set your media session of active. And this tells the system uh, that, that this media session should, uh, is available to be interfaced with. Uh, the other part that I mentioned is that you have to listen for media controller input uh, in your media session. So basically, you set the callbacks, uh, which is a class that you have to uh, create yourself. Uh, the media session callbacks are very straightforward. Uh, they basically have all the media controls that you'd expect, uh, the, all the transport controls, uh, the media button controls, and also the transport control interfaces. And basically, once your app receives these events, uh, you just pass them on, uh, essentially, to your uh, media player. Uh, using the media controller is likewise fairly straightforward. Uh, you instantiate a media controller. Again, use the media co controller compat. Um, and then you can use that media controller to actually fire off fire uh, media control events, or transport control queuing or media button events. Uh, if the, uh, the media session happens to be in another, um, in another process, so let's say you have a background service that is running the media session, but you want the media controls in your activity, uh, you can actually get a token from the media session in your service, pass that up to your, your activity, and then use that when you instantiate the media controller. Uh, media session is a fairly complex API. Uh, what I've showed you here, uh, really just scratching the surface, but this is really the fundamental thing is actually to, to add this playback control into your application. Uh, the other things that it supports, media metadata. I mean, you can push information about the media that's playing to the media session. That will show up on the lock screen or show up in the, the notifications or on uh, your watch or your, um, your auto head unit. Um, syncing playback state. Uh, media queues, this is playlist, so you can add add playlists to the media session, uh, and this lets other applications that are providing interfaces into your app know about that. Um, media controller callbacks, media style notifications, uh, a lot of different APIs built in there. Uh, getting started with media session, um, basically understanding what I told you today, plus all these other features, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. So developers.android.com, uh, we have a full section on building media apps, and this covers mostly, mostly the uh, media session APIs and related APIs. Uh, we also published recently uh, four-part articles. Uh, one of my coworkers, actually, uh, Nazmal Idris, um, a four-part um, articles on understanding media session. Uh, so this is really probably where you want to start because this breaks down the APIs like I did here, but in a little bit more detail. And also, we have several GitHub samples: uh, the Media Controller, uh, Media Browser Service, and the Universal Media Player. Um, these all show various aspects of using the, the media session APIs as well. Uh, so if you're looking for code, this is a great place to start. Uh, the second API that I want to talk about is Audio Focus. Uh, this is sharing control of audio output. Um, any app can output audio at any time on Android. And output, outputting audio needs to be cooperative. Um, basically, the system doesn't necessarily mediate uh, control of the speaker. And this is what the Audio uh, Focus API is for. Uh, the Audio Focus API has been around in Android probably since the beginning, uh, but it was updated with Android O. And I'll talk about the differences here. Uh, there are three steps to ensuring a great audio experience. Uh, the first step is before you play audio, ask for audio focus, and only play audio if the audio focus is granted. It's very important to, to if audio focus has been declined, to, to actually not start, start playback. Uh, if somebody else asks for audio focus, deal with the focus loss. Um, so basically, be ready to hand off uh, audio focus from your app at any time. And when you're done with audio focus, release it. Uh, this one tells all other applications that they can also, now they can actually take control and use the auto focus uh, if they need it. Uh, so requesting audio focus, uh, basically you need to get the, uh, the audio manager from the system. 
Uh, this is par partially new. So the audio attributes has been around since API level 21. Uh, but this is the first time with Android O that the audio attributes are used with audio focus. So the audio attributes tells, basically tells the system uh, why you want to play audio and uh, what type of audio that you're playing. And this gives the system the ability to make decisions about audio focus uh, without necessarily kind of, um, kind of bothering the applications. So for example, if you're playing music in the background, uh, you, you request audio focus and you're playing music in the background, if the system needs to play a, a notification sound, for example, it will automatically duck the music playback uh, and, and won't necessarily call into your application. Uh, and this, is, this API here is actually new, the uh, audio focus request. Um, so, so basically, when you actually request audio focus, you need, now need one of these auto focus request objects. You pass your audio attributes. Um, you, you create uh, your uh, on audio focus change listener. This lets you respond to the auto focus changes. Um, and then you actually request the audio focus by uh, passing that to the audio manager. Uh, grabbing this result is very important uh, because the next step, like I mentioned, is you only play audio if focus is granted. Uh, so this result can take three different... Uh, three different values. It is either failed. Uh, the system did not want to give you audio focus. Um, this could be because the system is actually, you know, has exclusive access to the audio at that time. Um, you know, an example of this might be a phone call if the user is actively in the phone call. Uh, the audio focus grant, uh, request could be granted. And at this point, you can go ahead and play your audio. And the third state is the audio focus request is delayed. Um, again, this is if the system is, has exclusive hold of audio. Um, and you, but you can uh, get audio uh, gain later on. And this is actually, that audio gain is passed through to uh, the audio focus change listener. So the audio focus change listener, again, is how you listen for other apps to request audio focus, or if you, um, audio focus is handed back to your application, uh, you'll get the audio focus gain uh, through the audio focus change listener. Um, and these are the four states. These have existed per, prior to uh, Android O. Um, so, so basically, you're, you're either getting, uh, another app is asking for, um, giving, you, giving you the audio focus back. Um, you're losing audio focus for an indeterminate amount of time, which means that you should probably clean up your audio, um, your media playback, or media player. Uh, the, the auto focus loss could be transient, which basically means you, play, you pause playback. And then the last bit is that the, it can be transient, but you can duck, which means you can, uh, you can basically um, turn down the volume temporarily. Um, and then the last part that I mentioned is releasing audio focus is very important uh, because this is when you tell other apps that you're, you're basically done using it and they can continue their audio playback if necessary. Uh, again, a lot of great resources uh, for getting started with audio focus. Um, we have a whole guide in, the, in our developer docs on managing audio focus. Also very recently, uh, the same author, Nazem Idris, uh, wrote a three-part article on understanding autofocus. He breaks down these different use cases, um, and he also talks about the new APIs as well. And also we have several samples, uh, both for testing and uh, demonstrating how the, the audio focus should work in your applications. Uh, the third API I want to talk about is Picture in Picture. Picture-in-Picture um, -picture allows your app to actually continue media playback even after your application has been paused. Um, so you can see in the example here, uh, the user is doing a, a, um, a, a video, video chat. Um, when the user actually goes back to the home screen, the video chat window shrinks down, um, stays on top of the home screen, and also stays on top of other apps. Uh, this API is really important for media apps, especially video apps, uh, because if the user is watching a movie, for example, and they want to go to the, basically check something in their calendar, uh, they can continue playback without actually, um, or they can check their calendar without actually distributing the, disturbing the playback. Uh, there's three steps essentially to, to uh, supporting picture-in-picture. Picture. Uh, you have to declare PIP support in your activities. Um, you have to switch to PIP mode as needed. And you have to hide non-essential UI uh, while in PIP mode. The way this looks, uh, declaring PIP support, uh, you basically do this in your manifest using the supports picture-in-picture picture, uh, manifest attribute. And then an important thing to remember uh, about this is you should always, uh, if you're supporting picture-in-picture mode, uh, you should add this config, config changes uh, line. Because what this tells the system is that uh, basically don't uh, reinitialize or relaunch your app during PIP mode um, transitions. Uh, the next thing you want to do is switch to PIP mode um, basically on user demand. Uh, this is via a button. So let's say you have a button in your application that you can press to put your application into PIP mode. Uh, to do that, basically implement it, you're on click listener on your button, um, you're get, and call the enter picture in picture mode, 
picture in picture mode uh, uh, method that's part of the uh, activity. Uh, and, and to that, that method, it takes a params, which is the picture in picture params. Uh, the picture in picture, picture in picture params are useful because uh, you can actually set uh, actions on top of the, the uh, picture in picture window. So these are buttons that the user can press. Um, and you can also set the aspect ratio. So for example, if your screen is, is in uh, portrait mode, at, but you want the picture in picture window to be in landscape mode, um, you can set an aspect ratio to define, uh, define that it should be in aspect or in landscape mode. Another great thing you can do too, uh, we, we highly recommend this, is you can switch the picture in picture mode uh, when the user hits the home button. Um, you do this by using on user uh, leave hint. Um, and basically you call the exact same API here, uh, but once the user hits the home button, this will actually take your app into to PIP mode. Uh, again, this is a very nice uh, user interface for, um, for media applications or movie applications. And the last part is hiding non-essential UI. Um, either the activities and fragments now have on picture and picture mode change um, as methods. Um, and these methods are called when the, the application either goes in or out of picture and picture mode. And before, what I mentioned about hiding the, uh, hiding the full screen UIs, that's basically hiding everything besides uh, the video viewer, what you're using to actually render the video. Uh, and again, you can essentially, if you're using media session in your application, if you have an active media session, you can hide all the controls. Um, and there, and what the media session, or what the PIP will show, is media controls uh, that will be passed into your media session. Uh, so another really good reason to use media session. Uh, a lot of great resources on getting to learn more about picture-in-picture. Uh, -picture. I definitely recommend, so the, the picture-in-picture guide um, in the developer, the, in our uh, developer docs have been updated. Um, it has all this information in it. Uh, we also released two um, articles recently. Uh, one of my coworkers, Benjamin Baxter, uh, making, ma making Magic Moments with Picture-in-Picture, -picture, basically describes the fundamentals of, of using Picture-in-Picture -picture and the usability around it. Um, and I also did a follow-up on navigation patterns, which talks about using things like the home button uh, to switch the app into Picture-in-Picture -picture mode. And the last one I was going to mention, the last API, again, this isn't exactly in an API, um, but wide aspect ratio screens. Uh, so basically, if, if you don't do the right thing, uh, your application is going to be stuck in 16 by 9 mode, um, even though the, the, the device screen could be 18 by 9. Uh, what that means is your application will only show up in the blue area on the screen, um, and the, the red area will be just rendered black, essentially, by the, app, or by the system. And why the, the reason this is very important uh, for media developers is if you're playing back video, and the user wants to view that video in landscape on their full screen, and they see these bars on the sides, it's going to be a fairly negative user experience, especially since these phones are kind of, um, these, these wide aspect ratio phones are, are kind of premium devices. So uh, the way you want to actually uh, fill in the wide aspect ratio screens, to go beyond the 16.9, uh, basically target API 26 or later. Um, with 26, uh, plus devices, uh, the max aspect ratio is the native aspect ratio of the device. Another thing that you can do if you can't yet target 26 plus, if you target 24 plus, uh, your apps by default or your activities by default are resizable. Uh, resizable what's used by the system for, um, for multi-screen. Um, and basically, if an, if an activity is resizable, it means it supports any aspect ratio, including these widescreen aspect ratios. Um, if you're not targeting 24 plus, you're not targeting 26 plus, um, you can also go in and make your app resizable. And the last thing you can do is you can actually specify a maximum aspect ratio, uh, but this is the last resort. What you should really do is one, two, or three above. So making your app resizable, again, this is only for uh, 23 or, or, or under uh, target API, uh, because at 24 or above, uh, these are on by default. Uh, you can set these manifest attributes, um, either in your application, and it'll apply to all all activities, um, or you can specify it on the activities themselves. Um, specifying a max aspect ratio, again, if you're targeting 26 plus, the max, a max aspect ratio is the uh, native aspect ratio of the device. Um, but for 25 or lower, uh, you can use this metadata tag to specify that your, your app should support these wider aspect ratios. Uh, the value 2.1, it's basically you know, 18 point 18 divided by 9 is going to be 2, so using 2.1 means that you'll, you'll use not only 18, point, 18 by 9, but even wider screens. Uh, the problem with this, I mean, the reason that we say you should make your application or make your activities resizable, instead of using this, though, is because, uh, you know, what happens when there's 2.2 aspect ratio screens? You're going to have to go in and update your application. 
So uh, ideally, you'd actually support this uh, directly. Uh, before I call Dan up on stage, I'm going to talk uh, really briefly about bringing uh, some updates about uh, Android TV. Um, so at, at I.O. this year, we announced a new Android TV home screen, and we also announced that the Google Assistant was coming to TV. Uh, since then, uh, both, have, both have launched. The new Android TV home screen is available on the Nexus Player, and the Google Assistant is available on Android TV devices uh, since Android M, I believe. Um, so integrating uh, Android TV, uh, four ways to integrate on Android TV and the Assistant. Um, you can uh, actually integrate content in the Watch Next row. Um, you can create channels and programs. Uh, you can implement global search, or you can implement media sessions. Um, global search provides uh, search to the Assistant on Google TV, or Android TV, and the media session um, provides media controls via the Assistant. Um, I'm not going to go into the technical details about all of these, uh, specifically because we, we cover a lot of those at Google I.O. and the API hasn't changed. Um, but uh, the first way that you can integrate is you, uh, on the new home screen is the Watch Next row. Uh, this row is intended for, uh, to be used by showing content the user is in the middle of viewing, uh, new content, say a new episode that was released recently, or a next episode in a series. And developers can add content to the next, Watch Next row. Um, and apps can also allow users to add content manually. Um, so if the user is inside your application browsing content, they can click on a button, and ideally click on a button inside of your application and have that content added to the Watch Next row. Uh, apps can also create channels and programs which can be displayed on the home screen. A channel is a row of programs that your app uh, maintains. Uh, applications get one default channel, channel row, so when the application is installed and you populate a channel, um, that will actually show up automatically on the user's uh, home screen. Uh, applications can have multiple uh, channels, though, and it's up to you to kind of determine uh, how many channels you want and how you configure those. Uh, the first way to integrate with the Assistant on Android TV is to make your content searchable using a global search provider. Um, so if the user is either searching for content or wants to play content, so if they use the Google Assistant and say, play Big Buck Bunny, uh, what the Assistant will do is it'll use the, the global search providers across all the applications uh, and look for that content. Uh, if your, your application has an exact match, it'll actually show up at the top of the list. Um, if your, your application has multiple matches, it'll actually show up below. So, so ideally, you, you can actually find, find an exact match for the user uh, for these queries. Um, if there's only one application has an exact match, uh, and the user is requested to play the content, uh, that, act, that content will actually be automatically played within your app. The user doesn't have to go through the selection process. And the other thing that I mentioned, too, is uh, voice-based media controls via the Assistant. Uh, so if your application supports media session um, and the user invokes the Google Assistant while your, app, your content is playing, um, they can actually issue transport controls via voice. So play, pause, seek forward, seek backward. Uh, so this is very important, another very important reason to uh, definitely consider using the media session uh, when you're building your media applications. Uh, so a lot of areas uh, for getting started with the new Android TV home screen and the assistant on, on Android TV. Um, so we have several guides in our developer content. Uh, we also, for Google I.O., we built a, uh, a code lab which goes through all the important parts about integrating with the channels and programs. Um, and also recently we released a lean back sample um, that shows you how to use the Assistant uh, and tie that in with the, uh, the Android TV Leanback API. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand off to Dan, who's going to talk about a new, exciting audio API that we have in Android. All right, I don't have, I don't have much time, and I'm losing my voice, so please, uh, I apologize for that. But it's great to have you all here. Pro Audio is something I'm very passionate about. So first of all, you know, we, did a new, we added a new Pro Audio API to Android O. And you know, we already had OpenSLES, but we wanted to find, do something that was easier to use and easier to improve. Now, all the audio APIs end up going through Audio Flinger for this framework. But since making huge changes there could potentially break lots of code, um, A-Audio has a new service. Um, where we can do some pretty radical things and get some performance enhancements. And actually, if you're running the developer preview on a Pixel or Pixel 2 device, you actually can get really reduced latency thanks to this framework. So very, very cool. Now, A-Audio uses the concept of streams. In this case, flowing from the mic um, to the app and then back to headphones. 
And these audio streams are really easy to create. We've made this API much more straightforward um, using this builder design pattern. So basically, uh, you can set this up and then make multiple streams, which is pretty slick. Uh, in this code, we have the A-Audio create stream builder, which gets you a default stream, which is you know, probably a stereo output stream. And here's how you request specific values for direction and for format. And once you set up a stream, you call open stream on the builder. Pretty straightforward. And now if you don't set things like sample rate and format, you'll then have to query them. And finally, you'll get the frames per burst from the audio stream uh, to get the optimal uh, read and write size. OK, now let's stop for a moment, because I know your eyes are all glazing over, and you're like, all right, this is only in the O release. How is this really helpful to me? Um, but we've actually released a library to help, and this is really what I'm excited about. So this is a C++ API. First of all, it's called Oboe, and it works almost identical to A-Audio. And it works on both old and new versions of Android. So on old versions of Android, um, it's going to end up calling into OpenSLES. And this really makes it easier to write high-performance, low-latency audio applications on all Android devices. So here is what A-Audio looks like, and here is what Obo looks like for the exact same code. So as you can see here, uh, once you've used one, it is really easy to use the other. Now in A-Audio and Obo, Builder, a buffer reference refers to an array of these kind of bursts of audio data. And this data is written in these bursts to the DAC. Now, when you look at this diagram, the app has generated two bursts of data, and the first burst will be written. Now, as you might expect, um, you can start and pause or stop your stream all with these synchronous calls. And, and honestly, for most use cases, that is optimal. But we do have a function for synchronizing if needed. And the real question is, how do we get data in and out of these streams? So let's take a very simple use case here. Um, for apps that don't need super low latency, you can use blocking writes like this here in a loop. So basically, the blocking write function returns after either the number of frames is written or an error happens. Now, uh, the blocking write can time out. So we might only get part of the frames written. So we need to make sure we're handling this case. And when you need lower latency, you can actually uh, you need a higher priority thread to do your you know, audio processing, or perhaps even one that's that's handled with that's scheduled with SCED FIFO. And so when you write this callback function, Obo will pass you the stream parameter, any data you need, the audio data buffer, and the number of frames, and then you can render your audio right into the uh, audio buffer on the high priority thread. And you set this callback up in the builder. So the question is, how do you combine multiple streams? You know, uh, such as if you're making, taking two or more uh, input streams and you know, sending them to an output. And we recommend using one st output stream as the master callback. Uh, and, uh, and then you do the callback from the master stream. Now, since the current OBO implementation does not yet support audio input, I've switched back to the A-Audio API here. And in this simple example, we're just passing data from input to output. Uh, we uh, can, can read the input from the input stream with a, with a zero timeout to do a non-blocking read, and that goes right into the output buffer. And it may take a couple of calls for these two streams to synchronize. There we are. That's what I wanted. All right. So again, so you read from the input to the output stream. Finally, uh, let's talk about how you would do dynamic latency tuning. And this is really important when you're doing these very low latency audio applications. So um, looking back at that previous diagram, we have these two bursts ready to be consumed by the DAC. And if we're glitching because of preemption, we may want to add another buff burst to our render. Oh, can you pass me the other clicker? <laughs> um, we can detect overruns or underruns we've had on our output stream by calling uh, get x run count. And if it's changed since the last time you checked, you've got a glitch. So you can just add another burst to your buffer size. So once again, here's a basic Obro, OBO program using a blocking write. Very straightforward. And here's the equivalent code you would need to do that in OpenSLES. And this is only a partial set of code. So we really have simplified what it takes to do to do these kind of professional low latency audio applications. And that's all you have for me. So uh, thank you so much for coming. And you know, again, I'm sorry my voice is a little scratchy.
Oh, does it work? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Meta Tamel. I'm a developer advocate at Google based in London. Namaskara. Nanu Mark, Matu Avanu Meta Swageta. Nice. So today we're going to be talking about. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about fundamentals of Google Cloud Platform. In 30 minutes, it's going to be a fast-paced talk because we're going to have a lot of things to talk about. But hopefully, we'll go through it and you'll you'll learn something new today. Yeah. So, sorry. We'll start with a little bit of history. So, uh, there's a really cool website called the Wayback Machine, and if you Check that out and plug in the Google Cloud Platform or search for Google Pl Cloud Platform from back in those days. You'll see what the actual landing page looked like. Uh, this is it. How many people were using Google Cloud Platform in 2012? OK, so a few, a few diehard folks there. Um, it's, it was very simple back then. There were only four products in the entire platform. So it was pretty easy to, get your, uh, to wrap your head around it and understand what it could do. Uh, nowadays, it's a little bit different. We now have over 80 services, and that list continues to grow every day. Um, in fact, there's so many different capabilities and services that I can't fit all the, all the little product icons on one slide. Um, that's a really good thing. It's nice that we have all these. I mean, it's more than nice. It's really enabling and really powerful. You can build almost anything you can imagine in the cloud nowadays. But it comes at, a, at the cost of a lot of complexity and a lot of kind of cognitive load. Uh, so it takes quite a bit of effort to figure out what all these services are, when to use them, and how to use them effectively in your applications. And that's really uh, the point of this session. We're going to take you through an overview. We're not going to go too deep into anything, but try to give you a taste of all of the, all of the capabilities we have in, in uh, Google Cloud Platform. So to start off, we will cover all the compute options. Yep, thanks, Mark. Uh, so by compute, what I mean is that Let's say you have a piece of code and you want to deploy to Google Cloud. What options do you have? That's what we want to cover here. So at the very high level, when we talk about compute, um, there are three distinct ways of running your code. And this is not just Google Cloud, but basically in any cloud, you have these options. Um, so back in the day, when, before cloud, um, when you want to deploy your application, you would get a machine. Um, you would decide how much CPU you want. You would decide how much memory you want. Um, you would get a hard drive uh, and decide how big that should be. Then you would install the operating system. And after that, you will install the libraries that you need on top of the operating system. And then finally, you would get to install your application. So with virtual machines, it's pretty much the similar thing, uh, except it's virtualized. It's not a physical machine anymore. And you probably don't have it uh, yourself. You have it in someone else's data center. So in virtual machines, it's the same I idea. You pick your CPU, your memory, your, your storage, and then, then install your operating system. And then it's yours. It's your responsibility to maintain it and to run it. Now, more recently, we have something called containers. So the idea of containers is that instead of virtualizing the operating system and all the way up to, to, to your application, you want to virtualize your application and its dependencies, so the libraries that you need. Um, and since you're not virtualizing the whole operating system, these containers are really small, so they are really easy to create, they are really easy to run, and they are re really easy to move around. So you would use Docker push and pull to move these uh, images around and deploy them really easily. And then lastly, serverless. So in serverless, um, you don't really care about virtual machines. You don't really care about containers. You have a piece of functionality or, 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 an, or an application, and you just want to deploy it and let someone else manage it for you. So it becomes someone else's problem, basically, how to deploy that application and how to manage it. But as a user, you're basically focusing on your code and just deploy your code and let someone else manage that for you. Now, um, and then one thing to mention is that um, most people, um, they started with virtual machines. Now they are switching to containers because it makes sense, and they're much more agile than virtual machines. And they are going towards serverless. But most people nowadays, they're kind of in the container world. But containers by themselves, they're not enough. Um, because containers, they give you a, a context to run your application in a consistent way everywhere. But when you run your application, you need more than containers. You need resiliency, for example. So you probably need health checks. You need redundancy, so you probably need to run multiple containers. Uh, you need configuration, so you need to, a way to define your configuration and get that configuration to your application. Um, so because of all these things that you need to do in production, there are um, open source projects like Kubernetes, which try to uh, run your containers in production and make it easy for you. 
Um, and even containers by itself is not enough nowadays because Kubernetes basically makes you run your containers in production and, and watches your containers, make sure they run. But then you need more than that. When you write a microservice, for example, you need like service-to-service -service authentication. You need a way to visualize your services, so you need some kind of dashboards. So you need logging. So there's all these extra things that you still need to do on top of Kubernetes. So that's why we have something called Istio. It's another open source project uh, that tries to create this service mesh so that you don't have to create uh, everything from scratch. It gives you this logging and monitoring and service-to-service -service authentication and all that good stuff. Now, in terms of what options you have on Google Cloud to deploy these, um, first, you need to decide how much management you want and how much uh, customization you want. And by definition, the more customizable things are, they end up being less managed. And the more managed they are, they end up being less customizable. So on the highly customizable side, we have Compute Engine. Compute Engine is what we call virtual machines in Google Cloud. You can get a Linux machine, or you can get a Windows machine, and we support multiple versions of Linux and multiple versions of uh, Windows. And once you have the machine with the operating system, you can pretty much install whatever you want on that machine. It's your machine to maintain. It's your machine to keep up to date and all that kind of stuff. Um, of course, installing all this software on your own computer engine instances, it takes a, a while. So we have something called Cloud Launcher. It's a marketplace for solutions to deploy to Compute Engine. So if you want to deploy, for example, LAMP stack, or if you want to deploy WordPress, uh, there are solutions for that. So you can just find the solution, and with one click, just deploy that solution to Compute Engine. So let me quickly show you how this works. So here I am in uh, Google Cloud Console. Um, this is where all the Google Cloud products are. Um, and we are interested in Compute Engine. So when you go to Compute Engine page, there is VM. So here you can see all the VMs, virtual machines that you have. If you want to create a new instance, you just hit Create Instance. And then you can give your instance a name. So I, we will call this, let me make this a little bit bigger. We will call this Instance uh, India. And then you can choose where to deploy your instance. Uh, since we're in Asia, let's choose somewhere in Asia. Um, you can customize your machine type. So you can basically choose well, how many cores you want from 1 to 64. You can also choose your memory. Um, on top of this, we also have pre-configured uh, uh, mas machine types. So you can choose a micro instance or small instance. So I'll just pick one of these. Um, next, you want to choose your operating system. So we have all the. Um, Flavors are Linux and Windows as well. So these are the Linux instances. Um, we have Windows instances. I'll just choose a Linux one. You can also install applications. For example, if you want to have a SQL Server instance, there's an application image for that. You can even create your own images. So you can create your own um, image and then deploy it here. And then you can use it in your own project. So for this one, I'm just going to use a Linux instance. And I'm going to also allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic and hit Create. And this will give me a Linux instance running in the cloud. And then once it's up and running, which will be like 30 seconds or so, you can easily SSH into it. So there's on, on here, there's SSH. And if it's a Windows instance, you can RDP into that by just clicking here. And you, you can just directly go right in there. Um, and I also mentioned uh, Cloud Launcher. So if we go here, um, there's something called Cloud Launcher. It has a bunch of different solutions that you can install, such as LAMP stack, WordPress. Um, I can, for example, search for ASP.NET. This is a solution for deploying. Uh, Windows Server, ASP.NET Framework, IIS, and SQL Express. So here I'll just do launch on Compute Engine, give it a name, ASP.NET, um, let's say India, and then, oh, let's say India 2, because I already have one. Um, and this time let's choose Australia and just keep the defaults, hit deploy. So with, with this one click, I can get a Windows Server, IIS, SQL Express, and ASP.NET Framework, and I can just deploy my ASP.NET applications to Google Cloud. All right, so that's Compute Engine. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, in the highly managed part, we have Cloud Functions. And the idea of Cloud Functions is that you define a Node.js function uh, with inputs and outputs. And you also define how that function should be triggered. Um, so the trigger can be an HTTP request, or it can be a pop up message. So when a message goes to a topic, then that triggers the function uh, for you. And then that's it. You just deploy the function, and, and Google maintains it for you. Um, and you don't really care where it's running, how it's running. You just specify where your function should live in what zone, and that's it. Uh, so just show you an example of this as well. So if you go back here under, under compute, we have cloud functions. And in the first page, you can see all the functions that you have deployed. So I have a function called hello world. Once you click here, you will see the um, function invocations. So how many, how many times people um, call your function. You can see what kind of trigger it has. So this is a pops up topic function. 
you can see the source of the function, and it's a re really simple function that takes an event and just logs out the event's message. And you can even test it right here. So you can trigger the event and say, let's pass a message and say, hello, India. And then if you hit test function, now this is running in the cloud, it already run, and you'll, it will fetch the logs, and you'll see the console log out once you get the logs here, okay? So that's functions. Um, functions are really great, and they're a really easy way of uh, running your code in the cloud in a way that you, you know, it's like completely, like the, the infrastructure is completely transparent to you. But sometimes you need more than a function. You need an application. So for that, we have App Engine. In App Engine, it's, this, it's similar to cloud functions in the sense that you deploy your application, and you don't really care where that application is running. But it's more than a function. So you can have uh, multiple services in App, in App Engine. You can have a front end, and you, and you can have a back end. And you can just deploy the whole thing uh, together, and App Engine just manages that for you. Uh, so let me show you that quickly as well. So in, in console, again, it's the same place. We go here, App Engine. The first thing that you realize is that there's a dashboard. Um, so you have multiple versions of your application, and this version is getting 51% of the traffic. This is getting 49%. And then you can see um, the graphs for latency, traffic, CPU utilization, stuff like that. Um, the services are the microservices that you can deploy in App Engine. In this case, I'm just having a one default service. And then under versions, you can see the different versions that you have. So I have two versions running on two instances. So these are running on two VMs. And this is auto-scaled by default, so it will auto-scale from 2 to 20 automatically, so you don't have to do anything special for that. Uh, if you want to change the traffic allocation so that, uh, let's say, your new version gets all the traffic, I can easily change this to 100%, hit Save, and this will uh, drag all the traffic now to the new version. So that, that's App Engine. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, Kubernetes Engine. So Kubernetes Engine is basically a way to run containers in the cloud. Kubernetes is an open source project, and it, you can, it can run anywhere. But we try to make it really easy to run in Google Cloud. So that's what Kubernetes Engine is. So we maintain the master for you, and we also give you an easy way to create your cluster and, and, and schedule your containers. So it sits between serverless world and the virtual machine world. So if you want to be somewhere in the middle where you have containers, you can use Kubernetes Engine to do that. Um, and then we have tools. Uh, we have Container Builder and Container Registry for containers. So you can create containers in the cloud using Container Builder. It's a really fast way of building containers. Uh, and once the containers are built, they are saved into a place called Container Registry. This is a private space for your containers. Um, and once your container is saved there, you can deploy it to Kubernetes, or you can deploy it to App Engine really easily. So that's how you um, run your code in the cloud. And one thing that I want to point out, when you're running your service in the cloud, you're running in the same network that powers all these products. So the same network that powers Google, Google Search, Gmail, Map, serving 1 billion users each, you're running in the same network as well. And so all the improvements and optimizations we do in our network for our own services, they benefit you indirectly because of that. And this is how our network looks like. You can see all the edge endpoints, and you can see all the cables all around the world. So it's a, it's a truly global, um, highly optimized fiber network all around the world. OK, so that's how you run your code. Now let's take a look at how you store your data. Thanks, Meta. So at a high level, storage is, is, is easy. You write some bits, and you read the bits, and hopefully you get the same thing out that you put in. Uh, I have the feeling that some of the folks here are looking at my graphic and wondering what these things are. Um, it's a young crowd. Um, but actually, it's pretty complicated stuff. So anybody that implements a real-world storage system knows about this. There's all kinds of uh, consistency issues, ACID, uh, semantics, uh, scaling issues, replications, uh, all sorts of uh, really fundamental computer science challenges crop up in building complex storage systems. And there's a lot of different ways to store data, right? So this is kind of a very high-level summary of all the different products and what they're good for. And I'm not going to, it's a bit of an eye chart, not going to walk through every, every uh, product one at a time. But uh, I will kind of break it down into some categories. But when I look at this, I kind of have the same reaction I had with the 80, 80 icons slide. It's like, I just want to store some bytes. Why do I have to learn all this stuff? And I'm going to go through a few different subcategories to hopefully uh, help clarify this. So the first category I like to think about is structured data. And the mental model for this is a spreadsheet. So this is where you have your data's got a well-defined uh, sort of set of fields. 
and the rows in the spreadsheet correspond to the instances of your data, and the columns correspond to the fields in your schema. So this is a pretty familiar way to go, and you know, this is the classic relational database system, um, and it's driven most frequently by a very standardized query system called SQL. And we have two different products in this domain. We have Cloud SQL, which gives you the ability to create managed database servers in the cloud. So you're still thinking about servers, and you have to decide if you want MySQL or Postgres, but the backup of the database, the administration of it, the, SR, the uh, maintenance keeping it up, and just managing those servers is taken care of for you. So it takes a lot of the hassle out of your hands. And then Spanner is kind of a level of, abs of abstraction above that. It gives you a true database as a service capability where it's global, has all of the acid semantics you would expect from a relational database management system. And it's uh, you know, multi-region, very scalable, and has really a tremendous uh, set of value for, for uh, a database service. The next category is unstructured data. This is also called NoSQL. So the mental model I have for this one is it's a little bit like a library. You're storing data in a library, or books in a library, I should say. Um, so there's a, a very efficient index that you can use to find any book on any shelf. But the contents is totally unregulated, right? The librarian doesn't care what's in any particular book. And there's no uniformity. All the books have different content. And so it's kind of a little bit like what a NoSQL database is like. There's a key that gets you to the, the value you care about, but the content or structure of that value is, is up to you. And we have data store, uh, which is a hierarchical distributed key value store. Firestore, which is ideal for, for mobile applications and real-time response type scenarios. And Bigtable, which is really well suited for huge volume uh, transactional, financial transactions, IoT, uh, event sources, things like that. And uh, all of these are, again, managed services in the cloud. You don't have to think about where are the nodes, how many do I need, how do I configure them and install software. Just make your database calls and all, everything else is taken care of for you. And the last category I want to talk about is an object store. So the idea here is it's a lot like uh, renting a storage unit at one of these places where you, where you do that, where you look, rent a locker or something like that. And you know, there's a physical space there where you can put your stuff, and it doesn't matter what you put in there. It's up to you. And that's kind of what these object stores are like. You have a, you'll have a bucket, and you own that bucket. You can put as many objects in it as you want. There's no rules about the content that goes into them. Um, and you have security protections on it, which is kind of like your key to the locker. And you can serve those objects from the cloud. You can even serve websites directly from these storage buckets. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of the different storage products we have. There's a lot more to it, but I did want to jump into uh, Spanner again and just highlight it, because I think it's really interesting and really uh, revolutionary in many ways. What Spanner does is it, it kind of bridges the gap between traditional relational database systems, which are very strong in terms of data integrity and consistency, but have always been a challenge in terms of horizontal scalability. Right? A lot of people have had to do sharding and lots of elaborate techniques to scale up these systems. And then on the other hand, you have the, the non-relational systems, the NoSQL systems, which are great with horizontal scaling, but they're often not giving strong consistency or as much uh, acid semantics as the relational database families. And what Spanner does is it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. So I'm just going to quickly jump into a little demo on Spanner. Let's see. Don't see it. There we go. OK, so I've got an instance of Spanner. You can think of an instance as a collection of databases. I've got one here that I've called GDD India. And inside that instance is a database called University. So I've kind of fabricated a typical database for university consisting of three tables. I can drill down into these tables. A uh, professor has uh, a collection of professors with a professor ID and a name and so on. 
And basically, you're looking at something that looks very much and feels very much like a traditional relational database management system. But I have no concept of where the software is running or keeping it administered or anything. It's all taken care of for me. I can also manage the schema directly here. So let's imagine that the student table needs another field. Let's decide to add a, right now I have a name, a major, and a student ID. Let's add a GPA. So we'll say GPA, and we'll give it a float type. Say done and save. And Spanner will basically tell me that it's going to eventually the old schema will continue being served until the update completes. And so it's going to now update my database in real time. But the nice thing is it's never going to take the, the service down. I can continue to serve tremendously high volumes of requests while it's updating my database in the background, which is really convenient. The other nice thing is let's suppose that I just, I'm, I'm wildly successful with my database and the traffic far exceeds the capacity. I can simply drill down into my instance. I can click Edit Instance. And there's a place here called Node, a field here called Node. I can change that from 1 to 3 and click Save. I'm going to pay for more capacity if I use it, obviously. But I've just tripled the capacity of my database. I didn't have to talk about machines, where they might live, what I might do with them. I just said triple my capacity. And the database is now going to be able to serve three times the amount of requests. And that's it for Spanner. Next up, we'll cover big data. Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, so once you give people a way to store data, they're going to store a lot of data, and then the data gets really big. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with big data? That's what we want to cover here. Um, so big data processing at Google started with MapReduce. Who heard of MapReduce and you, or use MapReduce? OK, so people know. It's a, it was a paper in 2004 that came out. Uh, you can read it. It's a really nice paper to read. And, after, and in MapReduce, we basically explained um, how to take lots of data, divide that into small chunks, and then send them to the, uh, multiple parallel machines, and then process those, uh, that data on those machines, and then combine the results in the end to get the result. So after MapReduce, there was a lot of innovation at Google. So we had things like Bigtable, and then we had Millwheel for stream processing. We had Flume Java for high-level pipeline modeling. And we had Spanner that uh, Mike just talked about. And most of these, they were either papers or they were internal implementations at Google. So it wasn't available to outside world. Um, we recently, of course, started like, making these available to people via Google Cloud. So PubSub and Spanner, there are enough services in Google Cloud that you can use. Um, but at, at, back in the day, they weren't available to people. So people at Apache, they seen that, and they read these papers, and they started creating open source projects. So they created Hadoop, which is an open source, um, uh, open source um, implementation of MapReduce. Uh, they created Spark and Hive and all these open source projects. But because the innovation was split into two, we have two products in Google Cloud to support both. So all the innovation at Google ended up with something called Cloud Dataflow. It's a model and also a service, a fully managed service, to do batch and stream processing. And if you are already doing Hadoop and Spark in the open source, you can bring those clusters to Google Cloud. So there's a product called Cloud Dataproc, where you can get a cluster in 90 seconds and then and just run your Hadoop and uh, Spark classes in Google Cloud. And when you are dealing with big data, there's a life cycle that you need to go through. So Mark will explain us what that life cycle is. Thanks. Yeah, so the typical life cycle involves five steps. Uh, first off, you need to capture some data. And there's a lot of products available to do that. The one I'm going to highlight today is Cloud PubSub, which is a mes message queue. You can have multiple providers and multiple subscribers. Um, and so it, we can motivate this a little bit with a real-world example. Imagine that we have a, a very popular website like Wikipedia, and we want to capture all of the events from people viewing pages on Wikipedia. We could stream those events into PubSub, and then we could have those events routed into our data processing phase. Now, the data processing might involve something like data prep, which is a kind of data cleansing, rearranging, normalizing service. And then from there, it might be fed into Cloud Dataflow, perhaps. Now, Cloud Dataflow is just, as Meta was speaking about earlier, is a, a processing stage very much based on MapReduce. It can perform uh, mass bulk processing on batches at a time, or it can process streams as they're arriving, which is great for IoT and transaction-based things. 
From there, once we've processed the data, we might want to store the intermediate results so we can analyze it without having to continually uh, reprocess it. There are lots of places we can store it, as we just saw. Um, one of the key ones, if we're doing analytics, might be BigQuery. So BigQuery gives us this columnar database that enables very fast SQL-based storage of the data we've stored. So from there, we can use tools to analyze the data. There are lots of different tools, but the one I'll show you uh, in a moment is BigQuery. We've got it in the database, and then we'll do some, some queries on this. And finally, we might want to do something with these analytics we've done. We've done our, an our interactive analysis, and we might want to have a nice way to share it with other folks, coworkers, the rest of the world. And that's where uh, Data Studio comes in. That's a, a service for building dashboards, nice visualizations. And uh, Data Lab, which is a hosted in the cloud Jupyter Notebook service. So for people that like interactive notebooks, it's particularly popular in the uh, data science world. Uh, data Lab is something that you might want to take a look at. So here's what BigQuery looks like. And what I'm doing is I'm running a query on a data set that actually corresponds to the example I just talked about. So I have all of the data for page views on Wikipedia from May of 2016. And I'm going to run a very simple, can people see this? I'm going to run a very simple query that's just going to sum the requests. And we can just wait while it does that. And it tells us, hopefully soon, it took 5.2 seconds. It tells us how much data was actually processed. So it was 38.6, almost 40 gigabytes worth of data. It just did a scan in five seconds. And it told us the number of events, as you can see here. I think this is 19 billion. So almost 20 billion rows it scanned in that amount of time. Now, we'll make it just a little bit more complicated. I'll do a query here for all the articles that reference Bangalore. So I'll pull this up here. Now, it's a little bit tricky. I could just match Bangalore, but in English, there are two spellings, Bangalore and Bangaluru. And so um, the way I'd like to find both of those is to do a regular expression. So uh, here I'm matching Bengal and then or or Uru. And sorry, that's right here. And what this is going to do is actually run a regular expression match on 20 billion rows in a database. And you saw it did that in seven and a half seconds. And by the way, this no cache results up here is an option you can specify. Normally, I would turn that off because if I run the same query again, I want to see the cache for speed reasons. But I have that disabled because I want it to be a more true test. But as you can see, it did not only a table scan, but a regular expression of uh, 20 on 20 billion rows in 7.5 five seconds. So that's the power of BigQuery. And lastly, let's talk about machine learning, uh, because everyone wants to hear about machine learning. Uh, if you look at this chart, this basically shows the, the amount of deep learning models at Google uh, with different products. So you can see the exponential growth of machine learning at Google. And this is true not just for Google, but for pretty much all, all companies. So when, when it comes to machine learning, there are two distinct ways of using machine learning. Um, the easy way is to, to let someone learn machine learning and, and train a model for um, using machine learning, and then you just consume that machine learning using an API. So that's the easy way. Um, but sometimes the trained model is not enough for you because you know, maybe the, the trained model is not exactly what you want. So in, in, that you, in that case, you need to actually build your own machine learning. So you need to create your model. You need to train it uh, in parallel, uh, and you also want to serve that model. So that's the second way of using machine learning. Um, so at Google, in terms of using the models, we have a number of APIs. So there's speech API for speech to te text recognition. There's vision API for image recognition. And there's more and more that we keep adding. Uh, so this is the way that you can consume machine learning. And we are just basically exposing the model that we created over the years to you with a simple API. So let me just quickly show you the vision API. So in vision API, um, I have a demo here. You can pass in an image and it tells you everything it can about that image. So in this case, we have a cat image, because in any machine learning demo, you have to show a cat. That's the rule. Uh, so what you get is that uh, you, you basically get a JSON back. It kind of looks like this. 
but in a graphical way, you can basically see that uh, the machine learning, uh, the Vision API is telling us that this is a cat, 99%. It's a mammal, 97%. It, and it's even, even telling us that it's a British short hair cat, 96%. And it can pick up the color, and it can tell us whether this image is an adult image or spoof image, stuff like that. Um, if we have an image with text, like this one, it can pick the text from the image. So this is a traffic sign. So the Vision API is already telling us that it's a traffic sign. And then from here, it can pick up the text, and it can tell us where it is uh, in the image the text is. And I'll show you one more with people. So when we have people in the picture, Vision API, it doesn't detect people, but it detects people's expressions. So in, in this case, for example, it's telling us that it's a social group with some folk dance, which is right. But then uh, if I turn this on, if I go here and turn this on, we can see people faces, and then we can see that person too, I guess this person is, is joyful, which is nice. So that's Vision API. And Lastly, uh, we want to talk about building your own machine learning models because you cannot always consume machine learning models as it is. So to build them, there's something called TensorFlow, and Mike can tell us more about that. Yeah, so TensorFlow is really the technology underlying a lot of the machine learning algorithms at Google. Uh, it's an open source project that was created by the Google Brain team, was released about two years ago, and it's become one of the most popular open source uh, machine learning li libraries on GitHub. Um, it's really powerful. You can build your models locally, upload them to the cloud. You can use them to deploy models on mobile devices. Um, so, and it's also got great support for GPUs and other types of hardware assist. So very powerful. There's a link here. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get the slides to you through the, through the uh, organization here. But there's a, a link to a really nice article by one of our colleagues that gives a, a great overview of, of uh, TensorFlow. Um, this graphic just shows very quickly how much TensorFlow has taken off. There are a lot of tools out there, and uh, it's good to know a few of these, I think. But um, TensorFlow seems like a really good one to invest in because it's gotten so much support so quickly. Uh, the product that we're using to kind of make this stuff more approachable and more accessible is Google Cloud Machine Learning Engine. And the idea here is that just like in the case with compute, where you don't really necessarily want to care about all the details of the underlying infrastructure. You just want to write your code and think about your application. The same kind of thinking applies in machine learning. You want to think about your model, training it, debugging it, testing it, making sure it's ready for production. You don't want to really be burdened with running machines and parallel processing and all the kind of lower level stuff that, that uh, Google's very good at and has lots of people doing all the time. So this gives you that kind of abstraction layer. You can specify um, kind of a meta definition of your model uh, using YAML. And then you can use the gcloud command to upload your model into the cloud for training. You can monitor the progress through the same tool we use to monitor our other applications, stack driver logging. Uh, and then you end up with trained models that you can operate on almost like applications, as Meta showed earlier in App Engine. You can test those models with independently through different URLs, and you can change the settings for which one you want to serve by default and so on. So again, it's really taking you away from thinking about machines and implementation details to just operating on your model as an abstraction of its own. The other really powerful thing is you're going to get access to the Tensor Processing Unit, which is custom ASIC hardware that Google has developed for its own internal use. The initial version was used internally only for uh, on the order of a year and a half. And uh, it was very powerful, but it was only for training models. And the new version, which is becoming more available publicly, is much faster. And it's also available for both speeding up training and serving of machine learning models. So that's all we have. Um, I want to leave you with some resources. The, the main site for all information about uh, Google Cloud is cloud.google.com. The console we've been using is console.google.cloud. Uh, sorry, console.cloud.google.com. I'm a great lover of Code Labs, interactive training tools and tutorials. And if you go to g.co slash Code Labs, you can find all the Code Labs we've ever published. There's something like on the order of 400 of them. And there's a Code Labs area across the way that many of you probably have, have already seen. Uh, you can get the cloud specific Code Labs with g.co slash Code Labs slash cloud. And then finally, there's a training page there for um, finding out more about our formal training programs. Um, one important thing I wanted to tell you about is the free tier. 
If you go to cloud.google.com slash free, you can get $300 worth of cloud credits usable across the period of one year. This is a great way to get started without having to commit any money up front. And uh, I think we both believe that the best way to learn about this technology is to actually build something with it. So I'd encourage all of you, if you're not already working with it, try it out. Use the free tier. Try building some applications and see what your experience is like. And we always love to hear, good or bad, what you're, what you're finding. So let us know. Um, we will be over in the uh, cloud office, office hours. hours area after this talk. That's all we had. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So if you work in software development and you don't exercise your design skills, just practice, just do it. Do it even though you know that it's bad. If you want to improve the quality of your site but don't know where to start, the new audits panel is a great place to get some inspiration. This is a quick web series about solving web problems with standards. Let's go. I'll be right here to tell you what's new in Chrome. That's a uh... Webpack performance. One day I'll get around to learning it. You could just watch this video. Knowing what is and what is not visible can be very useful information. I can change these properties in DevTools to find the ideal value for my layout. It's Rob Dotson. Welcome back to the Alley Cash Show. I want to show you what just landed in Chrome DevTools version 60. So follow me over here to the laptop. If you want the latest news and ideas in web development, subscribe to the Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel. I couldn't be happier to be here to see the launch of the Android Skilling Program. There's going to be so many new, great Android developers here in India. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Some of you know I'm from Delhi. Always fun coming back and, and meeting all of you. We can scale up developers and scale up mobile developer training to help make India a global leader in mobile app development. Having the universities teamed up with us in the skilling program is going to be a huge opportunity and make a huge difference. Finally, we've launched it. It's been a year since we first introduced this program to million developers. I think that it's a really achievable goal, and I, I think that it would do a lot for improving uh, the environment in the country in terms of hands-on programming. So I think it's great. It's a massive number. The possibilities are immense. India will be the largest developer base globally, and just to get every want to start thinking about Android and developing for Android. We're at the cusp of a revolution. Let's do something big. More games, more users, more success. Yes. Everything more. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashish Marina. I work in the search outreach team at Google, and I'm based out of Hyderabad. First of all, thank you for coming to this session on internationalization and structured data for search. So uh, before I begin, I just want to ask, how many of you run websites with structured data? Mark up. OK, a fair few. Cool. All right, in this session, we'll be looking at the basics of structured data, what structured data is, how you can use how Google uses structured data, and also what features are powered by structured data. Following that, we'll also be looking at schema.org and some transport, transport layers that Google supports. Following that, we'll also look at some resources. Google provides websites, uh, website owners so that they can debug any structured data issues they may have. And finally, we'll also look at some best practices for websites which have multiple languages. All right. So I'm sure many of you are aware that Google Search has been constantly evolving to provide a great user experience for all our users. Right? Since 1998, we've moved from Blue Links to now we have many different features like knowledge panel, live scores, election results. But even today, without structured information from webmasters and content providers, we are still limited by what we can do. Many of our search features depend upon website owners adding structured data and providing that to Google. So only with structured information, Google can provide our users with accurate and attractive information. So in this context, structured data is nothing but the standard format in which you provide us, you provide us or any other search engines your information. So as an example, on the left screenshot, without structured data, the user or the webmaster is telling Google that, uh, or writing about the movie Godfather and relevant information about that movie. But by adding markup, Google understands that they are talking about a movie and that the name of the movie is The Godfather and that the director of the movie is Francis Ford Coppola. Similarly, in the other example screenshot, we are able to tell that the webmaster is talking about a recipe because he's marked up that this is a recipe and he's given relevant information about that particular recipe. OK, so we understand the markup, but how does Google use it? Well, let's assume in an ideal world, everybody uses the same standard markup, and you mark up all of your data, and Google's magical algorithm somehow figure out all that information and provide like a great experience to all our users. But we're still not there yet. Currently, the best user experience that Google can provide to all our users is by the vertical by vertical usage of structured data that you provide us. So we are currently able to provide very rich and faceted experiences for only particular verticals based on the user, based on structured data that you provide us. We use that structured data in both visual and navigational manners. So I'll just explain with using some examples. So in here, we have three different search features. On the left screenshot, we have a rich card for banana bread recipes. So there, because the webmaster has marked up uh, using structured data, we're able to provide a very good image of what the banana bread will look like once, he's eat, once they've made it. And we're also able to tell our users that it takes one hour 20 minutes to make it, and also it, you consume 229 calories if you eat one banana bread. In the middle screenshot, it's about a new feature that's been launched earlier this year called Google for Jobs. So this has been launched only in the US, and we are working hard to provide this feature in other locations too. But in this feature, we are able to provide a very good navigational experience for our users. This is purely because for each job listing, website owners are marking up the type of job, the where it's located, and even the pin code. So we're able to help users under, uh, search for the exact jobs in their particular location. For example, in this, someone's searching for jobs near Boston, Massachusetts. And he can further filter that search by saying he wants to look for jobs just in sales and retail. And finally, we also have another example of search features which use structured data, which is the rich snippets. This is the first search feature that we've launched using structured data. 
here we're able, because you've marked up that content, we're able to tell that this particular, the movie Godfather uh, under rogerebert.com is, it has a full five by five rating. Okay, so we've seen what markup is. We've also seen how Google uses it. But how do you send this markup to Google? Well, there are three common transport layers that Google currently supports. They're JSON LD, Microdata, and XHTML plus RDFA. Currently, Google recommends JSON LD, but if, even if you use Microdata or RDFA, it's still fine. Uh, these are just syntaxes that you use to encode your data. So why JSON-LD? Well, JSON-LD, as you all know, is a JavaScript notation that you can embed into your HTML using a script, or you can also send it directly as a feed. The thing is, unlike, uh, unlike XHTML and microdata, which are interleaved with the visible text on your page, JSON-LD can let you express your data far more freely. Unlike your content on the layout of your page, it seems very simple but it's far more complex than how it's on the layout of your page. For example, if you want to mark up your nested, uh, nested items, you can tell that you can give the movie name of an, uh, of an event in a particular location. That's very, very easy to do with JSON-LD, but it's hard to do with microdata and uh, RDFA. So apart from JSON-LD, we also have this vocabulary that's standard across all different search engines, which is the schema.org vocabulary. Google and all other major search engines support schema.org vocabulary. And you can use this if you, you don't need to worry about optimizing for all different search engines if you use the schema.org vocabulary. So we recommend using schema.org. But just in case, if you use data vocabulary or microformats, that is also supported. But Right now, this is the most commonly used vocabulary. Uh, you can visit the schema.org website to take a look at all the different data types and the relationship, relationships between different uh, data items. OK, so apart from schema, Google also has its own guidelines. Uh, it's available under developers.google.com. So, we have two types of guidelines, technical guidelines and quality guidelines. Why we have these guidelines is because even though you've marked up your content using schema, sometimes Google still faces trouble getting to your content. For example, some of the common technical guidelines is to make sure all your content is accessible by Google. Everything that you've marked up, Google can access it. One common example of why this guideline was made was because We've seen cases where webmasters use JSON-LD and uh, the script, the JavaScript, and all of that uh, other files are in different folders which Google cannot access. But Google can access just the visible content of a particular page, but the script itself is in a different folder, and Google's robots, uh, the robots file blocks Google from accessing that content. So in that case, we will not be able to see your markup. So let's say you've made a great recipe site and you've marked up everything and you've got a lot of good ratings. But if Google cannot see that markup, your search snippet will not show those ratings. So I'll, similar to this guideline, there are a lot of other technical guidelines that you can take a look at in uh, Google's developer page. We also have quality guidelines. So quality guidelines are generally there to prevent abuse of, search, uh, of our search results. For example, there are many cases where the user doesn't see the markup but Google sees it. Uh, you can have a recipe website where uh, you mark it as 5x5, five five and only Google sees it, but user doesn't see it. So when they look at the search result, because Google sees your markup, we'll show that, OK, this particular recipe has a 5 out of 5 rating. But when the user goes to your page, he doesn't see that uh, rating, and he feels duped. So which is why we have quality guidelines to make sure the, uh, the users are seeing the same content as what Google is seeing. We also have other guidelines uh, specifically to make sure uh, other data types like events are not uh, abused, because we've seen many cases where 
people use the event schema to sell their coupons or something at 20% off. So one of the major ways we actually made inroads into making structured data easier for everybody to consume and everybody to implement very easily is by having a lot of middleware layers, a lot of CMSs and CMS plugins and platforms, having them support structured data. That made it very useful or very easy for a lot of content providers to create uh, or add markup. In fact, many people who write the content, they have structured data, they have rich snippets, all their features are shown in search very uh, visually appealing, in a visu very visually appealing manner, but they have never touched a single line of code. It's purely possible because there's a lot of plugins for different CMSs and many platforms like LinkedIn provide markup, markup is embedded in the platform, so they don't need to touch a single line of code. So for, from Google's perspective, we've also made a tool called Data Highlighter. This is a tool where you don't need to, if you are unable to access your code, you can simply go to your page and you can use a, you can use a tagging tool to highlight certain parts of your data and you can tell Google what it is. You can even test it out now. It's, this Data Highlighter tool is available in, in your Search Console account. You can simply, uh, one caveat is your pages need to be indexed before uh, you try out this data highlighter tool. So just make sure your pages are indexed and then you can try and highlight certain parts of the page and you can see if Google is recognizing it. Okay, so you've marked up your content but now you want to test it out. How do you debug if your structured data is valid or not? Well, the best tool right now we have is the structured data testing tool. In this tool, either the URL for the web page that you want to add, or the specific code snippet which contains the markup, you can add any of these in the tool, and the tool will try and validate your markup. Once you put the URL or the code snippet in here, we're able to pull up all the item types of different data that we find, and we can also show the different warnings and errors that we see on your website. This is based on our own validation that we do in search indexing. So whenever we index a page and we look for structured data, we also use the same validation for, that we show in this particular tool. So if your code is valid in here, that means at least on a technical level, there's no problem, like your structured data is good to go. Uh, as for the different warnings and errors, there's generally two types of uh, errors that you'll notice. One type of error is when your code is not at all compatible with uh, schema.org or uh, vocabulary or uh, there's a syntax issue. The other type of error is when your code is not compatible with Google search features. For example, you've seen the jobs feature I've showed you, right? So in the jobs feature, it's a requirement to add the address. So let's say you're listing a job for, I don't know, accountant in Bangalore, but if you don't provide the exact address where he's going to work at, we are not going to validate that code, and that will not be shown in our search, uh, rich, in the Google for Jobs rich snippets. Apart from the, apart from the structured data testing tool, we also have a structured data feature in Search Console, so this feature aggregates all of your structured data information that we found across a certain period of, period of time. And we're able to show all the different data types that we found on your website and all the different errors that we noticed on your website. OK, I, that's, that's all I have for structured data. But before I move on to internationalization, I'd urge you to visit the developer's page for structured data and go through the technical guidelines, specifically because even though schema.org has a number of really, really good data types, Google only supports certain amount of those. So in our developers page, we list, give a list of all the different search features we have and what all data types we provide. So for example, if you use a data type in schema and it's not supported by Google, at least at this moment, it's not very useful in search for that particular feature. All right. Uh, OK, how many of you run websites which have multiple languages? And do you have the same content written in multiple languages, or 
uh, just you have a website for English and you have a website for Hindi. Okay, uh, I didn't understand, but I'm assuming you have the same content in different languages. So I think you already heard a billion times by now about the next billion users and how most of them, at least from India, are looking for local language content. So many of the big websites and even smaller websites are trying to create content alternatively in Hindi too and other Indian local languages. So we have a lot of people creating their, uh, from their old English pages, they're translating that content into Hindi and they're making another website with the same exact content but in different languages. So internationalization in this context is making sure you letting Google know that all these different versions of your website, the English version, the Hindi version, the Kannada version, all these are the same and you're letting Google know that these three are the same content but these are from different languages. So whenever someone from a Hindi state is searching for my content, show him the Hindi page. But if, you, if you're already doing it, I'm sure you know how hard it is to maintain websites with multiple languages. It's very, very hard because many people employ different methods to show their content to their, to their users. But because it's very hard, we've compiled a list of best practices so that at least it gives us a head start for you guys to make these uh, multilingual websites. All right. Let's assume you have a website which has, uh, which you're writing about Bangalore, you know, some place in Bangalore, and you have it in English. If you have the same version in Hindi and Kannada, the best way you can let Google know that the Hindi version and the Kannada version are the same version, are the same content as the English version, but in a different language. The best way you can let Google know that is by using the hreflang tag. Uh, in fact, you can use the hreflang tag in multiple different ways. So for HTML documents, you can simply uh, add a link in the head section of your page saying rel alternate hreflang and then the language code. For non-HTML documents like PDFs, you can simply send a header response with the hreflang tag. And you can also use your sitemap. If you have a website with thousands of pages, you can use a sitemap to make it easier for you to add the hreflang tag and let Google know that you have, okay, these thousand pages are English and the exact uh, versions of this page in Hindi are these versions. Here's an example code. So for the first one, you're basically set, telling Google that in.example.com slash page is the English Indian version of that particular page. So this page has probably has content in maybe INR. So you're, let's say you're selling a shoe and this page has content in INR. And then you have another page, us.example.com, which you, you tag it as hreflang enus. This page, you probably have USD, so you're targeting it, targeting it towards US customers. And finally, you have a default page for everyone, every other person from you know, all other parts of the world. So some common mistakes that we notice when people implement hreflang is they add this code in only one page, but the, so, for example, all these three uh, alternate tags are added only in the in.example.com slash page, but you don't find these tags in the US page or the default page. So, if, we, if Google doesn't see the back tags, it will assume that we, it will not be able to consolidate all the signals and will not be able to understand that all three pages are the same, uh, same content in different languages. Another mistake is people sometimes misuse uh, or incorrectly uh, add a wrong uh, language code. So you're supposed to use ISO codes. So please keep that in mind. And uh, so this was a recommendation that we did previously. We used to ask for people to add rel canonical tags in these pages. But uh, right now it's easier for us, to, for, for us to make sure you don't add rel canonical tags because many people are doing it in a wrong manner. So we stopped giving the recommendation of adding rel canonical tags. All right, so you've seen the previous example where we had a different URL for the English Indian customers, you had a different URL for US customers, and you had a different URL for the rest of the world. So that's the right way to do internationalization. 
So many cases we've seen where people simply use cookies to assume the language of whoever is visiting your website, and they'll just directly show you that version. So I'm sure all of you have probably visited a very big website, and if you're in, like, say, a Hindi-speaking state, sometimes you directly get the Hindi version of that website. But your, the default version that you always use is English. So that can be a bad experience for users. And even for search engines, if you do not, uh, if you do not have separate URLs, it's very hard for us to figure out that, OK, this is the English version, this is the Hindi version, this is the Kannada version. We'll just assume there's only one version, and whichever that version is, we'll index it. So your content in the other languages is not indexed. And that's bad for both you and your users. OK, this sounds very obvious, but we've seen many cases where you have the Bangalore page in English, but what happens in the Hindi page is only the boilerplate template is translated, but the actual content within the page, that's not translated. So Google doesn't use code-level attributes like lang that uh, people add. Google doesn't use that to determine what language a page is. Google actually looks at the content and the text of a page to determine which language that page uh, has. So if you have, like, say, the template is in one language and the content is in another language, that makes it hard for Google to understand which language that page is. And we'll just pick one based on some signals, and uh, we'll probably show it to the wrong audience, which is very, very bad for you and for your users. Your users. OK, so we've seen a case where we told you not to redirect people from the English page to the Hindi page or the Kannada page based on cookies or other information that you may have, right? Well, how do you then, how does people, someone who lands on your English page, how does he visit your Hindi page? Well, you've got to make sure there's a small option for him to visit the other versions of your website. That way, even if they, if, even if they land on the wrong page or even if the search engine makes a mistake and sends him, sends an English user to the Hindi version, you can simply click on the language button and visit the English version. And finally, don't worry about duplicate content. So many people who, because there are thousands of pages and thousands of versions of uh, your website, you end up worrying about duplicate content and thinking whether it, you'll be penalized for this or your ranking will go down. That it's, don't worry about any duplicate content penalty. The only issue here is if we don't detect your pages in other languages, those pages will not be ranked. But the pages that are detected are ranked. So even if you make a mistake, it's not going to affect you in a bad manner. It's just not going to show the pages that, you're, that we are supposed to show. Uh, that's pretty much it for my session. So if you have any questions, please, uh, we don't have a booth, but uh, we'll just be at the Hall 3A. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Happy to see all of you here. Have you had a good couple of days? Absolutely. The training sessions are much more uh, filled in than these light sessions at the end of the day. Uh, so today I'm going to try and uh, uh, do uh, something a little uh, harder than usual and run some code during a 30-minute talk and uh, build a couple of serverless computing functions, both uh, using Cloud Functions and the G Suite API. So my name is Patrick Martinant, and like I said, I'm a bit of a masochist and decided to inflict myself some stress running some live code and tempt Murphy's Law. So let's see how it goes. So what is serverless? Um, possibly the most exciting and uh, technology that's come up and the one that's freed me the most of being able to really focus on building applications, right? I'm old, I've seen quite a bit. I did weekend gaming on early Wang mini computers in the 70s. I had an Atari 800 in 1979. Uh, installed Netware, uh, Netware Networks, Windows for Workgroup, uh, built some GUI applications. And I don't have to do a lot of that anymore thanks to wireless, uh, serverless. So I was looking for an interesting quote, and I didn't find any. Uh, so I decided that I'd simply uh, I'd simply write this up. So it is confusing because serverless is a very wide uh, catch-all phrase, and everybody's got a different definition. So eventually I went to uh, Wikipedia, and I got this definition. But of course, uh, serverless computing still requires servers, and uh, hence it's a misnomer, you know, a wrong or inaccurate name or designation. The name serverless computing is used because the server management, the capacity planning, uh, is hidden from the deployer, uh, developer. Uh, you'll, you'll never have to provision computers yourself, and it can be used in conjunction with other microservices or really uh, on its own. But Google has been leading the serverless uh, movement and uh, for more than a decade. We started with App Engine back in 2008, was one of the very first platform as a service in the market and one of the early tools that I used, uh, especially using uh, the Python SDK. Uh, we then uh, released BigQuery, which is our managed data warehouse that provides analytics at scale uh, using the sharding technology from Google. We're able to run through millions or tens of millions of rows uh, within a few seconds. We then come out with cloud storage, which allows us to store enormous binary uh, files and serve them. Hidden in App Engine, for those of you who remember, was this thing called Data Store. And then eventually, uh, we made it, we packaged it in an API and made it available for you without having to go through the pass, and that was Cloud Data Store. With the advent of big data, uh, we have to uh, do a lot of data processing. And Cloud Dataflow allows you to do both real streaming data processing as well as batch and mix both of them. And Firebase, which I'm going to be talking more about today, uh, was originally created uh, as a real-time database. Um, and now is Google's go-to and even, I would say, the market's go-to mobile backend as a service. PubSub allows us to do distributed real-time messaging at scale. If you have millions of users that are exchanging messages, this is how you're going to be able to do it. And Cloud Functions, this is where we're getting closer to my definition of serverless, functions as a service. And finally, for those who were in the training just a, a while ago, Cloud Machine Learning Engine, uh, where Google uh, was recently described by Sundar Pichai as an IoT, as an IA first company rather than a mobile first company. So in this talk, I narrowed the focus to uh, the function as a service. And basically, if we look at cloud functions, they are single purpose JavaScript uh, and that are executed in a secure and managed node environment for you. They are only executed when a specific event is being watched, is emitted, perhaps also an HTTP endpoint that you can hit. Deploying your code to the servers will require just one command, and after that, your cloud functions will automatically scale based on the usage patterns of your app. You never worry about SSH credentials, server configuring, or decommissioning. In many cases, the application logic is anyway best controlled on the server to avoid any tampering, reverse engineering. Cloud functions are fully insulated. But I'm also going to introduce Google Apps Script. For those of you who have gone to Wesley's sessions and understand the G Suite, you understand that Google Apps Script provides a high level of abstraction 
to look at the Google API. So that while you're writing mobile apps uh, using Firebase on the front end, you might want to do some processing within the G Suite capabilities, whether the docs or the sheets uh, or the Drive API for that, uh, for that um, purpose. So I'm going to try uh, to create a serverless API in 90 seconds or less, combining the power of Google Apps Script and G Suite APIs. G Suite APIs, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but these are all the classic tools that you've been using in the front end. And uh, we are able, uh, using your favorite uh, platform, iOS, Android, or the web, and a variety of uh, languages, Java, Python, Node, PHP, Ruby, you should be able to do everything programmatically by accessing the, these APIs as you would on, uh, on the front end. In addition to these APIs, there are an equal number or more of APIs for the domain administrator. So if you're working in a G Suite environment and you want to provision users or you want to create user groups, all these APIs are there, even in terms of uh, understanding uh, the usage patterns and the analytics. But the other, my favorite, simpler, quicker way to interact with these APIs is Google Apps Script. I call it a magical toolbox of sorts. Allows me to integrate all these APIs in a convenient cloud-based IDE without having to deal with the authentication. If some of you have been to the code labs, you know that dealing with authentication, going, creating credentials, storing those credentials in a secret .json, and then eventually uh, going through that uh, refresh token in order to call the API is a bit of boiler code boilerplate code that takes quite a, a lot of time to get used to. Google Apps Script also allows us with HTML service to create complex web apps. So we can do tiny scripts all the way to fully uh, developed web apps. Also, it allows us with this advanced services to interact with other Google uh, uh, services, such as analytics, AdWords, big queries, and many others. So, I'm going to look at a little bit of code. And this is a two-line instruction of code that's going to allow me uh, to do um, uh, a little bit of work. So let's say I have a, a business uh, that's uh, send, selling some products. And I want to be able to send these brochures uh, to customers that register either on my website or on my mobile app and ask for further information. So with two lines of code, I'm going to be able to uh, find that the relevant file inside of the Google Drive folder. As you can see, I have the Drive app get folder by ID that returns an iterator that I'm able to traverse to find the file name or particular name. And then my second instruction is simply sending the email to a particular email address, a subject, and I'm able to attach the file that I've just got uh, uh, after having generated it as a PDF. So these could be deployed in a number of ways. One would be a library. Another one could be a web app, so that I could quick, quickly have an endpoint and be able to uh, send those emails to anybody. And finally, uh, we're going to do an, an, a final use case, which is an API executable that can be invoked using the execution API. We're going to invoke that later from our, Google, from our Firebase environment. So let's try and switch to the demo. So I'm going to try and do this in 90 seconds. So I'm just going to create a new script. I just go to my drive. I create a script. Already I'm losing time. I quickly give it a name. So send marketing brochure to. I save it. I'm cheating a little bit. Unfortunately, we have a problem with the display. OK, there it is. Um, I'm going to get the code. Here it is. I'm pasting the code. That's not the right code. I told you Murphy would get in the way. No. Of course. There we go. All right. I'm just going to run this code and go to the authentication flow. We, as I am in App Script, I don't have to do any of this. Normally, I would have to get an API key, go get a token, etc. And I'm just going to allow. Um, this authentication and this permission. All right. And now I'm going to publish this as a web app. And once I publish this as a web app, I'm going to be able to access that particular script. So now 
I have a script that I'm going to be able to access. And what does this script do? As you can see here, in these top two lines, I'm just going to get the query parameters, get the email. 90, min 90 seconds is done, so I've failed once again at this. Uh, I'm going to get the email from the query parameters and the file name. Then I will immediately be able to send out that. So I've got these query parameters saved here, just to go a bit faster, supposedly faster, and put them in here. And hopefully I get an OK, and hopefully, see if I can find my And here's my request for information. So we can go back to the, we can go back to the presentation slides. So here was a quick API, uh, a serverless API that allowed me to, within a few lines of code, uh, send a, uh, an email with an attachment um, and with very little uh, worrying about uh, setting up servers and using infrastructure that was available to me. So the next, but that doesn't scale necessarily as, as much as we would. Uh, Google Apps and Google Apps Script have quotas, and if I wanted to send millions of emails, that's not a way to do it. So there's another way to do it, and that's using possibly the Firebase platform. So Firebase is basically a mobile backend as a service and the only one uh, you'll want. I think it's awesome uh, for folks like me that need the laborious, laborious stuff taken out especially if you want to build cross-platform apps with support for Android, iOS, and the web. And for those who remember the platform when, before it was acquired by Google, it had some awesome real-time capability, but since then, it's gone an enormously long way and now provides the most integrated, comprehensive platform to help developers and business power their apps and platform. It really operates along four dimensions. One, it allows you to develop your apps with authentication, database, storage, hosting and functions. It allows you to stabilize your app with crash analytics, performance monitoring and testing and the test lab which allows you to test against an array of Android devices in the cloud. It also then once you've deployed your app allows you to analyze what's happening in your app with integrated analytics and segmentation. We can understand which type of user is doing what. And finally, as you understand what your users are doing, you can grow this number of users. And we've just recently uh, released AI-based predictions. So you can use the AI engine to understand which users are likely to churn so that you can make an offer to them, which users are likely to purchase, and you can send custom messaging to them. Notification, dynamic links, and revenue generation with AdMob are all part of this integrated platform. So, as part of uh, the platform Cloud Functions for Firebase, uh, we, we talked about Cloud Functions a bit earlier, which is this massively scalable Node.js environment where we can execute uh, um, uh, little pieces of code for specific use cases. And this opens the door to great use cases. For instance, we could send confirmation email to users subscribing and unsubscribing to a newsletter. We could send an SMS confirmation when a user creates a new account. When it comes to real-time database sanitation, we could do text moderation, we could do sentiment analysis, we could move things to BigQuery. We can also look at executing intensive tasks such as image processing, image manipulation, bulk image, uh, bulk email to users, and aggregating data. We can also integrate with third-party services and APIs uh, from uh, getting notifications when a GitHub repository is being, uh, is being committed to all the way to creating uh, a chatbot. So we're going to look a little bit at Firebase functions. And this is the simplest Firebase function. Uh, when you in initially initialize Firebase in your working directory, you'll be able to upload code with a simple uh, Firebase deploy code and, and, and get some scalable functions in a matter of minutes. So let's switch to the demo. I don't know why I have so many blank spaces. All right, so this is what it looks like. This is the console, and here you can see that I've deployed one Firebase function. It's a hello world function. It's the function we've just seen, and basically it's behind a HTTPS request, and if I get that particular request, it'll reply, hello from Firebase. So now we're gonna try and do something a little bit more complex. 
What we're going to do is this code that I had written in App Script, I've deployed it behind an API executable, and now I'm going to try and access it. And so here is my HTTP function. So command C. Mm -hmm. Always funny to see people on the screen, right? There we go. So I'm saving this. I'm going to use, if I find it, uh, uh, one of the uh, functions of uh, the, the, the developer tooling that allows me to serve my function locally. So instead of sending it to the cloud and then testing it on the cloud, if I'm doing rapid modifications, I can just serve this function locally. So this is going to create a local server for me. And it's going to take all of that code and allow me to, uh, to execute a local, there are too many desktops. <laughs> so let me go find my source code. All right, let's look at the source code a little bit. So I required the, uh, some authentication, which I have abstracted here. I'm not going to go through it. And basically what I do is I look at the HTTP request. Again, similarly to what we've seen uh, in the uh, Google Apps Script functions, I'm looking at the query parameters and extracting the email and the file name. And then very simply reading my client secret, requesting for an OAuth, an OAuth token. And if I get that OAuth token, then I call my Apps Script. And in my Apps Script, what I do very simply again is I've got the script ID of the function that I deployed as an executable, executable API. And then using the Google API, I create uh, the script API handler. And then I'll run my function within uh, that script handler, and I'll pass these resources. And what are the resources? The OAuth token that I just got, the function, which is called send marketing brochure within my script, and the two parameters. And so here in the meantime, hopefully my terminal window. Is that the one? Oh. That's not the one. Here it is. And so now you've seen that I have access to a HTTP function. And if I find a browser, I'm going to be able to run it. Unbelievable. <laughs> and there we go. And similarly, here, I'm running this. And now I should have a similar result as soon as I find. And here it is, 457. Is it 457? Yes, so that's the one I've just received. All right. Going back to the presentation. So now I want to tie it all together with the final piece of the, of, of the puzzle. Uh, two uh, databases are made available for us on, Fire, on, on, on uh, Firebase. One is the Cloud Firestore, which was really recently released, and Beta, and the real-time database, which originally made the product famous. What's important to know is that you can use both of these databases in the same Firebase app. They have different use cases, and you might have a project that needs both of those use cases. Both are no SQL databases. They store the same type of data, and the client libraries work in a similar manner. Both have a mobile-first SDK, and both support local storage for offline-ready apps. The, file, the Firebase real-time database really stores and syncs data in a real time, whereas the Firebase Cloud Firestore stores and syncs app and data at a global scale. So again, trying to continue on this vein, um, I am now going to replace my HTTP function by a function that executes when I create a document. So continuing with my use case, I am going to uh, store every request or every inquiries. And as I create a new inquiry record within the database, I want the email to be sent at that time. So let's try again. This is the Firestore environment. This is my Firebase environment. And this is my source code. So I'm going to change my function that was an HTTP function that I had exported, and I'm going to change it to a 
firestore create function. And it's essentially, you will see, the same function. I'm just going to replace that. I'm going to deploy it and then talk about And so here I'm going to deploy the code while I talk, while I, I'm going to deploy the function while I talk about the code. Okay. Here we go. And so what we can see here is that I'm exporting a function that on creation of a document within the Firestore database, within the inquiries collection, I will then fire this event. This event will allow me to take the data from the document and once again just take those particular fields that are important to me, the email and the file name. And then really the rest of the code is the same. I'm going to authenticate uh, the, feature, the function uh, uh, and then eventually call the app script and it's exactly the same call. So let's see if that's going ahead. So one of the things that's you can see here is that it deleted the hello world and so every time you re-upload the code only uh, it, it, it will delete those functions that are no longer there. So if all goes well I can now come to my uh, uh, database, my Cloud Firestore and add a document. And so I'll go to add a document. I'm going to have I'm going to not care about the ID which is going to be automatically generated and I'm going to create those two fields. So. Last time I did this, I forgot the dot .com. All right. And then the document name that I want to send. Firebase. What is it? Firebase indexing. Dot .pdf. I'm just going to refresh this to be sure that my function is deployed. And so it's still not deployed, or it's you know what? It was deployed, but it was the wrong one because I hadn't pressed saved. I'm doing okay on time, so I'm going to wait for this to happen. So I'll tell you a little story in the meantime. So I've been in India for 21 years, and. Uh, I live in uh, Chennai, so Vanakam. Any, any people from Tamil Nadu here? All right, come on, give us a share. Vanakam, Vanakam, Vanakam. All right. And so, how do you say it in Canada? You say Namaste, is it? Namaskara, Namaskara. All right. I have a few guys in the room. Are they there at least watching me? Can you put your hands up? Or oh, they didn't come? Okay, I got one there, two there. You can, you can ask them if I'm a good boss. All right, so now I should be able to, first time I ran this, it took an hour, second time 30 minutes, and now I'm going to end up in 27 minutes, so that's pretty cool. There you see, so now my function is no longer a HTTP event, but it is waiting for a document to be created on the Firestore within the inquiries collection. And so if I save this, I'm just going to double check that it's really completed the process. Next time I'll work with the AV guys to remove some screens. Right? We had too many, too many desktops. All right, come on. So we're going to blame it on the internet. I need a deploy, com I need a deploy complete. And delete this one and let's try anyway and then you'll they have created a new document and oh my gosh anytime we should see this doc this this come anyway you believe me when I'm telling you it's working <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back and show you later all right so going back to the present functions 
very quickly with Google Apps Script without having to worry with this come. Anyway, you believe me when I'm telling you it's working. <laughs> I'll come back and show you later. All right, so going back to the presentation. So I want to leave you with a couple of caveats and actually three caveats. The most important caveat is that, of course, this example was completely convoluted and doesn't make a lot of sense. But what I wanted to show you was that we could create serverless functions very quickly with Google Apps Script without having to worry with OAuth and that you, could be, you, you were going to be able to do that with uh, and access a wide variety of Google Suites APIs and even other APIs and make uh, interesting use cases happen pretty fast. And the second one was we looked at it at a, in, in a more scalable environment. One of the um, uh, caveats that uh, in order for you to be able to call a Google Apps Script project within uh, you need to be within the same cloud project. And when you create a standalone script, basically it automatically creates a Google Cloud platform. And then you need to change the script that it is, change the project that it is attached to. So you find out the project ID of your Firebase project and you change that. And that's the only way you can call uh, the uh, uh, execution API. And the second one was that it does not yet support service accounts. So what I've had to do in the background is I've had to go through that manual flow once and store the uh, and store the, uh, the authentication, the, the, the token, uh, and the refresh token so that subsequent, uh, subsequent uh, executions uh, were able to read that file. And I've put all of that in the, uh, in the source code. And I can show you that quickly, but that's not really necessary. All right. Oops. Sorry. I'm playing around. Let's go back to the presentation and finish it. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time to uh, listen to me through my uh, uh, ups and downs. And if you have any questions, you can see me after uh, the session. Thank you very much. We want people to be happy, you know, when they, when they want to feel relaxed, play our games. They're like classic games. There's no learning curve. Just go, grab your phone, play it, and have your awesome day. When I was 10 years old, my dad got me a book on Pascal. And just a few chapters in, I immediately realized I can create some amazing things all by myself. I always remember my mom playing solitaire on a computer. But when moving to mobile, she struggled to find a good solitaire for her phone. So she insisted that being a game developer, plus her daughter, I should develop solitaire for her. We played solitaire for hours. We even bought a deck of cards to understand the game better. It took us six months of research and design to make solitaire look great and be really fun to play. 60% of our users are mommies and grannies. So we designed solitaire, keeping them in mind. Big bold cards, soothing colors, and minimal design taking a lot of cues from Google Material Design Guidelines. Today, we have five more games in the pipeline, and we hired five more Android developers to work on them. I didn't travel all over the world, but my app did. And it is making many people happy, and that is really awesome. It definitely wasn't a smooth journey, but through hard work and great use of feedback, we are where we are today, and we can't wait to see what we do next. This is the AIY Project Kit. With this simple cardboard box, it's easy to get a natural language recognizer up and running. And there are limitless possibilities for what you can build once the kit is ready to go. Can you sing a song? This is my song. <laughs> it's not very long. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is James, as you said. I'm a hardware engineer here at Google. Um, I did work in the hardware on the kit. There's a whole team of people who did the software, the hardware, the interface, the low-level drivers, um, and we're something of Google machine intelligence um, that the kit lets you tap into, hopefully in a very easy and fun way. Um, they do exactly what you program them to do, uh, not what you want them to do. Exact same thing goes with, with AI or machine intelligence. Um, there's no magic, there, there's no top secret way um, to make them um, act like uh, R2-D2 or Lieutenant Commander Data or BB, 
uh, eight, depends how old your references are. So you will find things like that. After a quick demo and tutorial, it was the students' turn to build something. Personally, I want to make a little spider-like device that locks. With okay. Servers. I have extra servos. The students took the kits home and came back five days later to show us what they built. What this does is, it here's the action, sends a Bluetooth serial through serial, and okay. it goes right into that device right there. Go forward. Nice. Stop. It was pretty simple servo code, just to ask it to go from neutral to 90 degrees and then back. Candy. Giving you one candy. <laughs> and then for this one, since we're using the servos, it only go 180 degrees. Ideally, you'd want to be able to select all four, but right now you can only select three, since it can only, <laughs> can only turn so far. That's um, why we prototype, right? Yep, yep. Enable toothbrush head rotator. Enable toothbrush head rotator. Ah, this came unplugged. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Yeah. Okay, so white's obviously facing me. Yes. yes How cool is that? These are a couple of the projects that use servo motors controlled by that hat that comes with the AIY. It was a really nice surprise that the regular Raspberry Pi I.O. libraries just worked out of the box with it. It made building the projects that much easier. Some of the kids, though, took a decidedly more software approach. Let's take a look at the voice services that they implemented. Push the button, shop for something. Shop for New York Yankees baseball hats. So what's actually happening now? Yeah. Woo! So she just said done, right? Yep. Okay. So what actually happened was that when it said done, it's just sent links to my email. Okay. After finding it on eBay. Oh. So it'll find results online, send links in an email to me, and I'm gonna receive those so then I can quickly click and buy something if I wanted to. Well, first, when you uh, say a command word, so uh, in this case that's food, it goes to a function, and then it takes a picture with the camera uh, using the Pi, Pi camera library. Okay. What food is this? The food item is one of the following. Candy apple, mock mayo, reindeer cherry, or hard-boiled egg. <laughs> you can see where I'd also think of a reindeer yeah. cherry because it's kind of yellow. Pick a color, any color. Okay, I'll be blue. And is that black? black? Okay, okay, I'll be black. So we start off, we say, New game as black. Yep, I do here. So I'll, I'll move like this one. So what is that? D7 to D5? Okay. Pawn to D5. E4 takes D5, your move. I like how sassy it is. Yeah. It's like E4 takes E5, your move. <laughs> this is what happened when some high school kids got the AIY kit and hacked on it for just a few days. All of them were inspired to do more from expanding their hardware projects to using more cloud services. Many of them had never even used Python before, and the open source code that comes with the AIY was a great launch pad for them to learn. So what will you build? Learn more at aiyprojects.withgoogle.com and do let us know.
everybody. Namaskar, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley, and I'm going to show you a few things you can do with the Google Sheets API. Uh, I have the word new in the title, and even though we launched it at Google I.O. in 2016, it's still relatively new. So this is a great time to give it a look if you're going to be developing applications that use spreadsheets. Okay, a little bit by myself. Uh, my main job is to enable all of you to be successful using our developer tools and APIs. Some of you may know that uh, I host the G Suite Dev Show on YouTube, and I'm also a frequent contributor to our uh, G Suite Developers blog as well as on our Twitter. Uh, a little background about me, I'm a software engineer. I've been coding for many, many years. Uh, the most well-known thing you probably remember uh, or you, that you know about is Yahoo Mail. So I was one of the original 10 engineers that built that 20 years ago. And I've been doing Python ever since. Uh, and uh, I'm very active in the Python community. But again, my job here is to make you guys successful using Google Developer Tools and APIs. Uh, if you want to watch some of the videos, there's a link right there. In fact, uh, I'm, we're going to go over some examples, and each of the examples has a video for each specific use case. So you can uh, t uh, review those so just in case everything just flies through because this is just a 30-minute session. Then you can always watch the video to kind of go back and take a deeper dive in the code. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction to the Sheets API version 4. I'm going to talk about what was in the previous versions so you can get an idea of like how it's changed since then uh, and then give you some sort of like use cases as to why you would use the Sheets API. Uh, and then we'll look at three very different examples of using the API just to show you kind of like the variety of things that you guys can do with the Sheets API. Okay? All right. So version 4. So before we kind of like look at the newest version, let's take a little step back before getting started. So we know that spreadsheets have been a computing killer app for many, many years, for decades, right? And it goes well beyond the business world. And for nearly as long, they've been programmable. Even, you know, uh, Excel is programmable in VB, right? And so, you know, it's no surprise that this was one of Google's very first APIs, like, ever. All right, and you can actually see if you look at the if you can see the date really carefully, you can see that the very first version of the Google Sheets API came out exactly, well, almost exactly as of two days ago, exactly 11 years ago. All right, so that's how old this API is. Okay, um, and since then we've obviously made a lot of improvements to it, and so I'm happy to share those things with you guys today. All right. So version three, what can you do with this API? So you can create new sheets from existing spreadsheets. You can write new rows of data. And of course, you can read data, all right? But unfortunately, that's all you could do, all right? So though it's, it's, it's restrictive in that way. And so now with v4, you know, it, it seems that with just the features that we saw in V3, it seems kind of an incomplete API, right? Because we know that spreadsheets can do a lot more than that. And so uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, some of the things that you will find in V4. And you can actually take a look at the blog post for when we launched it from 2016, just to kind of get an idea of uh, how the product manager uh, describes the vision of the API and you know why we made these improvements, okay? But let's go over some of the, the new features that we'll, you'll find in the, in the new version. Okay, so think of what you can do if you were sitting at your desk in front of Google Sheets, all the things that you can do using your, your mouse and your computer and your screen, right? An API should allow you to do those things too because you should be able to write an application to the, do the same things that you can do while you're sitting in front of the machine. And that's really the power of V4. So let's take a look. We know that V3 can do those things, so let's kind of like look what else you can do now with version 4. You can create brand new spreadsheets. You can set frozen rows, you can add cell formatting, you can adjust column sizes, you can put in formulas, you can build pivot tables, you can create charts, right? All those things that you guys know that you can do from using the user interface, right? Now you can do that uh, with your own application. So that's the really exciting about thing about V4. And by the way, it still keeps things simple for developers, okay? Um, so when you interact with the Sheets API, you're going to use one of these three method collections, all right? And from with each of these collections, the first one is just 
manipulating spreadsheets as a whole in general. The second group is for individual sheets, mostly just copying them. And then the third one is related to values, okay? The ones that are in bold are typically the ones you're going to use, all right, if you're going to be using the API, because you're going to either do a lot of changes to an existing spreadsheet, uh, or like, for example, formatting, or you're gonna upload or change a lot of data that's in the spreadsheet. So that's why the ones in bold are typically the methods that you're gonna be using the most. All right, so what are some reasons why you would consider using the Sheets API if you've never done so before? Okay, one of the main reasons is you could have a lot of important data inside a database, but that's not really visually appealing. That's not something that you may want to show your managers because it doesn't really tell them anything. It's just a bunch of text that they're looking at, right? It's not as useful. But what you can do is you can take this data out of the database using the API, and now when you put it in a spreadsheet, all of a sudden you can create charts, and you, know, you can have other types of visualizations. And also, you know, when you have a spreadsheet, you have a user interface that people can actually go and manipulate the data with, right? Like you can create pivot tables, or you can somehow you know, manipulate and format the data in the spreadsheet so it's more useful than just static data that sin sits in a spreadsheet, or it sits in a database. Okay, so that's one use case of the Sheets API. Another one is, well, maybe you, know, you, you have uh, information that is updated in the database very often, but you also want that reflected in the spreadsheet that you have that sort of matches the data that's in the, in the database, right? So you can use the API to kind of like refresh and update the spreadsheet. Similarly, if, for example, you're taking data into the spreadsheet, like maybe from a Google form or something like that, maybe you want to take that data and update the database, right? So this is a two-way communication. So in this sense, you're kind of using the spreadsheet sort of like a database, but it's more uh, using it sort of as an end uh, to uh, create like visualizations for you to be able to look at that data and basically take input, for example, again, like I said, from, from Google Forms. So that's like another use case that you would have, a, a category for why you would use the Sheets API. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at three different ways that we can use the Sheets API. And I'm gonna show you some code. It's gonna be, you know, it's in Python, so you can kind of consider that pseudocode if you don't do Python, right? So the first case is bulk loading values from a database. So um, we're going to look at a SQL database in particular, and let me kind of describe it. So for those of you who are new to the Sheets API and you want to learn it really well, we have a nice code lab where you build a Node.js app, which is a customized reporting tool based on, you know, if you were a toy manufacturer and your, your customers are placing orders for toys. So that's the app that you're going to build if you use the code lab. It's available to you at that short link there. But what we're going to do is we're going to reuse that database. So, for example, pretend you created this, you know, you've done the code lab, you created the toy database, and now you want to move that information into a spreadsheet, okay? So here's just a quick uh, schema to show you that uh, I have this database in a SQLite database running on my machine. And you can see it has information like uh, the, the customer name, the products, how many toys they ordered, what the price was, and things like that. So the sample data is pretty small. I think there's only five or six rows, as you can see here. Um, I'm just using the SQLite uh, interf uh, user interface to just bring up this data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some Python code to import all of this data and then put it into the spreadsheet. All right, so what does the source code look like? Uh, if you guys came to my code lab earlier, uh, then you're familiar with uh, all the authorization that happens. So that code is like 1 through 15, so you can't see them here. All right, but assuming that all the authorization goes through, this is the actual code that does exactly what we said it was going to do, which is on lines 18 to 21, that creates a brand new spreadsheet with toy orders. From lines 23 to 28, that's where we read all of the data out of the SQL database. And then from lines you know, 30 to 36 is the rest of it, where what we're doing is we're taking the data, we're creating, uh, you know, once we've got the rows, we're going to just update this. So if you look at like lines 31 and 32, what we're doing here is we're saying start putting all the data starting at the upper left-hand corner, which is cell A1. So you see that on line 32. And the data is all the rows that we read from the database. And in this particular case, um, I choose the value input option of raw because I just want to upload the data. 
Now, you have another option, which is called user, uh, user entered. And what that means is it pretends that you're sitting in front of the computer on your spreadsheet and typing it in. So if your spreadsheet is formatted, uh, then when you type in the numbers, they're going to be formatted to whatever formatting exists in the database. So you have a couple of options here. In this particular case, since I just want to upload the data straight into the database, I'm just going to use raw. Okay, and so that's why I use the spreadsheets.values.update call on line 31. That was one of, uh, that was in the values collection, remember we looked at that earlier. Okay, and then just to prove that the data got written, the last couple of lines, 34 to 36, just reads those values out of the database and just prints it on the screen for the user to confirm that the data from the database has uh, been sent to, uh, sent to the spreadsheet. Okay, pretty basic example. I'd say, you know, this is roughly about 18 lines of code. It's not too much, uh, but it does something useful and something that you may have to do for work. But, you know, it's just an example to help kind of get you started. All right, uh, there is a video behind it, so if you want to actually watch this thing as a video, I think this is the very first one for the API. So, um, so yeah, so it's the, the very first video that introduces like one of the things that you can do with it. And since then, I think I've made a couple of other videos uh, after that. Okay, so now let's move on to the next subject, which is in the past, you could not format spreadsheet cells. And to me, I, it's like frustrating. Like why I have a spreadsheet and I have data in it, I want to make it look pretty, and I don't want to have to do it manually by hand every time. I want to write code for it. So it was disappointing for me to find out that we weren't able to do this in the previous versions of the API. So I was quite happy that this was one of the things that we could do, so uh, we can do now in v4. And I was very happy to like, go on to Stack Overflow and change all that, you know, add new answers, like, can you format cells in, with the Google Sheets API? And the answer used to be no, but I'm very happy to say that we can do that now. Okay? So let's take a look at this sheet. Now, this is the same toy order sheet, the same data that we just uploaded. Okay, so these are all tied together, right? Um, doesn't look really boring. There's no formatting at all. Okay, so what can you do with it? You can add all the formatting. So now, hopefully it works. Okay, so now things look a little bit better. All right, so we did a couple of things, like we froze the top row. We bolded the top row. We formatted the prices in column E so that they're financial values. So if you go back and look, you see how it's kind of plain like that? And also like the 12.5, that doesn't mean anything, right? So once we format it, uh, you can see that it's now 12.50. So it actually looks like a financial amount, okay? And then in uh, the, the column F, we made fixed values and cell validation so that it ha the status has to be one of these three options. It's either pending, shipped, or delivered. All right, so those are the things that we are able to do using the API. So now let's start taking a look at how you would code this. Okay, uh, so obviously, oh, I should have been pressing this. All right, so all these things you could do. All right, so now let's look at the code. So how do you send commands to the API? The way you do that is, first of all, you need to have the ID of a spreadsheet. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. Either you have an existing one, or you can go to using the Google Drive API and do a query and search for the exact file that you're looking for. And so what happens is you're going to have a JavaScript array of requests. And these requests can be individual commands. They could be the same command. They could be different commands. It doesn't really matter. So you put all of your commands inside this request array. All right, in this example, I just have like updating of uh, the properties of a spreadsheet, uh, repeat this operation over multiple cells, set cell validation, sort this range, add a chart, lots of different things. There's many different commands. And once you have all of the requests that you want to send to the API, you're going to call spreadsheets.batchUpdate because that is the spreadsheets command is, or the method collection for spreadsheets. It's what you're going to use uh, to make these operations happen. And remember how I had a, a couple of the methods that are bolded? Well, batch update is definitely one of them, okay? Because what happens is you're going to have a whole bunch of commands and you want to send them all to the API at the same time. Now, one of the reasons why they chose this design is because, you know, Google APIs are free, generally, right? And so what happens is that in order to control resource usage, we have certain quota as to like how many things that you can do. And if you keep on calling the API all the time, just for like one request, API call, another request, another API call, then you're gonna slowly but surely run out of, uh, run out of calls that you can make to the API. So the advantage of putting all of your commands inside this request array is that you only make one call to the API. 
And that way, it helps you minimize the number of calls that you make overall, and basically it gives you the sense that you have more quota than you really do. Okay, so this is generally the structure. And if you end up using the Google Slides API, it works in the same way. It also has a batch update. Okay, so these are two of the newest APIs that we have, and this is sort of like the, the, the model that we're going after now, just to help you guys uh, extend your usage. Okay, so how do you freeze a row? So that's the first thing that we're doing. Um, that is a, considered a sheet property, so the verb that you need to use is update sheets property. But what are you trying to update? All right, you're trying to update the frozen row count, which is part of grid properties, which is part of the overall properties. All right, and you want to set that to one. So that's the same thing as if you went into the spreadsheet UI and you dragged down you know, that little thing on the left-hand side, the slider, so that the first row stays the same. When you scroll up, the first row still stays on the screen. Okay, so that's the frozen row. And then fields just confirms uh, that the frozen row count is the field that you want to update. Now, you may be thinking, this is repetitious. You know, why am I saying the frozen row count wants to be, you know, I'm going to change the frozen row count up there in grid properties, but then I have to say it again in fields. All right, so I, I made a separate video for, to describe why this is the case. And the reason is because with fields, you can reset other fields, not just the frozen row count. Generally, when you make a change, there's a one-to-one -one matching here. All right, but there's certain things that you may want to do uh, to reset something. So, the, for example, if you want to change it so it's not bold or something like that, you would have a, a not bold uh, property set, but then in your field, you would leave it blank. All right, so anyway, the main idea is fields control what thing actually gets changed. Okay, so you can actually reset other values too. All right. Like I said, I made a video on this just because it's confusing. So I have two separate, uh, two separate videos on, on just field masks. That's what these are. Um, just because my goal, again, is to make you guys successful. And if there's something confusing, I got to make sure that you guys are not confused. So that's, that's part of my job duty. All right. Now, let's talk about cell ranges first. Okay, so a cell range is made up of a sheet ID and a bunch of indices that describes the area of the spreadsheet that you want to change. Okay, so when you create a brand new spreadsheet, you get one sheet, right, the empty one. That one has a sheet ID defaults to zero. All right, and so like most programming languages, when you're looking at rows and columns, this counting starts at zero. Okay, so even though in the user interface, you've got row one through six, the index numbers are actually 0 through 5, and the same thing goes for the column numbers. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, also, ranges are exclusive of all end indexes. Okay, so that means they go up to, but do not include the end index value. All right, and then we'll look at, we'll look at that in the next couple of slides. And then lastly, if an index is 0, you can just leave it out. All right, so again, I'll show you that too. Okay, all right, so. Uh, again, sheet ID and indices. Uh, the first sheet that's created has a default ID of zero. Index starts counting at zero. Everything's exclusive. Uh, and then you can skip it depending on the scenario. Mostly if it's a zero, then you can skip it. Okay? All right, quick quiz. So what I want you guys to do is look at the, the four cells that I have highlighted. And what you're going to do is you're going to help me fill in the, the uh, grid range. All right? Do you guys remember what the sheet ID is? By default, it's zero, good. All right, now the start column index, what is the starting column index here? Okay, zero, one, two, three, right? Three and four, but not five, so we can't put four because it's exclusive of the end index, so that should be five. And then with row, it's zero, one, two, up to four, right? Two and three, but not four. Okay, so there we go. And because, like I said, if, the, if it's zero, you can leave it out, so that's why it's kind of grayed out, so you don't have to put the sheet ID there. But that's only the first default sheet that's created for you. If you add more sheets or somehow delete the first sheet, all the other sheet IDs are not zero, so you're going to have to put those in there. Okay, so just be aware of that. Uh, but once you guys know that it's three, five, two, four, all right, then you know how to manipulate an entire range. Okay, so that's, that's good. Now, let's, let's use that knowledge and bold the first row. Okay, it's not considered a, a sheet property, so we can't do the same thing that we did with frozen rows. We actually have to specify to bold individual columns. 
okay, and individual cells. So the command in this case is repeat cell. Okay, I have the sheet ID of zero there, but you can leave that out. The starting row index is zero, but I could leave that out. Okay, the end row index is one because I'm only going to bold the first row. Okay, and then for the column index, I'm going to start at zero because I want to start at the very left, but zero is a default, so I can leave that index out. Uh, however, the end column index I have to have because I want to end at column five, which means I need to make the end column index six because it's exclusive of the final, uh, final value, right? Okay, so that's the first part. And then the next part is, well, what do we do with this cell? So remember the command is repeat cell. So now we have the range of cells. What is the command that we're going to do? What do we want to do to each individual cell? We're going to go into the user entered format, dot text format, dot bold field, and we're going to turn it on to true. Okay, and, and again, we also have the equivalent fields mask to say that's the only thing I want to change. Leave everything else alone. Don't reset anything. Okay. So that's it. That's, that's all you need to actually make the uh, row bold. Okay, and so if you wanted to see sort of an action in Python, it looks like this. So we've got the update sheets property. It's the same thing that we saw earlier. We've got the repeat cell to bold it. That's the same thing. And you take those things, you throw it into the request array, and then you make one call to batch update, and then it's done. You can actually see it. If you run this from the command line, you can act and look at your spreadsheet. You can actually watch it change in real time. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Okay, so that's a couple of things that you can do. What about the currency formatting part? Like, you know, if I'm using US dollars or even rupees or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What I want to do is, in this case, uh, my grid range is, is, is going to be different because now I'm looking at column D. All right, so all the numbers should be exactly what they are in your mind if you remember the spreadsheet. Okay, and this time, instead of changing the... Uh, the text format bold flag, we're going to change the uh, number format and set it to a specific pattern and say that is a currency type. And then again, with fields, I confirm that the, thing that the only thing I want changed is the number format, and it will make those changes for you. OK, everybody good so far? All right, great. And then the last part is cell validation. I only want to have these possible fields of pending, shipped, and delivered for the status. OK, so again, I have to give another grid range, which is for column F this time. All right, and then the, uh, the rule is that, OK, notice the command this time is called set data validation. All right, so this is yet another command. All right, and it does exactly what, uh, you know, what we want, which is I only want to let the user choose one of these three values. All right, I'm going to set my uh, values to strict, which means they cannot choose anything else other than these three. They cannot type something else, and otherwise they get an error from the UI. Okay, and then show custom UI just means that I have a little menu thingy so that they can pull down and select the value that they want. Okay, so that's cell validation. And uh, so, for example, like I said, if somebody tries to enter an invalid value, they're going to get an error from the user interface. Okay, it's pretty basic. And again, I, I have a video on this one if you want to learn specifically focus on formatting cells, which is something I found that was very exciting to me. Okay. Um, yep. Also, the other thing is that it will also tell you, it will give you a flag. Even if you have the strict turned off, it will actually tell you this thing violates the rule, but I'm going to allow it. So either it's going to allow it or not allow it. And um, you can choose which one you want depending on how strict that you want it to be. Okay, all right, so that was c column E, column F, and the rest of the formatting. So after you watch the video and you take a study of the code sample, I challenge you to upgrade it, okay? There's another column for total cost, all right? So what I want you guys to do is take this and modify that one and, and make change it to the formula, right? So um, you can copy the financial value formatting in column E, but I want you to take what is column D and column E and calculate the value in column G. All right, so that's the challenge I leave for you at the end of the video, okay? Just in your head, you can kind of like think how you do it. You just have to research how do I enter a formula instead of, uh, you know, data into a spreadsheet. And you can look it up in the documentation. It'd be very easy to do. So that's my challenge to you. Okay. That's, so that's one thing that you can do with a uh, spreadsheet. Now, what's another thing that you can do? This is the last thing that we're going to look at, which is um, generating presentations from spreadsheet data. Why would you do this? Um, you would do this because, similarly to why you would use the Sheets API. Remember how I said, 
you have all this data in a database, but it doesn't really look good. It doesn't look presentable to a manager. But maybe if it's in a spreadsheet and you have a chart and stuff like that, that makes it easier for your managers to see you know, the, the data and, and the value, right? Because you can have a lot of data, but not a lot of information. And so using the spreadsheet, you can actually turn that data into information. Furthermore, maybe you want to do something more than this. You, maybe you want to create a slide deck to present to your management, right? So instead of just showing a spreadsheet on the screen, maybe you want to create a slide deck. And in this particular use case, I want to, you know, I have a spreadsheet that has toy order information. I created a pie chart, but I want to take this information and I want to build Google Slides out of it, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So this is sort of like demoing the power of using two Google APIs at the same time, okay? So here's my toy order database again, and I ran the, pre the previous example where I've formatted everything. I've got the cell validation. I've got the financial currency formatting. I got the frozen row. I got the bold row. And then I went and created a chart. You can do this from the API, but you can also do it from the UI, or you can use the explore button if you guys have seen that. Okay. So we have this information. We want to create slides out of it. Okay. Here's a, one of the slides I want. I want to see a table in a slide that has the same information as my toy orders that I have there. Okay. And secondly, I want to take that chart and I want to make it its own slide. So how do we do that? Okay, I'm not going to show you the whole code because it's a little bit larger now, but I'm going to focus on sort of like the major sections. Okay, so the major section is lines 20 to 28. We'll go and fetch those values out of that uh, out of the spreadsheet. Okay, and then the second, uh, so that's 20 to 23, and then 25 to 28. I want to go and find that chart, and I want to get that chart ID because I need that information to build the slide presentation out of. And the best part is when I make a slide out of it, if later on I change the data in the database and that chart changes, there's a little update button in your slide presentation. And when you press it, it'll refresh to the new data and the new chart. All right, so it's pretty exciting. So you can do that in the user interface, or you can actually use it uh, through the, through the uh, Slides API. You can request an update of the data. So either way is fine, okay? So now the hard part is on the right-hand side, so we're going to create this table. We're going to create slides. So all the stuff that's highlighted out or that I grayed out is like creating, uh, filling in the, the title slide. And I'm going to create a blank slide. I'm going to add a table. So you can kind of see that I'm adding a table. But the most important part is actually filling in the table. So I have like a double for loop down here that will loop through every column of every row that I read out of the spreadsheet from 20 to 23, and it writes it into the table that's on my slide. And then similarly, on line 76 to 91, 92, I'm going to create a brand new chart, give it the chart ID, and I have to give all this information about what size I want on the slide and everything. But the main idea is, as long as it has a chart ID, it will make that slide for me. Okay, and so as a result, what do we have? Oh, by the way, there's a video for that too, all right? So you can see this. Um, but anyway, so in the very end, you will actually have uh, these two slides. That is what that code creates, okay? So that's it as far as the uh, demos that I want to show you guys, okay? So let's kind of wrap up now. Uh, so we know that spreadsheets are a business critical tool. And even in the day, you know, in today's world where we have so much big data, you can still use spreadsheets, right? I can't imagine a world without spreadsheets right now. Uh, it's a very flexible tool. Uh, it's it's kind of like having an application that does numeric and, and text manipulation on your behalf. It's an app that's already been created, and you can leverage it, okay? Um, so, yeah, so anyway, so we now have a brand new API. It makes it more powerful than previous versions, which were limited in, 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 uh, in terms of what you can do with it. Uh, it's very flexible, and you can actually make it, you know, make, power your apps with it, all right? So this animation just shows that a, a spreadsheet is an organizer of data. It, sometimes it's used as a database. Um, other times it helps you analyze because you're, you're creating charts and visualizations, right? So it's just basically like a Swiss Army knife, in my opinion. And I think given the ability for you to program, it makes it even more powerful than before. Okay? So that's it. Um, I hope to see you maybe later this week, maybe tomorrow. If you're a Python user, I'm going to give a talk at the Bangalore Python Users Group. And if you want to join me the day after, I'll be in Singapore uh, talking about uh, Google Apps Script. 
All right, but uh, anyway, thank you guys for coming, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. If you have extra questions, just see me afterwards. All right, thanks everybody.
afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Amrit. I'm a developer advocate here at Google. And today we're going to talk about search and JavaScript sites. And this is one common question that we get all the time when we talk to web developers. How does Google search index a web application? Now, an easy way of understanding this would be to understand how Google search sees, the, sees your website. And then it'll be easy for you to kind of test and validate it. Now, like I said, I'm a developer advocate. I'm no Angular or Polymer developer. And this is going to be a session about Google search and not about any particular web framework. That out of the way, let me give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about what search really looks for, then a little bit about rendering techniques, and how do you want to do when you're migrating URLs, what are the things that you should take care of so that search still sees it correctly. And then some of, we'll discuss a little bit about some of the useful tools that are available. And this is some terminology that I'm going to use throughout. Uh, first one being Google Bot. That's basically the software that's crawling the web, getting the data, rendering it, and indexing it. Secondly is a single page app. By a single page app, what I mean is where you send in uh, the data is updated to a client-side JavaScript, and your uh, client-side JavaScript just pulls in and dynamically updates your app. With an app shell, this is basically the JavaScript, HTML, and CSS combination that is throughout, common throughout your web application, which the service worker kind of aggressively caches. And rendering. This is where it's slightly different. It's not the DOM and visualization of the DOM that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the HTML that is getting re rendered, OK? Let's quickly look at what search really looks for. And naturally, if you want to simplify how search works, search basically is a collection of URLs in our database. We use a schedule. And the crawler would, based on the schedule, would go to these URLs, fetch the data, render it, index it, and pass it to a search. That's what, in a nutshell, search works. Now, what does search loop really want? It is unique, indexable URLs. URLs that are crawlable, have indexable content, and links, so that you have the relationship between documents that there. Now, if you look at URLs, for instance, this must be information that you already know. A good URL has protocol, host, path, file name, and query string, if required. It is one URL per piece of content, so it, does not, it is not going to duplicate for different content. And both the URLs I've given here, they're perfectly good URLs. But the easier way of understanding this is to kind of maybe look at what a bad URL looks like. So if you have the same URL for multiple states, that's not really good. Again, URLs with a fragment identifier, Again, not a good, good, good thing. And I'll talk about it a little more in the upcoming slides. Uh, there are also URLs which might have irrelevant elements like session IDs or private information like user ID and password. They're also not considered to be good. Now, canonical URL. This, again, when you have multiple uh, versions of the same page, you want to use canonical URL and say clearly say the one URL that you need as a representative, which the index would actually keep. You want to ensure that your uh, redirects, JavaScripts, your sitemaps, and links are all updated correctly to reflect this canonical URL. And you want to be consistent about it. You don't, want, uh, you don't want a different one to be there in your index or sitemap. That, doesn't, that, will, that is mandatory that you have them common across. Now, we talked about fragment identifiers. The interesting thing to understand here is everything after the hash in the URL is actually ignored. Uh, so, you want to kind of use the history API and update your browser URL to something that is actually uh, understandable and indexable. And this is, something that is, uh, this is something that is mandatory. You also technically hash not URLs are rendered, but they're not recommended. So in that case also, if you're using them, please up use the history API and update that. Now, this is a sample of code that a uh, sample that I want to show where history API is used to update the page data and, and the URL. And it's fairly simple to do that in your code. So if you guys are using fragment identifier, which was a very common practice in the web, uh, for the Google search bot, you might want to actually update it to URLs using the history page API. 
Now, one of the things that in Google search that we've seen, and this is data from 2015, but still relevant, is that in more than 10 countries, including US and Japan, we've seen that the mobile searches are actually higher than the general desktop search. And using that info, we've also gone to mobile. We have a query string that indexes using a mobile user string. Uh, we're using Chrome, Android Chrome for, uh, agent for that specifically. Now, let's talk a little bit about how rendering is done. And if you look at it, Google browser, Google bot is more like a modern browser. It renders most pages comfortably, but it is based on Chrome 41. So there are some limitations. Let me talk about some of those limitations to you. It's actually stateless, which means things like local storage, index DB, cache API, these are all flushed out as page, pages are reloaded. Same happens with HTTP cookies also. So this is one limitation that you need to know. The second one is that if there are URLs that are required or URL references to uh, information that is required, like your J JavaScript or CSS page, by blocking them in robots, we are, when you're actually rendering the page, we are not going to reference the ro robots.txt to block any access to any of this. For rendering, it will actually go and get all this and render the page. Third one. If you are using JavaScript to kind of do navigation without actually having links, uh, we're using href, then this, the bot will not be able to find out the relationship between documents. Using sitemap, we will still might be able to map the entire document set, but the relationship between these uh, without the anchor tags is not possible. So that is really important here. A couple of more limitations. Service workers are not supported. IndexedDB, WebGL, uh, WebSQL, these are some of the other things that are not supported with uh, Googlebot right now. The recommendation here is to fall back and use polyfills. And whenever you're testing your site, use Google, consider Googlebot as a separate browser, Chrome 41, and test against Chrome 41 to see if everything is working right for you. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that Googlebot caches aggressively. Uh, when, because of that, it actually would cache your JavaScript pages, uh, some of your Ajax responses. So in case you're changing some of these things, it's best to kind of uh, let the system know that. And one of the way to do that is to kind of have versioning for your URLs, so we are able to understand that there's a change. One technique is to actually append the hash of the file to the, na to the name of the file, so that when the file changes, your hash is again regenerated, changed, so we know that it's a different one, and we, it, is, uh, it is removed from the cache and fetched again. Now, in case there's a failure for rendering client-side uh, client -side JavaScript, what really happens is we fall back to the data that we got from the server, which is the HTML that was sent from the server. This means if you're using single-page architecture, or single-page apps for the, using that architecture, you would want to test thoroughly. If your client-side is actually going to fail, the client-side pool is going to fail, it would mean that your entire site might be indexed, but all of the content would look the same, and it'll again get dropped from the index, being duplicates. So that is another area that you want to kind of be careful with. This is an interesting thing. This is uh, something that browsers are very resilient about. So finding this error, even though it's a simple one, uh, is a little hard. So if you have, if you have head and uh, body tags, right? So if there's any tag that is meant to be inside the body tag, and by mistake it's put in the head, Google bot rendering actually fails. So what would happen is it might prematurely complete the head tag, thereby your content might not be actually added to the index. Now, one thing which makes it quite difficult to find the simple error is that your browser will not show you any errors for this. Most browsers are resilient around it. So look out for this problem, and we've seen a lot of developers having, making this mistake and then not having their content surfaced well on the search index. Now for hidden content, now one of the things to keep in mind is the bot does not do interactions on the page. So if you have JavaScript uh, which loads data on hover or click through, that would not actually be indexed. So if you have really important content that needs to be indexed, one strategy to use would be that you render these UI elements, but toggle their visibility. 
So in case you need a click to uh, click to kind of show visibility, that's still fine, but not click to go fetch because the bot is not going to do any interactions on the server. So hidden content, it is better to actually have the UI elements rendered, but not uh, but toggle the visibility if that's what the page's design demands. Now with rendering performance, there are limitations here also. Now, but in terms of time, but that's computational time, not so things like set timeout, set interval, which adds to the rendering, is not going to be affected. It's not going to affect it, but computationally, there's a cap on this. So you might want to look for uh, slow-performing uh, third-party APIs, the number of requests that you're actually doing to the server to fetch your, fetch your resources. You might want to minimize that. And the third thing you could do is to use fast CDN servers, which makes the computation time again less. So these are things that you want to keep in mind when you're looking at rendering performance. You don't want the bot to time out and miss indexing some things. Uh, looking at rendering strategies, let's go through some of the options that we have. Again, I just want to call out that rendering is basically the construction of the HTML and not the visualization of the DOM. Okay, just want to keep that separate here. So the data plus template to the HTML and not DOM to the pixels. Just want to visualize that again. Uh, if you look at uh, rendering, it's, it's kind of hard uh, to debug uh, Googlebot uh, rendering. Uh, so some of the sites, what they do is they actually render just for the bot. That's a bad idea. That's called cloaking. We, we definitely discourage that. Uh, it's very tricky to maintain it and also debug it if you, why, why, as your site is evolving. So let's not do that, but let's discuss some ways in which we can render. So you have the client si server side re rendering, which is basically how traditionally your web is working, where all the HTML is generated to the server and then sent to the client and then visualized. Or you have client side, where you send in a half shell and then the, using JavaScript, you go fetch the, the content dynamically and render it there. There's a third way, which is called a hybrid model. In hybrid model, what we do is you would send the HTML first, render full HTML down that, that from the server side. And from the client side, for any additional data, you might call using an Ajax you might, or a JavaScript, you might just pull that data back, data, and then visualize it there. If you look at all these three strategies, uh, there are frameworks that make hybrid. Uh, hybrid isn't easy, but there are frameworks that uh, help you do that. One of them is Angular Universal. The other one is to use isomorphic uh, JavaScripting. Uh, so these two techniques are what mostly uh, people use for uh, hybrid development. And uh, what is, which one is better? Well, server side is the safest because you know exactly what's actually going to the client and what, what will be rendered. Uh, if you look at uh, hybrid, that's kind of ideal. And, but a lot of you guys are doing client side rendering. For that one, please test it thoroughly. It is important that you test it uh, really, really well for the same reason that you don't want errors to come in and uh, not just load or the bot just seeing your app shell in that case. Now, another place is when you're migrating things, uh, as you are actually migrating into the new structure, what, do you wanna, what, what are things that you want to keep in mind? The three steps to think of first. Double check all the non-Google dependencies. That's the first one. If you have URLs that are not clean, which is basically using a fragment identifier or a hash not identifier, you want to clean them up. Use the history API, clean them up. And the third one is if you're changing the URL, uh, do redirect it on the server. If it's a client type, if it is, if it is something that is a client is actually doing, you must be uh, like using a fragment identifier sort of a thing, then it must be performed on the client side. Now, when a URL gets changed, Ensure that you have redirects done correctly uh, via, if it's client side using fragment identifiers, and there's no delayed, like you would have a timer which says you're gonna move further in five seconds. Those sort of delayed redirects and interstitials don't do them. Uh, that's a bad idea, again. Uh, update your old sitemap and the new sitemap, and ensure that those links, both those links are not in robots. They are not uh, kind of, avoiding access to them in rob robots.txt. Uh, let them be available for the bot. And ensure all your canonical uh, URLs are updated correctly. This is mandatory second. Uh, some of the useful tools when, you, when it comes down to monitoring and debugging. Uh, Google Search Console, how many of you guys have used this before? Some of you guys have, the others should check it out. Uh, this will allow you, once you've verified your site, 
here. This will allow you to diagnose what has been crawled, rendered, and indexed. And it also helps you kind of look through your aggregated data, uh, use targeted some settings like targeted internationalization, things like that can be changed here. Uh, it also helps when you want to remove some content. So if you want that f all these features, it's important that you actually verify it. So removal of content can be done really fast, uh, are requested and acted upon really fast by using this uh, console. So verify your site using uh, Google Search Console first. Don't wait for the moment where you want to remove it. Do that upfront. Now fetch as Google. This is another tool that's there. How many of you have used this? Fewer, but still the others should check this out. Uh, so basically what this allows you to do is it will allow you to run a URL, provide it a URL, and fetch it like how Google Bot would actually do it. It will let you see the server-side HTML and also a screenshot of the uh, screenshot of the page that is finally created, which is a visualization of it. You would not be able to look through the DOM or HTML that's generated though. So that's one part that you need to be aware of. You, so debugging is a little tricky. And you can also visualize it in desktop or as a smartphone. Either ways, you could do that. Now, when you're looking at debugging the client side rendering with this, it is possible. So one way of doing it is you intercept all your client side errors and log it to, your, log it to a server. So when Google fetches Google is done, if there is a rendering error that happens, your JavaScript is going to in, in, intercept that error, take the relevant data, and then put it to your logging server. Then again, you should be using a development server for this, and don't use your production service for this, because it's going to be expensive. Uh, what I was actually talking about intercepting client send errors, you want to take that, push it back into your logging servers, and then from there, uh, then test it with the uh, Google Sorry, fetch as Google tool. This is a sample code, which basically, in case of an error, would tell you the line number, the error number, pulls a stack trace if it's available, and then uploads it to your server. Something as simple as this is good to, as a start, and you can add more things as, as you feel uh, relevant to your solution. Now, for sitemaps, it's best that you invest time in actually separating, have separating separate files for different routes and templates, because it makes it easier when it's updated. Use last mod field and update this to ensure that we understand that the sitemap has changed. And again, uh, it needs to ensure, and you also have to ensure that every time you change, your canonical URLs match the sitemap correctly. You shouldn't have differences there, so that it all indexes upright. Now, if you're looking at a uh, single page architecture, uh, it's, again, like we said, it is a little tricky to kind of uh, do the client side part. So you can use tools like Puppeteer, which is a headless renderer to kind of render it as Chrome. You can provide it, uh, provide it, uh, tell it that you want to run it at Chrome 41, which basically will run it like the Google bot and render and show you the information. Let me show you some code for that. So this is, so by the way, Puppeteer is a third party, uh, a JavaScript library which will actually fetch, render, and index, and show you the stuff. So this is basically how we want to kind of use Puppet, the standard uh, JavaScript. Now, quickly recapping all of this, the key takeaways to look at for, from all of this is that you want to clean your URLs first. So that's really, really important. Second, understand how rendering is done and what Googlebot really sees. Look at all the techniques that we talked about here earlier. Look at all those limitations and ensure that your site is working with respect to all that and is taking care of that. Have the, if you're a single page architecture, look at the client side, uh, pushing, the log, uh, pushing the errors from your uh, client side rendering into your login servers to understand if there are any errors that's happening at the Googlebot side. Again, have a different tem have a template for every template and route, have a different site sitemap file. And when you're in your test cases, please consider Google Bot as Chrome 41, uh, Chrome 41, and test have test cases for that as a separate browser altogether. Using these techniques, you would be able to kind of make your SEO for your pages really better. And for PWAs, again, the same thing applies. PWAs is just another web page. So the same techniques and the concepts that we talked about do apply to that also. And lastly, 
There is office hours uh, that happens at google.com slash webmasters every fortnight. So if you have questions to the team, uh, you can actually join that live and then ask and team would answer that for you. Uh, so this is another resource that you should use more if you're not already if you're not already doing that. With that, I'll close. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll I have Jake who's got a quick quiz for you guys. So Jake, why don't you come on board? Hey everyone. Okay, for the last session of the day and entire of the whole conference, I guess. Um, get your smartphones or tablets or laptops, whatever has the most battery, uh, to the ready uh, because we are going to play. The Big Web Quiz. So I don't know if anyone was here yesterday at this time. Uh, we played it yesterday. It's going to be it's the same sort of thing, but with different questions. So get yourselves to bigwebquiz.com uh, and sign in with your Google account. This is going to be a quiz about some of the weirdest edge cases, weird stuff of the web platform. If you're not someone who codes on the web, uh, I recommend playing along anyway. Uh, you'll probably find even if you're just guessing randomly, you might beat your colleagues who think they're web experts. You know, it'll be fun to see if, if that happens. So I assume the site's all up, the Wi-Fi is good enough, people getting logged in. Is that sort of working? Okay, that sounds good. All right, devices at the ready. I'm gonna bring on the first question. Here we go. Which of the following HTML tags are mentioned in the HTML parsing spec? Now the question should have appeared on your phones. The four possible answers are alt, listing, Fetile and sarcasm. Now select all of the ones that you think are mentioned in the HTML parsing spec. Uh, and then make sure you hit submit as well. So what we're looking at here is a load of zero numbers, which makes me wonder if something's not going on. The question hasn't appeared, has it? Okay, no worries, I can fix that. Let's, uh, let's sort this out. It's possible that I have a debug mode on. What does this say? Does that say false? Debug false, okay, we'll do some live coding, that's fine. Let's see if we can give it another go. All right. Anything on the phones? Yeah, yay, live coding at a conference talk, excellent. Let's get this into full screen. Yes, so the four options are alt, listing, fetile, and sarcasm. Which ones do you think are in the HTML parsing spec? Hopefully we won't get any more bugs along the way. So yes, make sure you hit submit when you've picked all of the things that you think are going to be in the parsing spec. And it's great to say some numbers which aren't zero, which means everything is kind of working. Uh, so what this is telling us is 78% of you are pretty confident on one of those things being in the spec. The rest of them, you're not so confident on, well, especially you're, you're not confident on at all. Um, I'm going to close the question in a few seconds. So take a guess if you haven't already. Make sure you hit the submit button. Closing the question in three, two, one, and we're out. Okay, so we're saying pretty confident about alt. Uh, not confident about sarcasm at all. Interesting. Okay, now what's going to happen in this quiz? Like, if you get a low score, it doesn't mean you're bad at web development. All of this stuff I would get wrong if someone gave me this quiz, so don't feel bad about it because those three uh, tags, alt is not. Uh, so alt is an attribute. Now, we, we call it alt tag all the time, but in the HTML spec, it's not a tag, it's just an attribute. Listing, this is an all tag. This was deprecated in HTML 3.1, uh, but it still has to be in the parsing spec because some old sites still use it, and to be a valid browser, it has to, be, uh, it has to follow the spec, so it's in the spec. Um, fetile, this is an SVG element for doing filtering, for tiling part of an image. Um, and SVG elements are part of the HTML parsing spec as well because uh, you can put SVG inside HTML. Uh, and that leaves sarcasm. Um, so this is the HTML parsing spec here. And it says an end tag whose tag name is sarcasm. Take a deep breath. 
then acts as described in the any other end tag entry below. So it's in there, it's an Easter egg, it's just someone having a bit of fun, but it is in the HTML parsing spec. Okay, let's do another question. Here we go. Right, according to the specifications, the web specs, which of the following will be requested? So we have a link rel preload with an href of one here. Uh, we have an image here with a source of two. And we've got a bit of JavaScript here. It's creating an image, giving it a source uh, of three. And then we have another bit of script, uh, creating an image, but spelling it differently, uh, giving it a source of four. Select all of the ones that you think are actually going to be requested given that piece of code. So we can see from the answer, so it's pretty confident on most of them. There's only one of them that about half of you think is, is maybe, maybe isn't. The rest of them we're all pretty confident on. Take a guess if you haven't already. So we're going to be closing the question. Make sure you hit the submit button as well. In three, two, one, and perhaps. All right, so what are we looking at? So. It's four that you're less sure about, all of the rest I think are going to be requested. The answer, it's two and three. Okay, so you know, quite, you know, most of you got those right. Uh, I guess the one that caught most people out was the preload one. So this used to work according to the spec uh, and in browsers. This would actually trigger a request. Uh, but the spec has been changed in the past few months, and it now requires an as attribute to be given a value. And if it doesn't have one of those, it doesn't request anything. Uh, image source two. Now, in the uh, HTML parsing spec that we saw before, it has this line that says a star tag whose name is image. It's a parse error, but it uh, changes the tokens tag to image and reprocesses it. So it's aliased in the parser. Now, this is actually from Mosaic, which is one of the first ever web browsers, they set up this alias, and pages rely on it. I think one of, about 5% of pages, we find this misspelled image tag there, so it has to be part of the spec. Browsers have to do it uh, in order to work on the web. Uh, next, we had this. Um, yeah, if you create an image element and give it a source, the request will happen straight away. You don't have to wait for the image to go into the document. Uh, this one, this is a little bit different. This doesn't work. Uh, we saw the alias before, where if you spell image wrong, it, it will figure it out. But that rule is in the parser spec. Now, by going to create element, uh, you're bypassing the parser, so you don't pick up that little rule. Uh, in fact, this will be an HTML unknown element, uh, just as if you'd made up a name. So it won't make the request. All right, next question. Here we go. All right, so we've got a bit of JavaScript here. Loops and scope. Which values are logged when the following executes? So we've got a, a for loop here. It's going to iterate five times. But inside the loop, we're doing a set timeout. Uh, and in the set timeout, we're logging the i value. Now, it's going to log multiple times. But which values is it going to log? Is it going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4? Or is it going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Or 5, 5, 5, 5, 5? I don't know how many times I said that now. Or is it going to be na, 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 Batman? Select one and hit submit. So this is the live answers coming in. It's one of them that you're pretty sure is a room that is not going to be the right answer. Uh, there's kind of a spread through the rest of it. This happens in this quiz as we go along. People just start guessing randomly. It's actually a good tactic for most of the questions. Uh, take a guess if you haven't already. I am closing the question in three, two, one. We're out. Okay, so high confidence on. Not a number there. Uh, less keen on one, two, three, four, five. Less keen on five, 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 five. The correct answer is zero, one, two, three, four. So, why does this happen? So we take this piece of code here. What this will log? This will log five, 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 five. It will log five, five times. Uh, and the reason for this is that I'm using var here. And so there's only one instance of the variable i. So it goes through this loop. i becomes 5 when it exits the loop. And then all of those set timeout things will run afterwards. So they're logging i. It's got to 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. But that's not what I used in the test. I used let. And this is a sort of relatively recent part of JavaScript. And it means that rather than being scoped to the function, that variable will be scoped to the for loop. So each iteration gets its own value of i. So that means it will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, devices that are ready, let's do another question. OK, CSS1, here we go. 
what what happens here? What happens to Fu with this bit of code? We've got a min height of 300 and a max height of 200, so the maximum is lower than the minimum. What happens? Is Fu 200 pixels tall? Is it 300 pixels tall? Zero pixels tall? Or does it crash all browsers in three mile radius? Let's find out how the loading is going. Okay, so there's two answers that no one has picked yet. That's amazing. I imagine one of them might be the browser crashing one. Probably that blue one there, but we'll wait and see. Uh, get your answers in if you haven't already. We're going to get through all of these questions before our time's up. Closing the question in three. Make sure you hit submit. Two, one. We're out. Okay, so yeah, 0% of you thought it was going to crash all browsers in the three mile radius. Good, safe bet. Excellent. Uh, the correct answer, though, it will be 300 pixels tall. And, and this is a silly question that you would only know the answer to if you've been you know, reading the spec like I did. Uh, it turns out min height always wins if the values clash in any way. Okay, let's do another question. Here we go. Right, now this is a tough one. This is one where guessing probably comes in handy. According to the spec, which of these styles will the user see briefly? So we're going to set timeout, so that's going to be queued. Uh, we're going to set the background to red. Uh, we're going to do a promise resolve, and when that resolves, we're going to set the background to green. We're going to request an animation frame, and we're going to set the background to, to nothing. And uh, right up on there, we're going to set the, the background to blue. Now, which of these background colors is the user going to see, even if it's just going to be briefly? Is it going to be red, green, blue, or light golden or yellow, which is a valid CSS color? So select all of the ones that you think the user might see. OK, so we've seen the answers come through. Pretty confident on one of them, or sort of 50-50 on two of them. One of them you're pretty confident is not going to come up. I don't know if that's the golden or yellow one. Uh, I'm going to close the question. Uh, guessing if you haven't already, make sure you hit submit. Closing the question in three, two, one, and it's closed. OK, so we're pretty confident on blue and green. Not so confident on the red. Correct answer, I'm sorry, none of them. None of them, the user's not going to see any of these colors. This is an evil quiz, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's have a look at how this happens. Uh, so then when this code runs, the first thing that's going to happen is uh, it's going to set this, this style, this inline style to red. But the browser isn't going to consider looking at computing styles or rendering at this point. It's not thinking about it at all. That comes in much later on. Uh, we queue this micro task. We'll deal with that later. And we're going to queue with this uh, animation frame. Again, we'll deal with that later. So the next actual style change that happens is we're going to set that to blue. But again, the browser is not thinking about styles at all at this point. The JavaScript stack is now empty, so we deal with micro tasks. So this bit's going to run. But again, the browser is not thinking about rendering at this point. And then sometime later, we're going to get this bit of code in the request animation frame running. Now, this is the bit that was a surprise to me when I first learned it. But request animation frame is always going to run before the browser does the next render. So we're changing that background value a load of times. We unset it here, but not all of it's going to happen before the browser paints. So it's going to be unset the background before the browser thinks about updating pixels on the screen. Um, so the only time, this will always, request animation frame will always happen before the next paint unless it's inside a request animation frame callback. So if you're inside a request animation frame callback and you call request animation frame, that will fall to the, to the next frame. Um, so this behavior, you see this in Firefox, in Edge, and in Chrome. Safari actually breaks the, the web standard, the specification here. Uh, it runs request animation frame in the next frame. So users will see a flash of green in Safari, but that is against the standard. All right, next question. Here we go. Right, OK, this is another evil one. Uh, after this code, running this code, which of the following is successfully set to 1? So we're setting up a new typed array there. And we're setting the 0.9 property, uh, the 1.0 property, the 1.1 property, and the 1.2 property. Which of those are going to be successfully set? Which is kind of suggesting that some of them aren't, but maybe it's a trick question. Who knows? Select all that apply. OK, so just a spread of answers there. This is the point in the quiz where people just give up. That's fine. That's what I would do as well. Uh, get your answers in quickly. We've only got one more question to go after this. But I'm going to close the, the question in three, two, 
one. And we'll go. Okay, so what's the what are we looking at here? Sort of roughly 50% across the board. We're pretty confident about 1.0, maybe less so on the others. Here are the actual answers. 0.9 and 1.0 are the only ones that are going to be successfully set. And this was this was told to me. I, I asked the the V8 team um, at, at Google to sort of give me some of their weirdest JavaScript edge cases, and this is the one they came up with, and I absolutely love it. I didn't know about this until they told me. Here's what's going on. So when you do something like this uh, with a typed array, array val equals whatever, if val is a string, it uh, treats it specially. It will treat it as a, an array index assignment if the, uh, when it turns it into a number and back to a string, that it's the same as val originally. What they call it is the canonical representation of a number. Uh, otherwise, it's just a standard object assignment. So here's what I mean by that. 0.9 here, when you pass it through that, 0 uh, 0.9 becomes 0 0.9. So those values are different. So this is a plain object assignment. It works fine. 1.0, the canonical version of that is just 1. The 0 0.0 gets dropped. So this is an object assignment again, because it's not equal. This just works. 1.1 is the canonical uh, way to, to display 1.1. It matches. So this becomes a, an array index assignment. Um, and that's fine. But what happens here is JavaScript sees 1.1 and goes, well, I can't assign to the 1.1 item of the array. Array indexes need to be integers. So it doesn't throw an error at this point. It just silently ignores it. So that value is lost. And the same happens with 1.2, exactly the same thing. Blew my mind when I heard about that. OK, let's do the last question of the quiz. Here we go. A little bit similar to one of the questions earlier. Given this chunk of HTML, which resources are going to be requested? So we've got a link rel preload there, similar to one of the ones we saw earlier. We've got a script source equals two. We've got a link rel style sheet uh, with a media attribute, an href of three. And here I have a style tag, and inside it's doing at import four. Which of these requests is the browser actually going to make given this chunk of HTML? OK, so looking at the room, we're reasonably confident that all of them are going to be requested. One of them is going to be less sure. It's interesting that we're sort of moving between below 50% and above 50%. We've got the lowest answer on the side there. This is the last question, so definitely guess. If you haven't made a guess, I'm going to be closing the question in three, two, one, round. OK, so what are we thinking? Pretty confident one's going to be requested. Not so sure about two. And three and four, pretty high confidence. OK. I'm sorry. It's just one. I'm worried people are going to throw things at me when you find out why. Uh, here it is. This is correct. We saw this before. It's got the as attribute. Everything's going to work fine. Uh, this next one, uh, this isn't going to be requested because it's, it's script src, not source. So. A little bit tricky. Uh, here's the other two. Now, the syntax highlighting has broken here. When you do a script tag, you cannot have a self-closing script tag like this. You have to have the proper closing tag. So what's actually happening here is the parser is going to treat the last two lines as if it was JavaScript rather than HTML. So those are not going to be requested, even though they, you know, if that was HTML, they would work, but not as JavaScript at all. Sorry, that was a really dirty trick, that one. OK, so that was a short quiz, but let's see who the top three are. Congratulations to the top three. Oh, OK, as, you know, a little bit of a fun thing to do at the end. But all there is left for me to say really is thank you for joining us on the, the Google Developer Days India. You battled through the, the traffic, and uh, you battled through the British weather yesterday, which you know, I brought along with me. Um, you should have a, an email with a feedback form, I guess a survey in your inbox. We really want to hear about the stuff that you enjoyed, but also like where we can improve as well. 
Uh, for me, especially like, on a personal level, it's been great to talk to like, so many developers that take web performance seriously. Like, I want to bring developers from the US and the UK here so you can teach them to care about performance because it's sometimes a really tough sell, but not here. And we're also really happy with the, the diversity at the event. Like, we've got folks from all over India. Uh, and over 30% of attendees uh, identified as women. Uh, and that's, that's a new record, I think, for Google events of this size. Uh, but it's definitely something we want to continue to, to build on. Uh, there's details of local uh, events on the GDD India website and all of the videos of the talks that are going online now on the uh, Google Developers India YouTube channel. Uh, but speaking of video, uh, our roving reporters have been wandering around with cameras for the past couple of days uh, and they've been shooting some footage and here is what they got. This is the first GDD ever in India. And this is the largest developer event that Google has held in India ever. We've been living, breathing, eating, sleeping, and writing. And this is the first time the event is happening in Bangalore. So many of the people we have seen on online videos, we're seeing them in person here. That's a, a different kind of a feeling. Well, our purpose of being here is to know what's next. Uh, Firebase, Kotlin, we know that is the future that's going to change things. So we want to make the art developers equipped with those technologies. Programming is like math, where you need to practice the lot to gain the expertise. There was a session that I attended in the morning, which was about uh, design. It was new to me, and that is how I can improvise my work. And also IoT, which I didn't know. So many things that you could do, which you didn't know. And thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Safe travels, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much.